Kumar and McCarthy Vahey, Ranking Members, Vice Chairs, and Committee Members. I'm Rep. Amy Morinbello. I represent the 28th District in Wethersfield, and I am speaking today in support of HB 5246, an act allowing for disposal of dead human bodies through natural organic reduction. I've also co-sponsored Rep. Denning's similar um, House bill, as well as the Environment Committee's uh, Bill HB 6485, and I'm glad that this subject is being discussed this session. Natural organic reduction is the contained accelerated conversion of human remains to soil, or in layman's turn, uh, terms, the, com the composting of the body. In three states, Colorado, Oregon, and Washington allow this green form of burial, with three other states uh, working on a process. So many people are moving away from a traditional burial process while re um, requiring um, embalming chemicals in burial in a casket, which takes up space and uses resources and chemicals. So since 2015, cremation has become the most popular disposal practice in our country, according to data collected by the National uh, Funeral Directors Association. And there are several reasons for this change, including the environmental impact. And the big environmental concerns with cremation are the amount of energy it requires and the amount of carbon dioxide emissions it produces. So cremating a single body typically takes up to three hours and releases more than 500 pounds of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And for reference, burning a gallon of gas while driving your car equals 20 pounds of carbon dioxide. So as people consider end of life arrangements and the environment, um, environmental impact those arrangements have on our planet, a green, more natural burial is of interest. So there are companies um, in the United States that currently perform this service. And it would be my hope that our existing funeral homes in the state of Connecticut would embrace the idea and the technology and would um, learn the process and offer this as an additional form of disposition of a loved one to complement their existing services. So we're not trying to take away um, existing funeral homes abilities or services. And I realized passing legislation would be the first step in permitting this natural organic reduction in green burials. The Department of Public Health would need to create regulations, the appropriate paperwork, and consider all the health-related issues that may come into play when you are implementing this practice, including how disease or medical treatment um, treatments would impact the ability for a green burial, and then also how and where the compost can be disposed. So I look forward to continued conversations on the topic and hope I'll have a chance to vote on um, some form of a green burial bill in the House this session. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank you so much for your testimony. And uh, you were right on the three minute marks. So it's uh, pretty good. Fantastic. Um, I, I wanted to just uh, hear about the, the states that have done this and, and what are the results and what was the, which were the earliest states that took this on? Sure. So the um, the the uh, Washington State and Oregon were the first to implement it, and um, I have actually reached out to one of the providers and asked that they provide some testimony um, for these three bills that are being considered this session. Um, so I hope that they can provide some information, uh, some additional information for us. California, Vermont, and New York have passed legislation and are working through the process of how um, to implement it now. So there are in total six states that have embraced the idea. And I realize there are challenges. I've, I've received some information from the public health department um, with their concerns about the financial impact that it would be to implement, including um, uh, reg creating regulations for the process and then creating regulations that would encompass the funeral services and how they um, produce that information and forms to our town clerks that would remain with the um, the death certificate. Thank you so much. I see Representative Fahm has a question followed by Representative Denning. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thanks Rep. Morimbello and Rep. Denning also for, for introducing the same bill. Uh, in the environment, it's currently moving along as well, I believe, because there is a provision that would uh, involve 
open land um, to be designated. Uh, so there's there's two things going on. One is the green burial, which we already allow in Connecticut in certain designated areas of certain cemeteries. And then the other is the accelerated reduction. Uh, would you still be in favor of this bill, Amy, if it were to eliminate the OSWA, um, the open space provision? In other words, somehow, I'm not quite sure how it got toggled together. And um, I think we're we're running into a little bit of tricky waters with Environment Committee because one of the iterations of the bill wants to couple the allowance of the of the organic reduction with use of preserved space through OSWA. Do you have any sense of that? Um, thanks, Rep. Pom. Yes, I would be I would be fine with uh, a division of the two so that we could try to move forward with this initiative. Um, and, and sometimes that happens. Other other things get joined on with a bill and then the bill doesn't make it as far as we hope. So, yes, I would definitely entertain that idea. Thank Great. you. Thank Representative you. Morenbo, uh, Representative Bump, do you have another question or you're good? No, good. Mr. Chair, that's it. Thank you. OK. And, and we just ask that uh, when you're asking a question, go through the chair. Um, Representative Denning, uh, you're next. Thank you, uh, Senator Anwar. I appreciate the time. Uh, my question has to do with um, disposal of the composted material. Is there a manner in which most of the compost is disposed of? And uh, what if there are contaminants that are determined in the soil? What are, what are the common things that people deal with? Thank you. Representative um, uh, Marin Bell. Thank you, um, Senator Anwar. Um, Rep Denning, I think that um, the Public Health Department will have to make some determinations on how how and where the composting can um, can end up. Um, and there would be definitely consideration to um, people who have had diseases or have had treatments, including maybe um, chemotherapy or certain treatment drugs before their death. Um, and, you know, I, I'm thrilled that this conversation is beginning, and I know that there's a lot more that has to go into it before we can actually start implementing it. But these are all considerations that both the legislators and um, the Department of Public Health will have to take into consideration. I know that in um, uh, people who have already used this process, we've seen that with the composting, um, the families don't necessarily take all of the composting in its entirety, but are taking small volumes of it, and they're planting it or, or uh, spreading it in uh, memorial gardens and um, you know in in places like that. So I think a lot of consideration has to go into all of these questions to make sure that. Uh, the process we have in place is appropriate for um, for our families and for our environment. Thank you, uh, Representative Martin Ball. Uh, Representative Denning, do you have another follow up? I'd just like to thank uh, Representative Palmer and Representative Morin Bello for co-sponsoring this bill with me. And I'd like to see it and hopefully get a bill through the House by the end of the year. Thank you so much. And uh, Representative Dauphiné has a question or a comment. Representative Dauphiné. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question is, how many states are already doing this and do they have model um, model protocols that you're looking at in terms of uh, implementing it here in Connecticut through you, Mr. Chair? Please go ahead, uh, Representative Mornbola. Thank you, Senator Arnoir. Um, Rep. Dauphina, yes, three states currently have, um, have a... Um, have are, in, are are using this form of um, of reduction. Those states are Colorado, Oregon, and Washington State. California, Vermont, and New York are in the process of implementing it. They're creating guidelines now. Um, and yes, we've we um, have done a little research on how Colorado, Oregon, and Washington are handling it. And I would be happy to get that information to the committee. I'm I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me now. Thank you, uh, Representative Warren Bello, Representative Dauphine, you have a follow-up. Thank you for that um, answer. And my other question is, you know, what what are the cost differences and what are the benefits of, of this um, procedure versus cremation? Maybe you can talk a little bit about that through you, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you, Representative Maureen Bell. Thank you, Senator Armar. So um, one of the big benefits is just the environmental impact it has. Like I said earlier, um, cremation lets off a lot of um, you know, gases into the atmosphere. It requires um, extensive uh, temperatures to burn a human body. So there's definitely an environmental impact with, um, with this reduction. And, um, you know, there is a there is more of a cost to it than cremation because funeral homes would have to have a place for the body for this process to take place. And it can take a few months um, for the, the composting of a body. So where cremation may take two to three hours for the process to be complete, this would take um, a, a few months for the process to be complete. So it would be uh, more of an expense for a family um, for for the, their loved one. Thank you, Representative Warren Bellow. Representative Dauphine, I see that you have another question. One other question. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. And um, for, for those that, do you see this as being something that's mandatory or something that's voluntary? Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Please go ahead, Representative. Thank you, Senator Anwar. Um, absolutely voluntary. I, I think that this would be a complimentary service that our funeral, our existing funeral homes could offer. Uh, families would be able to choose a traditional burial, choose cremation, or choose this natural reduction. I have no intention of, of you know, crafting any language or working with others to craft any kind of language that would make this mandatory. It would simply be another um, another uh, opportunity for a way to, um, you know, final make final arrangements for a loved one. Thank you so much. And seeing no other questions or comments, we truly appreciate you coming in and, and uh, sharing your insight on this bill. Um, I just wanted to mention that uh, Judge Marino is in the virtual or physical room. And so is Judge Daly. So let me just see. I just got a message that Judge Marino is here. Well, then what we'll do is we see Judge Daly on Zoom. So we'll start with Judge Daly. Judge Daly, you're on. And I guess we see Judge Marino on Zoom now too, so. Bear with us, we are working on this hybrid mode and we are dependent on the internet services in various parts of our state. Uh, uh, Judge Daly, we see you. If you wanna unmute, you are number three. If you can unmute and you can speak. Judge Daly. Well, Judge Daly, if you can unmute, you can speak. You're in the room, virtual room, that is. Well, we'll move on to the next person. Um, with will be number five because I don't see the next judge either. So, which room? Judge Marino, are you in this uh, virtual room? Judge Marino. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. We don't see you, and we would love to see you. Yeah, well, I would love. I see you, but my uh, video is not on for some reason. I'm not really sure why, to be honest with you. But uh, well, as long as you can hear me, is that okay? Can I go forward? Sure. Okay, I'm not much to look at anyway, so it's okay. But <laughs> well, first of all, I I'd like to thank the Senate Chair of. of uh, Chair Anwar and the House Chair uh, uh, Vehi and the uh, Senate Ranking Member uh, Heather Summers and the House Ranking Member uh, Claritas Ditria 
and honorable members of the Public Health uh, Committee. I had prepared my comments anticipating uh, that uh, the, the bill uh, 898 was eliminating the probate courts uh, from the shock therapy hearings, but I understand that that's not the case and I'm very glad to hear that. So uh, all, all the comments that I prepared are, are, are basically thrown out the window. Uh, but I will tell you that uh, I've been probate judge here in the Middletown District for 36 years. I'm the longest serving probate judge currently in the state of Connecticut, which just means I'm old basically. But um, because of the Middletown District contains Middlesex Hospital, contains Connecticut Valley Hospital, uh, contains Whiting Forensic Hospital. I think, though I haven't done a study, but I think that I'm very safe in saying that I've done uh, more ECT hearings than any other judge in the state of Connecticut, uh, more than likely thousands. I probably average two or three a week. Uh, so times 52 weeks a year, times 36 years, you could do the math. So uh, uh, this is what I've seen concerning ECT. I've seen remarkable progress uh, on a, on a short-term basis sometimes. And the good thing about the 45 day window, because as I'm sure you know, the court order expires after 45 days and is, is you know, often renewed by the uh, uh, petitioning facility uh, that I sometimes don't even recognize a patient when they come in. That's how dramatic the change is. When you see somebody catatonic, um, and, you know, not able to talk and barely move. And then 45 days later, after some ECT, they come in looking totally different. It's really amazing. But then I see a plateau uh, where it seems to me that at a certain point, uh, ECT is merely being used just to sort of maintain that progress. As you know, the statute that involves the probate courts states that uh, if a patient is found to be incapable of giving informed consent, to this type of procedure. That's when it comes before the court. And there's a very strict finding by the court before I would approve anything that there's no less intrusive, uh, no less intrusive beneficial treatment, which to my mind basically means that you have to try everything else. Because to my mind, ECT shock therapy is the most invasive uh, and the most frightening to be perfectly honest um, you know, procedure, uh, treatment that a, you know, patient can certainly go through. So I, I really, uh, hold that in very high regard, the words of the statute. Uh, and, and I make sure that the testifying psychiatrist, which is almost always the patient's treating psychiatrist, uh, has, has basically tried everything else, whether that involves talk therapy, uh, psychotherapy, uh, medications, obviously, uh, before we go to shock therapy. So that's been my experience. I think the 45 day window, especially exacerbated by COVID, where for the most part, uh, Connecticut Valley Hospital and also Whiting sends their patients who are receiving ECT over to the IOL, the Institute of Living in Hartford. Excuse me, Judge, but yes. um, your time has expired. If you could okay. just summarize, thank you. Okay, you want me to summarize? Basically, I'd like to say that the 45 day window, I would not be opposed to certainly having that extended. Uh, I think we can certainly go 60, maybe even more than that days before the order has to be renewed. Uh, I think that would be a good idea. 45 days is basically too short. Uh, that's really my only comment. If there's any questions based upon what I've said, based upon my own you know, experience in my court with ECT, I'll be more than happy to answer whatever questions that the thank committee you. may have. Thank you so much, Your Honor. Uh, thank you for um, your uh, testimony. I think this is very helpful. And the fact that you're experienced and you also agree that it should stay within the probate system uh, reassures us as uh, we are on the right track. Appreciate your testimony. I see no question. Uh, there is one question from no question. Our, very good. Uh, Vice Chair Representative Parker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Thank you, uh, Judge Marino, for being here for serving my community in Durham. Through you, Mr. Chair, just one question. Um, Judge Marino, I don't know if you can speak to this, but is it often that you would get a repeated request after the 45-day period and then choose to disallow that request? Um, how often does 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 you do you change your mind as as it goes through uh, yeah. serving yeah. one? Yes, uh, that's a good question. Um, 
It does occur occasionally, and that's probably the good thing about the 45-day window is that you get to see the patient uh, fairly soon after the initial application. But uh, it really depends upon the side effects. If they come in complaining about memory loss, complaining about perhaps seizures, things of that nature during the procedure, uh, then it's, it, it is relatively rare. I'm going to be honest with you. It, is, it doesn't happen very often. But I could think of a couple of instances where after that initial, you know, approval, uh, and then the you know petitioning facility comes in with with another petition for so, uh, that's okay. Forty five right, days. So, so who? So Mr. Now, Radcliffe, you? could you mute yourself? Thank you. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, you didn't hear me. I'm sorry. Very well. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say that it doesn't happen very often, but there have been a couple of instances over the years where I have denied the second application, depending upon, you know, some issues that the patient may have had after the first initial 45 day period. So it is relatively rare, though. It is rare. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, okay. Mr. Chair. Thank you. I see Representative Denning has a question or a comment. Representative Denning. Thank you, Senator Anwar. I'd like to ask uh, Honorable Judge Marino if he could talk to me about uh, the series, the way ECT is delivered and how long it takes for a series of treatments to be done. I know it's not just one time. If he could address that and tell us about what uh, a series of treatments would would uh, look like on a, on a time schedule or calendar. Yeah, I, 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 to be honest with you, I have not personally observed ECT, uh, but certainly from hearing years of testimony from the doctors and also from the patients, even more importantly, it's my understanding that when they start a course of ECT, so the initial application, it is often done three times a week. Uh, now, whether that's for the entire 45-day period or not, I'm not sure about that, but there's, uh, you know, three times a week is the initial course. That's my understanding. And then at some point, it gets tapered down. So tapered to perhaps twice a week, tapered to perhaps once a week. And then often with the second application, maybe the third, maybe the fourth, they then go to what's called maintenance ECT, which, which could be once every two weeks, could be once every three weeks, once every four weeks, which brings up the issue concerning that 45-day period of time is they may just have one application of the ECT during the 45-day order once they hit the maintenance ECT, which why uh, I am a proponent of, of perhaps extending that 45-day period. Um, so that's been my experience with how uh, you know, uh, it is administered. Thank okay. you so much, uh, Your Honor. Uh, Representative Denning, thank you. Does that answer your questions? To some yes, degree? thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, seeing no other questions or comments, uh, uh, Judge, thank you so much for your presence today and your testimony. We appreciate you. Okay, my pleasure. Thank, thank you, Senator. A couple of quick comments. Uh, uh, for the people that are watching and the people uh, may see that uh, many of our uh, legislators are in and out of this room. And, and the reason is there are multiple meetings that are happening at this time, and, and we are in more than one committee. And as a result, uh, you will see people go and attend another meeting and then be back. So, But your testimonies are read and heard by everyone. We actually record and keep track of what you are going to say. And, and the other comment I wanted to make was that in the virtual world, you have are most of the people who are waiting in line, some 90 or so people, you are going to be asked to come to the next room, which is the testimony room. So you're going to be promoted to this room. When you get that prompt, click on it and come to this room. Otherwise, you would not be able to present. You will only be able to listen. Um, so that's uh, because number five, Ms. Dr. James Simons, he is not yet um, been able to come up to the this area. So we are going to go ahead and take number six, uh, Martin Kulip. Uh, you're number six, Mr. Kulip, you're on. Uh, uh, hi, Chairs Anwar and McCarthy Bahi, uh, members of the committee, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify on House Bill 6488. My name, sorry about the <laughs> My name is Martin Cullip and I'm an international fellow at the Taxpayers Protection Alliance at the SUMA Centre. As others will no doubt emphasise, uh, vapour products are significantly less harmful than combustible cigarettes and offer huge potential benefits to public health. Flavours are essential in helping smokers quit smoking and remain smoke-free as they distance the user from their past smoking habit. 
Use of any age-restricted product deserves to be addressed, but to make vaping less attra attractive to adult smokers would be a mistake. Studies into consumption by adult vapors consistently show that the vast majority use fruit, candy, or dessert flavors. Taking flavors off the market can only lead to an increase in combustible cigarette use. Connecticut should look to emulate regulations in countries which have experienced considerable declines in smoking rates. Here in the UK, there is cross-party cross political support for vapor products, and they are recommended to smokers by the NHS. Smoking rates plummeted here by a third in just eight years after e-cigarettes went mainstream. We have vape shops in hospitals here, and the government is talking about going further. The Secretary of State for Health last year commissioned an independent review which recommended unleashing a vaping revolution. Vaping products are available in the UK with an array of flavours to suit all tastes and are displayed in medical, medical aisles of supermarkets, alongside mouthwash and band-aids. This plus endorsement by health authorities has taken away all the glamour for young people, and latest research has found that only 0.5% of adolescents who regularly vape were not former smokers. UK regulations have led to an environment where vaping is seen as predominantly an adult behaviour. Banning flavours will only reduce the number of smokers switching to a far safer product and inadvertently make vaping a rebellious and attractive option for youth. There needs to be a mature conversation around this policy area rather than knee-jerk regulations which go against the science and will do more harm than good. Thank you for your time and I welcome any questions. Thank you so much for your testimony. Seeing no questions, we are going to go back to number five, uh, Dr. Thimmons. Thank you so much. Uh, I am James Timmons. Uh, I am an optometric doctor, but I reside and practice in Fairfield, Connecticut, and have been here for approximately 30 years. I'm here to comment on raised bill 899, which is an act concerning title protection for physicians. First and foremost, uh, lines five to 10 of that document only permit an individual licensed in chapter 370 to use the title physician. This is the physician's chapter. Optometry, on the other hand, is governed by different rules that are found in chapter 380. So our practice act permits our licensed members to use the title optometric doctor or a synonym, synonym such as optometric physician. We can also use abbreviations such as OD. Our title provisions were originally created in section 20-137 and those have been in effect for decades. Uh, we see no reason to change them now. They've been very effective and very clear to the public. The effect of the bill, however, is that although we could still call ourselves an optometric doctor, suddenly for the reasons in which the, uh, suddenly as a result of how the bill is constructed, we no longer can hold ourselves out as an optometric physician, even though this has been in play for well over three decades. This makes no sense and would mainly serve to cause confusion among our patients and the public. The second issue in the bill, which is equally important, is the language to limit surgery to only chapter 370 or 370 practitioners. Yet the bill also provides in lines 13 and 14 of its construction that it does not affect, it. the bill does not affect any medical professions who are acting properly with surgical procedures that are in their scope of practice. Clearly, optometry has had those in play for several decades as well. And this is confusing at minimum, and I'm not sure I understand the proponent's point. So on behalf of the optometric community, the optometric doctors and optometric physicians of Connecticut, we ask that you take no action on raise to bill 899. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I, I think um, there's no intention on the scope and the surgical component. Um, and the bill as of right now doesn't suggest that, but we will even further strengthen that uh, and remove that confusion. So thank you for your testimony. Seeing no other comments, we will go to number seven, uh, Stephen Mendelson. Yes, uh, my name is Stephen Mendelson. I am an autistic adult and psychiatric survivor, and I am testifying in strong opposition to both SB 897 regarding advanced directives, SB and SB 898 regarding forced electroshock, and in respectful opposition to HB 5246 uh, regarding human composting. Uh, regarding uh, forced electroshock first, uh, it, it should be 
as a psychiatric survivor, and you will hear from many others, including the Keep the Promise Coalition and Kathy Flaherty and others, this is a crime against humanity. Forcing, forcing electroshock on somebody against their will is so barbaric, this bill shouldn't even need comment. We should, we should go in the direction of a bill we had 10 years ago, which would have abolished forced electroshock, not make it easier. Uh, regarding the uh, uh, the, uh, the bill regarding advanced directives, Senate Bill 897, is, this is a deceptive piece of legislation which uh, basically deprives the healthcare representative of overriding uh, written or oral instructions, quote, to withhold or withdraw life support systems. It does not say that the representative may not overrule directions for full code. Uh, it's a red, this, is, this is a red flag revealing the one-sided nature of this bill. Uh, often turning on vague expressions, written expressions of not wanting life support into inflexible and binding directives. Many people who would have wanted life-sustaining treatment in unforeseen circumstances will die if this legislation is enacted. And you'll hear a lot more on this later from uh, my colleague, Kathy Ludlam, who, who can say it personally from a disability perspective. And finally, respectfully, uh, regarding House Bill 5246 uh, regarding human composting. Let's call it what it is, human composting. It is not natural. It is not gentle. Uh, you still have to ground the bones into, into fertilizer. You're still rotating the bodies in these steel drums. I'm Jewish. And our tradition, we don't do a lot of the bad environmental practices that the proponents of this bill object to. We agree that we need to do better by the environment. We don't... Uh, Use, we don't cremate. In fact, uh, uh, we don't uh, embalm. We don't use metal caskets. We don't even use a nail in the casket. In Israel, there are no caskets used at all. People are buried simply in their linen tachrichim, their linen shrouds. Uh, to us, this, rem this remi cremation reminds us of what was done to our martyrs by the most anti Semitic regime in human history. And this process also in some ways reminds us, reducing people to soil and fertilizer reminds us of those of our martyrs, and we just uh, had International Holocaust Remembrance Day about five days ago, whose bones were also turned into fertilizer, whose fat was turned into soap, and whose skin was, according to at least some, some accounts, was flayed off, off. And into lampshades. Uh, and I cite uh, Yael, Yael Davidovitz of the Hebra Kedisha of South Jersey and uh, Last Kindness, and I hope you read her comments here. And in terms of the libertarian argument that we should, you know, I, I respect everybody's uh, right to make their own choices here, but this is going to affect the public sphere because you, there's no way of controlling what happens to that cubic yard of quote quality mulch as one person described it. Excuse me, it Mr. Mendelssohn, but your time is up. If you could please summarize. Okay, I'll, I'll summarize Thank this, you. yes. But, uh, we, we we need to make sh we need to make sure that this soil and green future and to respect the difficulty what, what happens that, of that people should not be forced to derive benefit from something that's going out into the public's in, into the public domain growing tomatoes in this human compost and people are not even knowing that 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 they're going to, that they're deriving unwitting benefit from something that they consider to be forbidden by the religious faith or they find offensive. And I think we need to uh, put the brakes on this until at the very least until we can solve issues like this and other things that I've thank said in my written testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your testimony. Truly appreciate you coming in. And uh, Representative Steinberg has a question. Thank you. I just want to say that as someone who's also Jewish, uh, I'm offended by your comparison of this particular well-meaning bill with the Holocaust and uh, utilizing such a tragic event to make your case is, in my mind, totally inappropriate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. May I respond? Please go ahead. Okay, yes. The fact is that uh, you, you're correct that nothing, nothing, and I want to be very clear, nothing compares to the Shoah, all right? Nothing in human history compares to the mass murder of six million of our people. That said, we have to learn some things here. When we, when we treat the deceased with the kind of disrespect that our society is increasingly moving to, that we're just a commodity to be recycled, that impacts how we treat the living. And it's something we should have learned from what happened 
80, 85 years ago. And so that's- Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, you, This is you're very welcome. helpful. Thank you. Seeing no other comments, we'll move on to the next person. Actually, um, uh, uh, Honorable Evelyn Daly is available now. Um, Judge Daly, please uh, go ahead online. Judge Daly, we are ready for you whenever you are. Go ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Very well. Wonderful. We are having some technical issues and I apologize. So good morning, everyone. Cheers, Senator Anwar, Representative McCarthy Vahey, uh, Senator Ranking Member Summers and House Ranking Member Claridis Dietra, and of course the Farmington contingent, Senator Slap and Representative D'Amico and all honorable members of the Public Health Committee. I had intended to speak on Senate Bill 898, but like my colleague, the Honorable Joe Marino, my testimony is a bit obsolete upon hearing that the bill does not reflect the intention of the bill in that it does not want to eliminate judicial oversight. But I still would like to speak on electric shock and give you a little bit of my background. So just about 17 years ago to this day was the first time I granted permission to treat a patient with electroconvulsive shock therapy. As a new judge, I had been surprised that such a decision was under the auspices of the probate court. But over the years, I have come to appreciate the wisdom of the legislature for putting this safeguard in place. Personally, the only way I knew I would be able to order such a controversial treatment was to research it well. I spoke to many physicians, including a gerontologist who explained its brutal past. A time before anesthesia was used, before neuromuscular blockers and before physical jaw protection. I read any literature I could find on the issue and I told John Dempsey Hospital that I would have to witness the procedure before I could subject any patient to that treatment. The hospital accommodated me, the procedure was rapid, just a second or two. As the patient laid there, totally unconscious. I was stunned and greatly relieved. After that education, I went on to hear my first ECT matter for Helen, an elderly woman with malignant catatonia. All pharmacological trials had been done unsuccessfully and her prognosis was bleak. I ordered the ECT treatment. Several weeks later, when I returned to John Dempsey Hospital's psychiatric ward, Helen approached me. She was now walking, talking, and smiling. And she said something to me I will never forget. Thank you for saving my life. I believe judicial oversight is imperative, but I won't spend any time on that because it seems that the bill is not trying to eliminate that. What I do want to suggest is that the 45 day period authorized by statute be increased and that permission should be able to, to be given for 90 to 120 days. I think it would be very beneficial to many ECT patients, especially to maintenance ECT patients. So I don't need to conclude anymore that ECT needs judicial oversight, but I would strongly recommend an increase in the time frame. Thank you for your consideration and allowing me to testify. I don't know if anyone has any questions. Thank you so much, um, Honorable Judge Daly. We appreciate uh, your testimony. It's uh, very helpful and, and thank you for uh, advocating on behalf of the people who need the treatment and it's life-saving for them. Um, thank you very much, sir. 
Seeing no questions or comments, we will move to our next uh, person. It is uh, Sarah Price Hancock. Um, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Price. Uh, sorry for your wait. I, there you are. Mm -hmm. and you can unmute and you can also turn your camera on. Thank you. Uh, well, yeah. mm -hmm. um, no. Um, my, um, 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 needs to turn on my camera. It says there's a message that says you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. So can you allow her to start her video? Video. So perhaps she, because Zoom cannot control that part. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Start my video. Right? Mm -hmm. There you are. Good. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Enmore, Representative McCarthy Vahey, and distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. I appreciate the committee's indulgence in granting me four minutes as an appropriate accommodation. I'm Sarah Price Hancock, here to testify in regards to Senate Bill 898. I'm a nationally certified rehabilitation counselor and former professor of clinical psychiatric rehabilitation at San Diego State University. I've researched electroconvulsive therapies immediate and long-term outcomes for more than a decade. I live with long-term consequences of chronic electrical trauma. I have a progressive form of acquired sensory-based motor dysfunction, presently diagnosed as my neural disorder. That's why I use this speech-generating device and a tilt recline power wheelchair. I'm dependent on caregivers to help me complete activities of daily living. I have a history of ECT. While receiving ECT, I began having problems with balance, coordination and spoke with a lisp when tired. In 2017, these symptoms quickly grew worse. The trauma nurse learned of my ECT history and advised me to research delayed, diffuse electrical injury, first identified in 1906. In 2007, the United States Congressional Hearing on Gulf War Syndrome recommended creating an ECT patient registry specifically to enable understanding why our nation's veterans have doubled the rate of ALS because roughly one-third of people with ALS have a history of electrical injury. The registry was not created. So in 2022, after examining 20 years of Medicare data, researchers discovered people with a history of just 10 ECT treatments have more than double the risk of developing ALS before age 65. That risk triples after age 65. Two American manufacturers make Connecticut's ECT devices, Mecta and Somatics. Both face multiple pending lawsuits for causing permanent brain damage. In 2021, Mecta lost its product liability insurance. Court documents in the Somatics cases reveal the FDA only has one unpublished safety test on record. In the study, inventors gave a single treatment to two dogs and compared their behavior. Oddly, they concluded it is safe to give multiple treatments to humans because both dogs acted the same after a single treatment. As a human, my life is more complex than barking and tail wagging. Last year, the Journal of ECT acknowledged acute slowing of heart rate and heart attack are common in ECT because pulsing nearly an ampere current through the trigeminal nerve for up to eight seconds triggers the trigeminal cardiac reflex. One in 50 patients have major cardiac events during ECT. One in 93 patients die within 30 days. The leading cause of death is cardiac failure. Purposefully stimulating the trigeminal cardiac nerve is against medical ethics. ECT device current is fixed without any clinical or scientific rationale. Mm. ECT is unwitting human experimentation. Mm. For these reasons, I oppose SB 898. It's the patient and their loved ones, not the doctor, who lives with and must pay for ECT's long-term consequences. Connecticut's Senate Committee on Public Health should seriously consider suspending ECT to examine the ethics of purposefully stimulating the trigeminal cardiac reflex. 
choosing to vote in favor of eliminating probate court barriers increases the risk of overprescribing an unregulated medical treatment for which Medicare and Medicaid reimburse in perpetuity at greater rates now without proper documentation than previous years with proper documentation. Is it any wonder hospitals want to remove barriers to shock treatment? Thank you for this opportunity to share real-world evidence on the long-term consequences of electroconvulsive therapy. Please vote no on Senate Bill 898. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. And uh, my first question is actually, you, if you need more time and you want to add something, you're welcome to do so. Mm <laughs> Ms. Hancock, uh, you're writing something, mm. I presume. Right? Yeah. Mm. Okay, good. The use of anesthetic and paralytic requires using a device four to six times more powerful than what was used previously. Without requiring doctors to monitor carbon dioxide levels, each patient risks a repetitive anoxic brain injury, which cannot be seen on standard brain scans. Mm. We all understand the risks of repetitive traumatic brain injury. Please help us. Mm. Thank you so much for your testimony. Truly appreciate it. Seeing no other question or comment, we will move to our next uh, person on our list. Hello. I think the ones who are, uh, that I see in our room are number 11, this, Ruth Kenobi. 
Good afternoon, uh, distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. Uh, my name is Ruth Canovi. I'm the Director of Advocacy for the American Lung Association in Connecticut. I want to thank you for the opportunity to comment on House Bill 6488 regarding tobacco products. It is clear this committee recognizes the very real and very present burden tobacco products have on our communities. And I wanna thank you for all of the good work that you have done in the decades that I've been doing this work. Um, while we recognize the good intention of this legislation, the American Lung Association cannot support this bill as written as it leaves menthol flavored tobacco products on the markets. So we know the need is clear. In 2023, tobacco use impacts too many. Tobacco remains the leading cause of preventable de death and disease in the country. We expect 4,900 Connecticut residents die every year due to tobacco. Tobacco costs Connecticut more than $2 billion every year. And we know that tobacco product use rates are too high. In 2019, we saw Connecticut um, high school students using tobacco at 27.8%. One of those statistics that really gets to me is that in 2021, the National Youth Tobacco Survey data found that 65.3% of students in the US who currently use tobacco products were seriously thinking about quitting the use of all products, and 60.2% actually had made a quit attempt. These kids know how hooked they are right now, and they want help. So why do we address flavors? Flavors, including menthol, are one of the main reasons kids use tobacco products and have played a huge role in the youth vaping epidemic and overall use rates. Research shows that almost 80% of kids who currently use tobacco products use a flavored product, and over 40%, around 40% of high school students who smoke still use menthol cigarettes. While most flavored cigarettes within the, with the glaring exemption of menthol cigarettes are prohibited under federal law, the industry continues using flavors of other tobacco products to attract youth and then addict them. Exempting menthol would create a two-tiered system of public health inequity, disproportionately protecting predominantly white communities where e-cigarettes are more popular, while leaving kids behind in predominantly Black, Latinx, and LGBTQ plus communities where menthol is more popular. Menthol is not only a flavor, but a chemical that can impact smoking inhalation, initiation, addiction, and cessation. So I wanna underscore why it's so important to be comprehensive when we leave flavors on the market, kids follow flavors that remain. After a very limited action, federal action, that removed a small number of pod-based flavored e-cigarettes from the market, youth followed the flavors and the use of products where flavors remained skyrocketed by 1000% among high school e-cigarette users and 400% among middle school e-cigarette users. I look forward to discussing with this with you further. And I just also wanted to express our support for addressing smoking in cars with kids. This is about protecting children to help them breathe healthy air and develop healthy lungs into adulthood. The science behind the impact secondhand smoke has on children in such an enclosed space is clear and levels of air pollution in a car, even with the windows open, get incredibly high, incredibly fast. And so I thank you for all of your good work and recognizing the burden that tobacco has on the communities. And I welcome the opportunity to talk with you about these important policies and how to strengthen them to protect all Connecticut residents. So thank you so much. And I'll entertain any questions if you have any. Thank you for your testimony. I, I think Re Representative Clarence Dieter has a question or a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ruth, thank you for your testimony. I have um, one question for you. Can you give me your opinion on or, or your position on THC limiting THC flavored products that look like you know, candy or soda? Yeah, and so the Lung Association's position on marijuana and in general, anything that can be smoked, nothing should go into these lungs besides clean and healthy air and um, prescribed medication. And so I know that THC, we're hearing a lot more about it and the Lung Association is gathering more data because we really like to base these things on science. Um, however, we, I do know that we've been involved a little bit in this conversation in I believe it's Minnesota. And so I'm happy to kind of continue those conversations as we move forward. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah, you very yeah. much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative uh, uh, Steinberg followed by Representative Foster. Uh, Ruth, thank you for your advocacy on this subject over a period of years. You made note in your opening remarks uh, regarding your concerns about failing to include menthol as part of this legislation. That seems to be the crux of many of our 
deliberations at this point. Could you elaborate a little further why that's so critical? Yeah, I mean, thank you for that. And it's it really is about justice when we think about that. And I, I don't often do this, but I'll, I'll share a, a personal story of mine um, when we're looking at all of this. So when I was a teenager, it was um, kind of the, the height of the real, like people were smoking cigarettes pretty often when we look at those, those pieces. And um, clove cigarettes were a huge hit and they were very popular. Um, they smelled good, they tasted good. I, they made me feel like a bit of a rebel. I tried them. And while I didn't get hooked, they left a lasting on me, impression on me. I can still kind of smell them if I think about it. And I wonder what the long-term impacts of those products will be for me. Now, decades later, um, those products are off the market. We decided that those flavors were not appropriate for people to use. There are still products on the market that have flavors that impact people who don't look like me. And so I'm really concerned about the justice aspect of this. We have an opportunity to do this right and protect everyone in the state of Connecticut um, from doing this. And I know some people might talk about federal action. Um, we can't wait for the federal um, action on this. It's as we know from experience, things take an awfully long time. And if we want to protect um, all kids, it's really important that we include everybody. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that. If I could just do a real, real swift follow up on that. Um, how do you respond to the concerns of many in our more urban communities with regard to the disproportionate impact of banning menthol in those communities? I would say that other communities have already been protected. Um, we know, if just kind of looking at who supports this, um, there's some really great advocacy work being done by the African American Tobacco Leadership Council, um, the Black Health, um, Black Center on Health Inequity. Um, there's the tobacco industry has targeted these populations for decades, and we can see that when the you know kind of share and percentage of the population's um, percentage of black and brown population who is using um, menthol products decades ago was a very small population. Now, um, 85% of black and brown smokers smoke menthol cigarettes. So I would say that people who, who look like me who are interested in those clove cigarettes, those got removed and I'm not worried about my kids getting hooked on those. Um, I'm saying it's, it's a matter of health justice. And we know that um, black and brown communities have been specifically targeted and in documents by the tobacco industry that show that they're trying to get hooked. And so I would say it's a matter of um, equity that we need to protect everyone from the damage that flavors has on all communities. Uh, thank you, Ruth. I tend to agree with yeah. you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Foster. Thank you so much for being with us today, Ruth. I really appreciate your testimony. Um, I have to say this legislation and the last two years of similar legislation have been one of the most complicated um, bills that I have seen before the Public Health Committee, and it's increasingly complicated as personally a scientist with a PhD in a field related in public health to discern the unintended consequences of a bill like this. So it gives me a lot of pause um, to read this legislation and hear testimony from advocacy organizations because I feel um, sort of compelled to ask about unintended consequences. So before I sort of ask specifically about my concerns about unintended consequences, are you concerned about any of the unintended consequences of banning um, a uh, harm reduction tool? Well, it's the Lung Association's position that these products are tobacco products and should be treated as thus. I heard someone talk about um, these products in the United Kingdom, and those products are like apples and oranges. These products are not regulated like they are in the UK and the United States. And so I have a real hard time um, embracing that statement. Um, and what we've seen is, well, one, <laughs> E-cigarettes, you know, they're not FDA approved cessation devices. And if they want to be, there's a way to go about that process to kind of apply for that 
process and it hasn't been done in the United States. Um, and there's no science that kind of says that they are smoking cessation um, devices. And so, at least in the United States. And so I guess I'm just, um, I hear you and I, please feel free to ask any specific questions, um, but the Lung Association is, um, is really concerned about the impact that electronic cigarettes have had on youth. When we saw for so long, people really, kids reducing, you know, you talk to kids and they're like, no, we don't use tobacco because they don't smoke cigarettes as much, as much as an overall conversation. So we're really concerned about e-cigarettes and how those have impacted young people and brought them into the kind of the next I generation of being hooked. And so I think the term cessation tool versus harm reduction are mm -hmm. important and distinctly different. I do think the evidence is pretty clear that um, ends as opposed to combustibles are a harm reduction. Um, and they're, they're a harm reduction, not just for the users, but for those who might be exposed to secondhand smoke um, in a household. So when adults are switching to a non-combustible form, the secondhand smoke damage is not non-existent, but it is reduced. Um, and so I guess my big concern now is in the last three years, since I've sat in this committee and seen these bills proposed, there have been more publications each year in really high quality, high impact peer reviewed journals by excellent scientists with great credentials, reviewed by panels, even after critiques of editors on the boards that they sit on that suggest that there is a crossover of these youth who no longer have access to the flavored products, switching to the more harmful combustible products. And I guess what I'm struggling with is statistically and numerically, I don't know that the societal benefit in a year or 10, if we adopted this legislation, would be better if some kids never got hooked versus the kids we already know are hooked switch to a more harmful product. And because I don't know, and I think the evidence is clear that kids are switching, um, I, I, I'm worried about a policy like this. And so my, my question for you is what about other policy proposals um, championed by scientists in this community that might have a similar impact? For example, a policy like um, in, um, only selling tobacco products um, like these in 21 plus venues that would significantly restrict access of these products to children who are underage because it would increase, increase the rigor of checks at point of sales. So it would have the same potential benefit for young people or Thank what- Thank you, Representative Foster. As, as per our, our initial thing, we wanted to keep the entire conversation within five minutes that included five minutes of the question and one second left for the answer. So um, okay. see what yeah. we can do with this one. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, okay. um, Representative Foster, and happy to talk with you further kind of offline. Um, but I guess I would say I will point to, to alcohol in this regard. And I think a lot of us know that there's still access to these products um, at 21 and we're really concerned about it. So again, I want to respect time and I'm happy to follow up with you moving forward. Uh, thank you so much. I, I think we will need to have a little bit more in-depth conversation probably uh, offline. So I would like to be included as well to make sure. And, and I value your, your question, uh, Representative Foster. But um, with that, seeing no other questions or, oh, there is one more question from my co-chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, thank you, Ruth, very much for your uh, work on this issue. And I actually will just continue that conversation, if I may. Um, I think you made a comment in, in your remarks um, about um, exempting menthol really disproportionately protecting white communities. And to be clear, this committee has uh, very much an interest in being sure that we are looking at racial equity. And I think the, the practicalities of what this bill has been and our inability to kind of move forward and actually get something done. So I think I would just like to ask you to continue to answer that question that Representative Foster brought up because I think there's the sense of, do we try and move forward with something and is that something the right thing? Because part of the conversation that I heard you had was preventing youth from starting 
versus harm reduction for those who have already begun. So if you could just kind of continue your answer to uh, Representative Foster, that would be great. Great. So I think we have real concerns about um, kind of limiting it to 21 plus. And um, I'm gonna look into some, some other aspects of that. And so I know that's not a, a huge, huge answer um, like right off the bat, because I know that um, Representative Foster wants the, the science there. Um, but we know that the, the law right now is 21 plus. Um, I anecdotally, and I do wanna follow up with some numbers because I don't have them right offhand, is I hear that kids are getting them from shops. And so, so like vape shops. So I just want to be, um, I, I would prefer to just take a little bit of time to just follow up on kind of the sources of where we know kids are getting them now. And um, because I, I, I just want to be accurate in that because I do have real concerns about limiting them to um, 21 and plus establishments um, because we, again, especially if we look to alcohol, we know that um, kids are still getting access to these products. So I know that's not exactly what you may have been looking for, but I'm happy to follow up. No, and I do think yeah. we will definitely be having ongoing yeah. conversation. As Senator Amor said at the beginning, as we um, have bills before us for public hearing, we begin and we take the input and then we continue to work on the process very much. So I, I think what your comments reflect the importance of the ability to gather data mm -hmm. and understand those environmental conditions that we're operating within. So I appreciate that and look forward to ongoing conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Then we have uh, Representative Zupkus who has her hand raised, virtual hand. Go ahead. Thank Rep. you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I have just one question, really. I kind of look at this. Uh, when I look at this, I look at all, everybody, um, not just one particular group. Uh, I look at children. I look at uh, every life. As uh, And so my question is, do you, um, Ruth, thank you for coming, but um, are you in favor of banning all tobacco products, whether it's, you know, chewing tobacco, snuff, uh, cigars, like everything, or is your interest just in vaping with this piece of legislation? Our interest is in flavored products, flavored tobacco products, because we see that that is a major draw for young people. Okay, so whether it's flavored vaping yeah. or flavored tobacco, um, did you uh, come out, did you, and I apologize if you did, I didn't know, um, because edibles, Okay, so now we know pot is legal in Connecticut um, and it, it's edible flavors is a big thing. And so um, I would assume that you're against all of that also and the whole marijuana. Well, our again, our policy is not around the, the products, but we're talking about flavors and what brings people in. So the lung association um, has, you know, policy, nothing, nothing in the lungs except he clean, healthy air and prescribed medications. Um, and so we think that tobacco products and marijuana should be regulated similarly. Um, and so happy to follow up. I think I mentioned that a colleague of mine is working on something in Minnesota around um, flavored marijuana. Happy okay. to talk about that further. Mm -hmm. Okay, because not all, to, and you know this probably better than I, not all uh, tobacco is inhaled. So like snuff or chewing yeah. tobacco and all those. So that all falls under your concern and wanting to ban? Yeah, in the tobacco space, there's been a lot more science done on the impacts. And we know that there's a lot of issues with dual use as well. Um, marijuana hasn't been studied as much, um, because, well, essentially it was um, on a list that made it very difficult to study. And so again, the Lung Association is really paying very close attention to everything that's happening around the country. And I think as we get more science, our um, positions on things are going to be changing and evolving. Okay, thank you. Yep, thank thank you. you. Thank you so much. And seeing no other questions or comments, we wanted to thank you for your testimony and, and your response to questions. We will be following up to have a more in-depth conversation because it's not, uh, easy enough to get an answer and, and, and understand about this complex issue. Um, Thank you so I wanted much. to ask uh, Dr. Matthew DeMond to, to join in. I wanted to apologize to you, Dr. DeMond. Um, you did not appear on the list earlier, but I know that you were there. So I apologize for calling you a little late. So please go ahead. 
That is absolutely absolutely okay. And thank you very much. And good afternoon, uh, Senator Anwar, Representative Kristen McCarthy Vehi, Senator Somers, Representative Nicole Claire Distitria, and members of the committee. My name is Matthew DeMond, president of the Connecticut Chiropractic Association, who would like to raise a concern about raised bill 899 as it relates to the use of the title physician in lines five through 10. Our practice act in chapter 372 specifically allows licensed chiropractors to hold themselves out to their patients and the public as a doctor of chiropractic. That is justifiable as we've had all graduated from an accredited college of chiropractic with a degree of doctor of chiropractic. We have passed rigorous examinations in order to be licensed by the Department of Public Health. As set forth in our title law, we may use the term doctor so long as we include chiropractic with it. We have not heard of any complaints made to DPH over this over use of that title. That statute, section 2032, also allows us to use a synonym for doctor, which many of our members do by referring to themselves as a chiropractic physician. I would add the workers' compensation program specifically provides that DCs are considered physicians. As drafted, Senate Bill 899 would prohibit any person who practices outside of Chapter 370 from using the term physician. The problem is that this would supersede our current title law, which has been in effect for decades. We ask that you specifically exempt practitioners in Chapter 372 from this bill. Then there would be no question that an appropriately licensed member will continue to be able to be advertised as a chiropractic physician. Thank you for considering the views of the Connecticut Chiropractic Association on this issue. Thank, thank you so much for your testimony and thank you for your patience with us. Uh, appreciate your testimony. Um, next person on our list is number 12, uh, John uh, Rotuno. Mr. Rotuno. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. How are you? Thank you for, thank you for having me. I will be brief within my three minutes. Um, my name is John Rotuno. I am a retired ATF agent, uh, 35 years on the job. Um, I Most of my career, I spent working undercover into organized groups of criminals, drug cartels, and street gangs. I know I'm not much to look at now, but in my earlier years, uh, I did these things that, I, that I'm talking to you about. I'm currently an adjunct professor uh, teaching uh, classes in law enforcement at a local junior college here. I'm, I am an outsider. Uh, it is morning here still. I'm calling, I'm talking to you from Chicago. Um, I am qualified as a gang crimes expert in street operations in both the state and the federal courts. I am also a, uh, an employee uh, I'm employed by the Reynolds Tobacco Company as a law enforcement consultant in how organized crime and how the criminal element enhances their criminal activity through the use of flavored tobacco products. And I will put it on the table right now. I, I truly understand what your committee is trying to do with flavored tobacco products, vaping products. And I'm not, I'm not here to argue or to put up a wall about your process or what you're trying to do. Uh, we all agree that it's a good thing. The, the thing that, that you're going to be faced with by doing this is that there is still a hunger. There's still an appetite for these products. The, uh, the, uh, the, flavored, the flavored tobacco products, the menthol, there is still a hunger for it, just like there is for the narcotics. Heroin, oxy, fentanyl, crack, regular cocaine, weed, there's still an appetite out there for these products. And, and no matter how many laws we've put on the books, and trust me, oh, and also the gun violence, everybody wants a gun. No matter how many rules and laws we put on the books, there's still going to be that element that desire to have these things. When I did my undercover, um, I noticed that there was a trend that was leaving where the gangs, the criminal element no longer wanted cash. They wanted to do the trade for the flavored tobacco, for the vapes, for the menthols, for the tobacco. They did not want cash. They wanted tobacco, flavored tobacco, the vaping products, et cetera. 
So what did we do? Well, we supplied them and it was business as usual. And we made a lot of good headway, knocking down the criminal element, um, trading their drugs, their guns for the vape and the flavored products. Um, that Excuse all me, Mr. Started. Reed. Um, your time is up. If I'm you sorry. Please okay. summarize. Thank, Thank you. you. You want me to summarize? Please. Uh, no, I okay. What what I have to say is this. With all these rules and your ordinance that I'm sure is well placed, it, when this comes into place, what's going to happen is this. These organized groups of criminals are going to go to other states. They're going to create a black market. They will get on the uh the internet. They'll order up their flavors on the internet, their menthols. They'll spray the regular tobacco products with this, with, with the things that they get on the internet, and you're going to create a black market. That's that's my opinion. Take it or leave it, but that's that's how I see Thank it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Um, when you registered, you, you represented that you are speaking on behalf of ATF, but your testimony suggests that you are not. I, want I said to- I was retired ATF. I, maybe I misunderstood the question, but look at I tabled. I already tabled to you what what I am. I, I work for Reynolds. OK, thank you. Just wanted to clarify. Because All right. OK, thank I'm you retired so ATF, sir. Seeing no other question or comment, we thank you for your testimony. Thank Next you, sir. Thank you for having me. Read a, uh, list is John Reed. Um, Miss, actually, Professor Reed, you're on. You just need to mute yourself. Un- unmute yourself. Sorry. No, no, you're still muted, sir. Still muted. Right, there there okay. Very sorry. Um, lovely to be with you from London. Um, what a wonderful process. I've been learning lots about all sorts of different things. Um, anyway, I'm I'm uh, Professor John Reed. I'm a, a doctor of clinical psychology. Um, I'm a, a shock therapy researcher. Um, or as we call it over here, electroconvulsive therapy. So I've published numerous research studies and on ECT, and more importantly, um, several reviews of what the entire research literature says. Um, and the reason I'm wanting to make a submission is to make sure that in deciding what to do about 898, whether to extend the, the period, um, I would like committee members to be fully aware of what the science says about the damage that this treatment can do. And if you understand that, then you might um, be reluctant to leave it longer before people, before the psychiatrists have to come back and ask the probate court for permission to continue, because the damage I'm going to describe is accumulative over time and over the number of ECTs that people have. So to extend the period, beyond the 45 days, I think would be um, bad scientifically and medically, but also um, the damage is such that these patients' constitutional rights need to be um, protected as far as possible. So the damage um, comes in two main forms. I mean, you saw some of the damage from Sarah Hancock earlier, um, which is very sad, of course, to watch Sarah try and communicate Uh, after the damage that ECT has caused her. The the more common damage is cognitive um, in terms of memory. So ECT causes retrograde amnesia um, and enterograde amnesia. So retrograde amnesia is the loss of memories prior to the time of the ECT. Um, So not remembering, in an extreme form, not remembering your wedding or those sorts of things, chunks of your life disappearing. Um, and pterograde amnesia is the inability to form new memories, um, which, of course, puts some people's livelihoods at, at risk if you're not able to remember the conversation you just had or um, the meeting you just attended. Um, the frequency of this is research is not good in terms of frequency, but the best I can tell you uh, looking at all the research um, is that it's between 12 and 55 percent of people will exp- will will suffer persistent or permanent 
memory loss or, or brain damage. Um, I understand that the psychiatrists who use EC2 don't use like to use the term brain damage, but when an incident happens and the brain no longer works properly as a result of that incident, um, and that uh, change is permanent, then I'm quite comfortable calling that brain damage. It's also important to know that um, women and older people are particularly susceptible. Excuse um, me, Professor women. Reed, but your yeah. time is up. If you would please summarize. Thank yeah. you. So thank you very much. So because of what I'm saying is because of this uh, damage, um, this evidence-based uh, damage, even though ECT can help some people, it, it is not life-saving. There is no evidence that it prevents suicide, um, but it does help some people. But the risk of the, the damage I've described is, is such that it would be, I think, not a good idea to extend the period um, after which psychiatrists have to come back and ask permission to continue it because the damage is getting worse Thank you as for, time goes on. Thank you, Thank you for your testimony, sir. Um, I have Representative Palm who has a question or a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Professor, can you just elaborate briefly on your um, last comment about how the, the female brain is affected more dramatically? I understand why an older brain might be. Can you just explain that a little bit in lay persons? We, we don't, to be honest, we don't know why women experience more memory loss and brain damage from, from ECT. Um, the whole area is very poorly research and uh, it's a rather cavalier approach to this sort of treatment so we don't know the best theory is um that every time you have uh, a, an incident of shock therapy um the the threshold for the next seizure um increases because the purpose of each ele electric shock is to cause a convulsion i know that's strange because one branch of medicine is trying to cure convulsions and epilepsy and we have this other branch trying to cause cause convulsions, which is a, a strange situation to be in. But the brain tries to protect itself by creating a higher threshold. So every time you have, you have the second one and the third one, you have to have more electricity to create the convulsion. And there's a theory that for some reason, and that increase in the threshold occurs faster for women, if that makes any sense. So somehow they've got a built-in better protective system so that m more electricity is needed um and it's the electricity that causes causes the damage of course but that Thank is only a theory we don't really know why women experience more brain damage than, than men Thank you Thank you Mr chair Thank you so much seeing no other comments or questions we thank you for your testimony. Uh, the next person on our list is um, uh, another professor Richard Marianos from Georgetown University. Dr. Marianos or Professor Marianos. Thank you so much for your time. Can everyone hear me? We can hear you, but we don't see you, sir. There we go. How's that? We can see you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. I appreciate your time. I'm here to talk about, if I can for a moment, House Bill 6488. My name is Rich Marianos. I currently work at Georgetown University. Uh, prior to my education career, I was assistant director with ATF. Um, what I want to talk about is three simple things, why this is a bad idea, because a prohibition anywhere, any way you look at it is going to create crime. Once you begin to outlaw flavored products, you're going to bring in the black market and along with this, and it was something that one of your colleagues brought up are the bad policies and the unintended consequences. Um, bad policy does result in unintended consequences, and I want to go through some of those if I can. Um, in terms of creating crime, you look over at Massachusetts, they banned flavored products and they have a criminal problem that they cannot get a control over. They have cross-border smuggling. Just last year, they've had 250,000 seizures and tens of millions of dollars lost in revenue. Um, but I think the, our biggest concern right now, what we have to understand is, in terms of the unintended consequence is, is the opposite of police reform. If we're gonna go out there and harass and regulate rather than serve and protect with law enforcement, we're gonna do the opposite of what needs to be done. And I think this is at the forefront if you go on television right now, at any time in the next 24 hours, you're gonna see a, a huge narrative surrounding police working with the community and working with one another. You, you mentioned about racial equity. 
If you put something in place or a prohibition in place where law enforcement or any community officials have to go out and regulate and harass, you're going to drive a wedge between the community, which is going to be more problematic than anything you've ever seen before. Next point I want to bring up that's very important is tobacco harm reduction. And the point I don't think people are looking at is if it is taken out of the regulation right now, the stores or the vendors, you're going to put it out on the street. And there's the harm reduction exists in young adults and people will be forced to buy their products on the street in alleys, gangways, corners from individuals from the various means. They're going to put this product out on the streets and create more harm than it is good. At least when people are trying to buy it, they're carded. When they go to shops, we can try to prohibit some of these young adults. You put it out on the black market, there is no card. They're going to be selling at schools. They're already selling at schools. And I ask you to please take these things into consideration because they're the consequences that aren't every day looked at that we're currently studying at the university and amongst law enforcement through the IACP and through uh, the Police Executive Research Forum. I would ask if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Thank you so much. Um, seeing no, oh, there is a question, Representative Carpine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your testimony. I just want to be clear that I understand on whose behalf you're testifying. Are you? Um, I'm gonna. I, I'll be very um, polite, but blunt with my question. Are Are you here on uh, your own volition? Are you here on behalf of Georgetown? I understand that you're a retired ATF, but are you paid uh, by any entity to be before us, sir? Well, I do use this material in my Georgetown class, and because of that, the tobacco industry does sponsor um, myself for some of my testimony using some of my academic work as part of uh, their effort to keep tobacco products out of the hands of nefarious criminals. And I appreciate your answer, but just so I'm clear, the tobacco industry is sponsoring your testimony here today? Uh, I think they're aware, yes, they are aware that I'm going to testify, absolutely. But I just want to make sure I understand what you said previously, that they do sponsor some of your work, which does not cast any aspirations. No, I just I, understand they, they, exactly who's before me. No, they, they have used some of my work, and I have used some of my work for the tobacco industry, yes, in various testimonies throughout the country. Thank you. It's very clear. I appreciate that. Thank you. No, you're welcome. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Okay. Seeing other comments or questions, uh, we will move on to our next uh, individual on our list. It is. Uh, Alex Clark, um, who's with the Consumer Advocates for Smoke-Free Alternatives. Mr. Clark. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Excellent. Um, well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you, co-chairs Anwar and McCarthy Vehi, uh, Ranking Members Summers and uh, Claritis Dietria, uh, and the rest uh, honorable members of the Public Health Committee uh, for your time today uh, and for the opportunity to speak on behalf of our 2,500 members in Connecticut um, in opposition to House Bill 6488. Uh, first, I'll, I'll start by uh, echoing the concerns expressed by uh, former ATF members and, and, of course, the academic uh, uh, look at, at, at how black markets are created and the unintended consequences that come from that. Uh, and certainly we expect to see something like that coming from a flavor ban. Uh, we've already seen it in Massachusetts, uh, which I believe the, the biggest beneficiaries of that ban were, of course, uh, cigarette companies and uh, the state of New Hampshire. Uh, I believe Connecticut saw a rise in, in sales of tobacco products as a result of Massachusetts, Massachusetts ban. Uh, New York, where I am currently residing, uh, I li live in Plattsburgh, New York, uh, banned the sale of flavored vapor products at the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, to this day, I believe that uh, you can pr still get pretty much whatever you want, either through uh, you know some sort of internet connection or walking into the convenience stores uh, that, that are still selling the products. Uh, and these are not products that are going to be reviewed by FDA. Uh, these are not products that consumers can have confidence in the quality. Uh, these are, for all intents and purposes, uh, illicit products. Uh, and uh, that is another concern that we have about exposing consumers to unintended risk um, in, 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 in purchasing products that we really have no idea where they're coming from. Um, and uh, the other aspect of this bill uh, that was mentioned earlier was prohibiting smoking in cars where a minor is present. Um, again, I'll, I'll defer to law enforcement for, I think, some more nuanced conversation about where this can, can, can cause issues and unintended consequences. 
uh, but as a justice issue, uh, we've heard testimony from law enforcement professionals uh, in other municipalities and, and states uh, saying that they don't they don't want this. Uh, this is a, a policy that can lead to uh, unnecessary interactions with law enforcement. Um, and to add to the sort of unintended consequences of bills like this, um, interactions with law enforcement as a minor uh, is known to increase the likelihood that uh, a young person will go on to experiment with drugs. Uh, and we might as well include nicotine and tobacco in, in the list of drugs that someone uh, would be experimenting with. Um, and, and I really do, I think it's 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 really important to, to maybe reset the table here and state very clearly that the issue at hand is smoking. It's smoking that causes the uh, preventable early death and disease. Uh, it is not broadly the tobacco category. Uh, FDA has, has come out and endorsed the idea of the continuum of risk, acknowledging that cigarettes are the most harmful and dangerous product. And that continuum goes all the way down to uh, nicotine replacement therapies, uh, which present similar risks uh, compared to uh, smoke-free nicotine products like vapor products, like nicotine pouches, uh, and even some smokeless tobacco products. Um, I, I do want to, before I run out of time here, really quickly mention that uh, next week I will be celebrating 10 years smoke-free. Uh, I switched after smoking cigarettes two packs a day for most of that. Uh, I switched to vapor products in 2013 and haven't had a cigarette since. Uh, and it was it was flavors that kept me engaged with the products and kept me from going back to smoking. Thank uh, you, Mr. So. Clark. Uh, your time is up. If you would please summarize. Certainly. Uh, since we are discussing solutions here, I think this is all about honest education, not the education that we've seen from FDA, not the education that we've seen from some of the major campaigns, which deal largely on fear and innuendo, uh, giving kids the tools that they need to avoid substance use uh, and, and to get out of trouble when they see themselves or their friends uh, getting involved in things like that. Thank so you. thank you very much for your time and, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for your testimony. Seeing no questions or comments, we'll move on to the next person on the list, which is Dr. Anthony Pescucci. Dr. Pescucci, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, state senators, state representatives, members of the committee. My name is Anthony Pascucci. I'm a naturopathic physician. I practice at Collaborative Natural Health Partners. I practice out of offices in Manchester, Glastonbury, West Hartford. I reside in Manchester. I'm here today to speak about SB 899 and humbly and respectfully oppose it. Uh, naturopathic physicians, we attend a fully accredited four-year naturopathic medical school. We receive the you know, same core basic sciences as MDs and DOs in areas of anatomy, physiology, immunology, even pharmacology, which surprises a lot of people. And we'll come back to that because that's an important uh, area. Uh, and in, in addition, we receive our additional training in botanical or herbal medicine, a lot of which pharmaceuticals come from nutrition, uh, diet, lifestyle. So the reason I oppose this bill, I believe that the, the term physician, albeit in my case, always qualifying naturopathic physician, I, I believe it's an important term. It conveys a lot to the public, conveys a sense of trust. Where are you getting your medical information and your recommendations from? These days, you could see a doctor of nutrition, you could see someone who is trained in uh, exercise, in botanical medicine, a lay uh, botanist, an herbalist. But none of those people receive the training in pharmacology, in the other areas of medicine, are looking at it from the lens of a physician who can order labs, imaging, diagnostics to appropriately work the person up, understand their medical history, the medications are on. We're extensively trained in drug-herb interactions, herb-herb inter interactions, nutrient interactions, the way certain medicines deplete nutrients. We have an understanding of all that. So you, you know that when you see a naturopathic physician, you can trust that you're, you're getting your advice, your recommendations from someone who's taking your whole medical history into account. These days, you could get your information from an increasing amount of, of places. You could even get it online. I can tell you, I see a lot of patients who come in who first perhaps heard about a supplement, an herb, uh, or some aspect of nutrition online, or they've seen a nutritionist, seen an herbalist, but none of those other people are uh, trained as a physician to take into account the interactions with their medications, the ways that these different modalities impact their, their health history. So um, in summary, I, I think 
while perhaps a lot of what I'm speaking of uh, relates to scope, I think there is a link between title and scope um, that conveys a sense of, of trust to the public. Uh, and I think information is a growing public health issue. I think it's good to know who you're getting your information from. You can trust that when you see a naturopathic physician, you're getting your recommendations from someone who was trained in, in medicine. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you for your patience with us today. Certainly. Thank um, you. Can I ask one before you want? Well, you, why don't you go ahead? Representative Senator Summers has a question. Certainly. Yes, I have a question. So currently you are allowed under statute to call yourself a naturopathic doctor or doctor of naturopathic medicine and a physician, correct? Uh, correct. Naturopathic right. physician. Right. So this, the way this bill is written, um, because it defines surgery, you would not be able to call yourself a physician any longer. Fair. Uh, we're trained in minor surgery for the states in which we're, uh, our scope includes that, uh, but correct, I, I cannot perform surgery in Connecticut. So therefore, if this bill were to pass, you would lose the ability to call yourself a physician, and you've had that ability, I think, in statute for 30 years, along with some other uh, doc doctors. So um, I just wanted to make sure that you're asking to not be able to lose that title of physician for a naturopathic doctor. Correct. You want to keep it as it's been? Oh, uh, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, you you probably may have more questions. Yes, sir. Um, I wanted to ask you this, uh, and, and this is a, also an opportunity to clarify something. Um, some time ago, your statewide organization mm -hmm. uh, took a position when uh, many of uh, your colleagues said that uh, they had some medicine in their cabinet that they could not tell what it is would be able to prevent and cure polio. Okay, I'm um, sorry, I'm not aware of the But, but the, the, your association said that uh, we are not against that individual and we are not for that individual. We have a neutral position on mm. what many people were making a statement uh, a few okay. years ago. These are public statements. Okay, so, um, you know, in my own, my answer would be, um, and I can't speak for, for my, you know, for my association, but, because we're, you know, trained and, and registered as we are, uh, we're held accountable. I think if if someone were uh, to speak in a way uh, where they should be held accountable, I support that. I, I'm not familiar with the exact case. So you support the the statement from your colleagues that they can prevent and cure polio from a medicine in their office? Not knowing enough about that, I, I do not. I do okay. not. All right. Sorry, I wanted to no, clarify. That's quite okay. Okay. Quite okay. All right. Thank you so much. Oh, Seeing welcome. no other comments or questions, we thank you for your. Thank you. Next is uh, Tim Andrews. Thank you, Tim Andrews, testifying on behalf of Americans for Tax Reform. Thank you to the committee, to the committee staff. And I also want to particularly thank a representative, Dr. Foster, for already a lot of the really good questions that she's been asking of some of the previous speakers. Because this really gets down to a really important fundamental question. Do we support prohibition or do we support harm reduction? And what does the evidence show? Policy should be based on evidence and on sound science and not on anecdote and emotion. And the science we submit is overwhelmingly clear. Harm reduction works, prohibition doesn't. We see this from history of prohibition, but we see now, rather than prohibition, the evidence on harm reduction. The meta-analyses that have been conducted of hundreds of studies on vaping, first by, the Royal, um, by Public Health England, replicated by the Royal, Royal College of Physicians, show they are 95% safer than deadly combustible cigarettes. Georgetown University has modelled if a majority of American smokers took up vaping, up to 6.6 .6 million lives would be saved in America over the next 10 years. The Cochrane Review, the gold standard of meta-analysis in medicine, has shown that these products are between two and six times more effective than any other smoking cessation tool. This is evidence, which is why the FDA speaks about the um, continuum of risk, which is why over 100 of the world's leading medical organisations, independent organisations, have endorsed harm reduction as a strategy. We know from the evidence that flavours are vital to helping adults quit smoking because they make reduced risk products more appealing. We also know from the evidence that they are unrelated to whether kids take these products up. Only about 12% of kids say this is a factor, and yes, that should be stopped. But what did we see these flavour bans do? 
on, this, on these products, we saw, according to Ab Ab Abigail Friedman's from Yale University study, they don't impact vaping rates. All they do is increase smoking rates amongst youth. This is evidence. What we see in Massachusetts happen, where they had a wholesale flavor ban, is the state lost $10 million in tax revenue a month, and oh, which was only menthol cigarettes as well, 10 million in taxpayer revenue a month, black market flourished, and guess what? Smoking rates didn't go down. In fact, they went up because the black market filled in the gap because you don't have the checks and balances you have in a retail market. And all of these, the links to this is provided in our submission, in our business testimony. What we have seen also in a week where once again, the news is dominated by police interactions with the most vulnerable in our community, we have seen groups such as the ACLU, Reverend Al Sharpton, the families of George Floyd and Eric Garner come out against menthol bans because, again, they don't work, but they put people in a position where they can have an interaction with law enforcement, which can turn tragic. They also divert law enforcement attention away from other issues. So rather than in break on prohibition and make this bill even worse, as some have suggested, by increasing prohibition, the committee should do everything in its power to accept science and support harm reduction. Thank Excuse you. Excuse me. The question. Okay. It was good. good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I think your three minutes are up, Mr. Andrews. We appreciate your testimony. Thank, Thank you. you. Seeing no questions or comments. Oh, we have Representative Zupkus who has a comment or a question. Representative Zupkus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a, a quick question. Um, does the FDA regulate all of these products? So the, uh, the FDA has provided a pathway through pre-market authorization where products can apply for this and they're currently going through the process of being approved. So I, this isn't quite a case of the FDA regulating them as a smoke cessation device. Rather, it's a pathway that the FDA is currently, currently can review various products. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Seeing no other comments or questions, we will move on to our next individual who is in person. Dr. Mary Tracy, welcome. Great. Good morning, senators, state representatives, and members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Dr. Mary Tracy, and I'm here in opposition of SB 899. I'm a naturopathic physician at Collaborative Natural Health Partners, and we are a group of naturopathic physicians osteopathic physicians and APRNs, and we work to make sure the, the members of our community have the medical support they need, whether it's nutrition, herbs, supplements, or prescription medications. Um, we accept referrals from other practitioners and refer patients for medications, further diagnostics and surgeries when necessary. We are licensed and monitored by the Department of Public Health and required to maintain the same level of malpractice as MDs and DOs. Approval of SB 899 would mean taking away the word physician from naturopathic doctors. The title of naturopathic physician lets the general public know we are licensed and trained to safely educate and support them in their health. This is crucial, especially at a time when chronic disease is on the rise in our nation and we face a shortage of primary care practitioners. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for coming here in person. Seeing no other comments or questions, we appreciate you being here. Thank you. And the next person is uh, Mr. Robert Melvin, online. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Anwar and Chairwoman McCarthy Vahey and members of the committee. My name is Robert Melvin. I'm the Senior Manager of State Government Affairs for the Northeast Region for the R Street Institute. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy research organization, and our mission is uh, to engage in public policy research and outreach to promote free markets and limit effective government in many areas, including integrated harm reduction. That's why we're particularly concerned with House Bill 6488. Um, we, as an organization, have a longstanding uh, concern with the effects of combustible cigarette consumption, and we've held the position that the ability to purchase tobacco products should be limited to those 21 years of age and older. Our desire to curtail the use of smoking uh, combustible cigarettes is what drives our opposition to this measure, which would preclude the sale of flavored uh, electronic nicotine delivery systems, which many of you know as e-cigarettes. 
we, we believe that abstinence is not a viable harm reduction strategy for mitigating the perils of combustible tobacco consumption and that uh, e-cigarettes are a far more, uh, far more effective and, and drastically less harmful method um, for, for obtaining nicotine. And, and it specifically, uh, we, we think that, uh, as, as has been shared by others um, on the committee, that uh, other speakers with the committee, that uh, you know, there's a continuum of, of uh, risk and, and the spectrum um, tends to have cigarettes is at the, the highest end of, of the range, and then uh, electronic cigarettes or vapes are at the, the lowest end. And so this is something that's shared by the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, uh, the FDA, Royal College of Physicians, Public Health England. And, and so there are a lot of folks that, that have this p position, um, and it's because there's a drastically lower risk profile for e-cigarettes which makes them the ideal option for individuals who want a safer alternative when they're attempting to quit. Uh, we've also seen studies that show that e-cigarettes are more effective at curtailing smoking than other prevention tools like nicotine patch and gum, and they're leading to a greater reduction in smoking than in previous years. Um, therefore, we think that adult smokers should continue to have a diverse market of products that deliver uh, nicotine without the harms of combustion, and um, as, as y'all uh, consider this, this important matter, um, we, we encourage you to deliberate on some of the points that we've raised today. And, uh, you know, we, we think it's a lofty goal to go and end combat combustible tobacco use, but uh, we think that this bill really has some real potential to undermine um, efforts to discourage cigarette consumption. And for, for those reasons, we ask you to oppose the measure as drafted. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Seeing no questions or comments, we will move on to the next person on our list, which is Miles Hall. Uh, Miles Hall, you're on. Please uh, unmute yourself and turn your uh, can, camera. Can you hear me? We can, but we don't get to see you. So if you may want Sorry, to- this is, this, I've been, this is my first Zoom experience. Hold on a second. No, no worries. Welcome. Hi. Sorry, I'm just- uh, was in the middle of getting dressed for this. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm here because uh, Kathy Flaherty, who's the on SB 898, Kathy Flaherty, who's the uh, director of CLRP, called me to let me know this was happening. So I'm a little bit underprepared. Uh, I want to have a discussion uh, about the specifically the extension of 45 days to 90 days. Um, and I'm a little bit confused. I thought this whole hearing was just about the bill, but apparently it's all the bills up, or is that just me? Can someone clarify that? This is for various bills, but you can okay. speak on the bill that you're here for. Okay, great. Okay, so let me keep it brief. Um, my own experience, I I, uh, I was uh, professionally back from 2015 to 2017, I worked for two of the leading peer run um, agencies in the state of Connecticut. I was a community bridger for Focus on Recovery and United out of Middletown. And then I was a community bridger for uh, AFC Unlimited out of New Britain. And uh, professionally, I've, I've seen kind of both the ins and outs of the mental health care system in Connecticut. Um, but I want to talk from a personal level and, and that's my experience for the last 20 years is being someone who receives mental health services and someone who has a mental health disability um, and what it's like to be treated like a second-class citizen in this country, uh, specifically Connecticut. Um, uh, from my own experience, I first got diagnosed 20 years ago when I was a junior at Yale. Um, and Within Connecticut, I have spent time in Bridgeport County Jail Psych Ward. I've spent plenty of time at Yale New Haven Hospital. I've been to uh, Silver Hill Institute of Living, Garner Correctional, Whiting, you name it. Like I've I've seen your guys' system. I'm in Vermont right now. Um, it's a disaster. Uh, but what I will say and when I talked to Jack Keyes, who's a retired probate judge from New Haven yesterday, 
he agrees like physicians should not have a say in someone getting a treated against their will that's not within um that's not within reasonable professional accommodations and at this point in my career uh the doctors i'm dealing with are younger than me meaning that i've had more experience in the mental health field than they have and the thought that their opinions could override my personal wishes is terrifying so that's all i'll say i'd love to answer some questions if you have any uh, i know we're short on time but my main question is you know what is the driving force behind this bill i'm i'm assuming senator you sponsor it you're a physician and but you're not a psychiatrist and i just want to know why and sort of and there's so many more pressing issues facing connecticut and this country why even give a shit to use the language about extending ect Thank you so much. I think you're testifying. I'm not. So I think your time is up. There's no question, no comments. So thank you so much for your testimony. You're welcome. Uh, next person on the list is Lindsay Stroud. Um, please go ahead. Yes. Hello. You can hear me and see me. Yes, we can. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, fantastic. Um, chairs, members of the committee, thank you for your time today. My name is Lindsay Stroud. I'm director of the Consumer Center at the Taxpayers Protection Alliance, as well as a visiting fellow with the Independent Women's Forum. And I'm speaking in regards to the proposed flavor ban. I did submit some extensive written testimony, and I'm just going to kind of go over that. Um, so like many other states, lawmakers have spent the past several years in Connecticut trying to ban flavored tobacco and vapor products. And this has all been in response to a supposed youth vaping epidemic. And I'm just going to go through some of those numbers. According to the National Youth Tobacco Survey, youth vaping peaked in 2019 when one in five U.S. middle and high school students were currently using e-cigarettes. Between then and 2022, youth vaping has halved, declining by over 50%. And in 2022, only 9.4% of youth were currently using e-cigarettes. Traditional tobacco use is also at record lows. Less than 2% of youth reported current use of cigars, cigarettes, or smokeless tobacco in 2022. Instead of banning flavors, lawmakers should focus on why youths are using these products. Contrary to what the American Lung Association just said, according to the 2021 National Youth Tobacco Survey, among youth that were currently using e-cigarettes, nearly half or 43.4% reported using them because they were feeling, quote, anxious, stressed, or depressed. Only 13.2% cited using e-cigarettes because of flavors. This data indicates that youth are using e-cigarettes to self-medicate. And while lawmakers have turned their attention towards flavored vapes and cigarettes, youth vaping has declined, yet youth are dying from overdoses, and that's increased. Just last year, less than two miles away from the state capitol in Connecticut, a 13-year-old died in school, and they found 40 bags of fentanyl with him. In fact, between 2015 and 2022, over 500 Connecticut residents aged 14 to 24 years old died from a drug overdose. According to data released in uh, December from the CDC, drug overdose deaths among youth aged 14 to 18 years old increased by 94% between 2019 and 2021. Meanwhile, youth vaping has decreased during the same period by 62%. The overdose epidemic has been caused by a massive market of illicit counterfeit pills. Banning flavored tobacco and vapor products will only cause another illicit market of those products. And we've already seen the issues of illicit vaping products from Evali in 2019 to there have been cases of fentanyl. And finally, if Connecticut really wants to address youth use of tobacco products and help adults quit, I would suggest that the state spend more of the existing tobacco monies towards tobacco control programs. Between 2016 and 2022, the state allocated $0 each year to such programs, yet it received over $2 billion in cigarette taxes and uh, master settlement tobacco uh, payments. In 2023, the state will spend $13.6 million in state funding towards tobacco control programs, which is actually $2.6 million less than what the state received in the 2022 settlement with e-cigarette manufacturer Juul. Again, bans are ineffective, create you know, more issues, and they should be avoided. Um, thank you for your time today. Thank you so much for your testimony. I think we have a comment or a question from my co-chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Ms. Stroud, for taking the time to be with us today. There are a number of folks here today who, like you, are with the Taxpayers Protection Alliance. Can you tell me a little bit about that organization, please? Yes, we're um, a nonprofit 501c3 that's just dedicated to um, informing and disseminating uh, data for the policymakers. Um, 
uh, the consumer uh, centers where I'm the director of, um, we focus on adult access to uh, age restricted goods, um, including tobacco, cannabis, alcohol. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. And I appreciate your concern about the opioid epidemic, one which is shared, epidemic, one which is shared by every member of this committee. And I know we will be hearing that. Um, I thank you for your comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Seeing no other questions or comments, we move on to the next person on our list, which is Mr. Edgar Dominic. Mr. Dominic, thank you for your patience. Welcome. Good morning, and thank you. Uh, uh, good morning to the, uh, the Committee on Public Health. I'm speaking on behalf of Bill uh, 6488. Uh, the concerns I have are from my uh, perspective of 30 years of law enforcement. Uh, or that the, the bill being considered without uh, one important stakeholder, and that's your uh, law enforcement community. Addressing the health concerns are valid, and I don't think anybody would argue those points. But in this area, law enforcement needs a voice to ensure implementation doesn't create an enormous revenue stream from the organized crime route. In 2015, under President Obama, the U.S. State Department issued a report that stated illicit tobacco was a national security threat. Presently, there is no federal agency that has a unified, comprehensive strategy to combat illicit tobacco activity, leaving it to state and local law enforcement to combat the significant threat. As the former sheriff of New York City, I have seen firsthand the challenges when there is no unified strategy. This proposal without law enforcement will only exasperate the situation as it relates to the underground economy and the illicit tobacco market. The proposal will create a perfect storm for organized crime groups to further entrench themselves in the illicit tobacco industry. While the regulated industry, that being your legal store owners, will comply with the new re regulations and won't sell the products. But the reality is, is that the organized crime groups and the criminal element will saturate the market with illegitimate and unregulated tobacco products. I would just ask on behalf of my brothers and sisters in law enforcement that will be asked to enforce this regulation that you include them in dialogue and conversation moving forward so that you can understand from their perspective the implications and the obstacles and challenges they will face in enacting any type of tobacco ban. Thank you for your time and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. I have a quick question. Uh, sir, uh, where are you based out of? Which state are you? Uh, I'm currently, well, I'm a resident of uh, Connecticut, uh, but I'm actually a, a snowbird. I'm down in Jupiter, Florida right now. Okay, and uh, which uh, 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 law enforcement uh, agency are you speaking on behalf of? I'm a retired law enforcement agency. I was a I was a deputy director with ATF for 26 and a half years, and I was the uh, New York City Sheriff appointed by Mayor Bloomberg from 2011 to 2014, and I retired from that position in 2014. And um, and then is there anybody who you who has asked you to testify for this? I have I have advocated on this behalf on, for RJR. I have written uh, for the National Sheriffs Association on this matter. Uh, so, uh, but RJR has in fact paid me on a, on occasion to give you my policy position. Uh, what is RJR? I'm sorry, Reynolds, uh, the cigarette, the tobacco industry. Oh, the, okay. Thank you so much. Just one. You're very to... welcome. Okay. Thank you so much for your testimony. Seeing no other questions. Oh, there is one more comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dominic. And I think um, I will just take a minute to remind housekeeping that for those who are in next to please accept your promotion into our waiting room. But Mr. Dominic, um, I think one of the challenges we're facing as we're in a new hybrid world where we have a lot more people back in the building and when folks are in the building here in Connecticut, as you know, um, people who are registered lobbyists wear identification so that we can see that. So I would just share that with you as we're asking folks who are on Zoom. Um, that's one of the things I think when I did the remote meeting bill as the planning and development chair, I talked about this. I think that's one of the things we're gonna be living into to try and understand. So I think you're not the only one that we've been asking that question of. 
And I just wanted to also thank you for your comments about working together with law enforcement. And over the years, having worked on uh, tobacco issues, I can assure you that we will continue to talk with law enforcement. I've had occasion to talk with some of your colleagues in the past, and we will continue to do so. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And uh, we have Representative Reddington Hughes, who uh, has a question or comment. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, uh, my question has to do with uh, the enforcement as it is today. Um, you know, we were talking about illicit tobacco, but uh, the age for people to be able to buy tobacco is 21 in the state of Connecticut. Do you have any statistics on how many uh, people are ever turned in for uh, selling tobacco to underage children, whether it's in a gas station or a supermarket or liquor store, wherever? If, if, if that question was directed to me, uh, no, ma'am, I don't have any statistics as it relates to Connecticut. What I can convey to you is when I was a sheriff in New York City, and the sheriff's department was responsible for the inspection of every licensed premise that sold tobacco. Over 50% of the tobacco being sold by the stores was actually counterfeit tobacco product. So it's unknown as to who they were selling that tobacco product to, and if they were even validating the age requirements as it's required in uh, under New York City law at the time. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Seeing no other comments or questions, we are going to move to our next speaker, which is uh, number 27, Kevin O'Flaherty. Mr. O'Flaherty, please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Uh, you, you're very soft in your voice. I think if you would come closer to your mic, that would be good. And you muted yourself. There, go ahead. Hold on a second. I think I need to change the microphone. Is this any better? Um, not as good as it could be. So if you can be a little louder. Yes, I will. I'll try to yell. My wife's not home, so she won't think anything's wrong. Uh, I apologize for that snafu. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Kevin O'Flaherty. I'm here today on behalf of the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids. We strongly oppose the passage of House Bill 6488 as written because it exempts menthol flavored tobacco products, including both menthol e-cigarettes and menthol cigarettes, which have tremendous appeal to Connecticut youth. We know that all flavors hook kids by improving the taste and reducing the harshness of tobacco products, making them more appealing and easier for beginners to try and ultimately become addicted to. We also know that menthol is especially effective at doing this as it cools and numbs the throat, reducing the harshness. Although it has been used historically in combustible cigarettes, cigars, and smokeless, menthol is now one of the most popular e-cigarette flavors as well as being the cigarette flavor that 41% of high school smokers use. For these reasons, we oppose this bill. Um, time and time again, when the government or industry has acted to partially address flavored tobacco products by removing some from the market, kids have responded by migrating to whatever flavored products are left. In 2009, when candy, fruit, and alcohol-flavored combustible cigarettes were banned by Congress, kids flocked similarly to similarly flavored little cigars, which are just like cigarettes but were not covered by the law. In 2018, when Juul removed its fruit and dessert flavored products from the market, mint and menthol quickly became their best sellers among youth. This trend was exacerbated when the FDA banned fruit and candy flavored pod devices as well, and kids just either doubled down on their use of menthol flavored pod products or they switched entirely to non-pod systems. When you leave a flavored tobacco product on the market while getting rid of others, you might as well put up a billboard in every convenience store that says, kids, this is for you. And while that's true of any flavor, menthol is likely the most egregious flavor to think about exempting from this policy. First, due to the partial policies of the last few years, it is already the single most popular vape flavor among youth. The ostensible purpose of this bill is to protect kids from flavored tobacco, but you would propose to exempt the, exempt the one flavor kids use more than any other? No wonder the industry would call it a compromise. Secondly, menthol is the tobacco flavor responsible for more addiction and more death than any other flavored tobacco product ever. It is, in a way, the granddaddy of all tobacco flavors, and it is also the reason why black smokers die at higher rates from smoking than white smokers, even though they smoke fewer cigarettes and want to quit at higher rates. The exemption for menthol flavored tobacco products in this bill dramatically negates the purpose of the legislation, 
which is to protect kids from addiction and hopefully save lives. We strongly encourage the Joint Committee on Public Health and the legislature to revise HB 6488 to prohibit the sale of all flavored tobacco products, including menthol. Otherwise, you should vote no on the bill as it would do as much to preserve the industry's ability to target kids as it would to prevent it. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for your testimony. If, if I heard you well, I just want to repeat uh, one sentence and you can say yes or no. What you're saying is you're opposed to this bill because it is not going far enough to include menthol. That is right. Okay, good. And then you have your written testimony as well. I do, and it's much broader than this, and I will uh, submit that to the committee. Okay, and I have my co-chair who has a question or comment. Thank you very much, Mr. O'Flaherty, for being here with us and uh, for your advocacy. One of the challenges with this legislation is the idea, as we've been hearing during the course of the conversation, of harm reduction for those who started smoking or using nicotine and have become addicted and trying to move into a different place versus trying to prevent young people from beginning in the first place. There are arguments that have been and are will be made about that uh, role of harm reduction for um, electronic nicotine delivery systems. And can you comment on kind of the weighing between, I know your role is tobacco-free kids, so we're, we're pretty clear about that, but just can you comment on the balance between those two objectives? Yeah, and thank you so much for the question, Chair. Uh, you know, we support cessation initiatives too. We've been around for more than 25 years and we, 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 we've supported tax increases because those help adults quit and prevent kids from ever starting and, and make them quit as well. We support funding for cessation programs. Trust me, as much as uh, prevention is a big part of what we do, cessation is a big part as well. But when you look at public health, and I, and I know you know it probably even better than I as the, the chair of this committee, you know, you don't want to just save people after they've fallen in the river. You know, this is a popular analogy in public health. It's better to stop people from falling in the river to begin with. Um, and, and to a certain extent, uh, e-cigarettes and, and harm reduction are, are pulling people out of the river after they've already become addicted to this product. Now, we certainly shouldn't stop doing that, but we should also do everything we can to prevent kids from ever becoming addicted to these products. Um, the FDA has acknowledged that. They, they, this is a very long process they're going through with the PMTA uh, uh, process. They are finally starting to rule on menthol flavored e-cigarettes, and they are saying that the evidence that shows that these products appeal to kids outweighs whatever evidence may exist that might help adults quit. Also, the, the, the vaunted UK study that they continue to refer to um, they, they don't point out, number one, that in the UK, uh, nicotine levels are capped at uh, roughly 40% or 30% or of the common products in the US uh, at, at, at 20 milligrams per milliliter. 5% uh, here is, is two and a half times that, and you can get products that are higher than that, so they're far more addictive. Um, it's also part of a different system there where, where they are sometimes prescribed even, and used by medical providers uh, to try to encourage people to quit. And the big thing that they don't like to tell you is the big study that showed that e-cigarettes were more effective at helping people quit than, than cessation and NRT. The, the products that they gave those participants were not flavored. They were just tobacco flavored. Um, so we're fully supportive. Nobody's here saying that we should ban tobacco flavored e-cigarettes because those especially if they're reasonably marketed, uh, could, can certainly help people transition from cigarettes to a, a less harmful, probably still harmful, but a, certainly a less harmful tobacco product. But the flavors are hooking kids. And to leave those on the market, to leave menthol uh, e-cigarettes on the market or any flavors on the market is, is doing a disservice to our kids and to public health. Thank you, Mr. O'Flaherty. I think in this committee and in this legislature, we make decisions all the time when it comes to prevention, intervention, treatment, and where the balance is. And I think we're clear from you, you err, err on the side of prevention in the first place. I think that's the ideal for all of us, but we will continue to have that conversation here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the Representative Foster. Thank you for being here um, and hearing the testimony 
today. And I appreciate the time that you took last year to talk to me um, after your testimony and give additional comments. Um, I uh, I'm curious about um, your organizational's professional perception about other strategies that have been elucidated in the scientific evidence that might result in a reduction in access to kids and adults to tobacco products and might need to make the decision to purchase products more restricted, more regulatable, less likely to be um, in the hands of minors. What do you think about other tools like um, proposals that would be a curtain, um, so blocking access of both men, both ends and combustibles to 21 plus venues or 21 plus sections of stores so that um, both children would have decreased access? They wouldn't be targeted by the marketing that makes flavors so problematic. We know we are already regulating marketing in advertisements, but they wouldn't have the contact of seeing those products looking like candy at stores if it was behind a curtain. What do you think about policy proposals um, that would have a similar goal and intention of reducing access to young people, um, but might not have the unintended consequence of causing those already addicted to switch to combustibles? Well, I appreciate the, um, the, the question, Representative Foster, and I'm happy to talk with you or any other member of the committee at any time, as, as I think you know. Um, you know, can you speak up a little bit, yeah, Kevin? I'm so sorry. I'm going to try to face my computer here. Is this any better? Uh, yes. Better? Use your outside voice, as my co-chair okay. says. All right. All right. I'll, I'll. I'll. I'm not angry. So if I sound like I'm yelling, I'm definitely not. Um, so uh, uh, that certainly sounds like a good idea. But but one of the things that um, the industry itself talks about whenever we've talked about raising the age of sale on tobacco products or pretty much any um, sales restriction is they like to talk about the fact that they're not selling these products to kids. The majority of retailers aren't selling them to kids, uh, that they're very responsible and they do all these things. They'll tell you that the problem is social sources, uh, adults, parents, friends, uncles and aunts that buy these products and give them to, to kids. Uh, whether there's a financial uh, incentive in that transaction or whether they're just doing it out of the, you know, just, just because they want to give it to them, that they, that's what they're doing. And that would continue to happen uh, if you allow these products to be sold in 21 and over stores. Um, the, the, these products, if you look at the industry documents, they were designed to hook kids. They came up with flavors as a way to get kids. So to expect this product to exist in the marketplace and not find its way into ha the hands of kids, uh, regardless of these, these protections you put up in terms of age of sale, uh, you know, is, is, you know, perhaps a, a little optimistic. Um, another thing is that there are studies out there that show, and, and this, this actually sort of confound, I, I was confounded by this. I did not think it would be true because you would think that if you are an adult-only, tobacco-only facility, um, that, that you would take extreme cautions to make sure that everybody in your store was over than 21, older than 21. But there are studies out that have shown that those retailers actually are worse than convenience stores and other retailers in terms of enforcing youth access law and compliance with over 21. So the, the, the natural thought that you have there, Representative, that, that those stores would be better at keeping these products away from kids um, you know, is not borne out by, by the research. And then, and then um, lastly, uh, you know, putting a curtain in a store to separate these products or putting behind the shelves uh, would be even less effective and, and just because kids can't see the marketing, one of the major ways that retailers get compensated for selling tobacco products still is they get paid to put up advertising outside the stores for the products they're selling. And the kids see that as well. And I think we'd run into trouble trying to regulate that uh, because of First Amendment concerns as well. So I, I, I'm happy to talk more with you about these things. I know some of these ideas seem like they would be helpful, uh, but in fact, they would either do nothing or, or perhaps perpetuate the problem. I appreciate your response. I think that um, 
that there's some emerging data that these techniques work. They have actually worked in reducing alcohol access with youth and minors. Um, and so these aren't without precedent in the research in the scientific community. You are correct about social um, social networks being a primary procurement um, strat, uh, venue, but it is not exclusively the only venue. And those social sources are acquired at one place prior to that. Um, Excuse me, Representative Foster, but time is up. If you could just summarize. Certainly. Um, and I, and so as I was going to say, those are getting purchased at some place and those seem to be predominantly from areas um, in which restriction to sales is more challenging. And so something that I've been a long proponent of in the last two in some months, year, uh, two years and some months is that we also significantly increase the penalties to those found guilty of um, distributing these products to minors. And if they had repeat offenses, remove their ability to sell tobacco products. Um, because I am certainly not in, um, in any way interested in seeing tobacco sales to youth being something that is protected, allowed, permissible, um, or made easier in any way, shape, or form. But I certainly think that there are ways that we can avoid unintended consequences while protecting youth who are already smoking and those who are children of smokers and are at risk of exposure to secondhand smoke. So I appreciate the time. Sorry, Kathleen. I think uh, we are out of time for, um... The response uh, if it's okay um what we will do is we'll move on to the next person on our list thank you so much uh mr o'flaherty um i just wanted to remind people um you are if you are in the attendee list you're going to get an invite to be promoted to the panelist list or to be able to testify and it's very important that you accept that otherwise you will continue to wait there and i i know number 29 has been asked to come up and you're not up there yet so we need you to accept the invite meanwhile we'll have uh, number 28 christopher duby mr duby Um, Mr. Doobie, you may want to turn your camera on and unmute yourself. Oh, okay. Good afternoon um, to Senator Anwar, um, Representative McCarthy Vahey, and your the members of on, the- on. Sorry. Can you turn your camera on too, please? We would like everybody who is going to testify to keep the camera on. In a, another meeting at one point, it was same person with different names who was testifying. We just want to see the people too. Okay, is it working now? Love it, thank you. Okay, great. So um, I'm testifying on SB 898 regarding ECT. Um, I'm originally from Middletown, but I've been living in Newington for more than 10 years. Um, and I'm, I'm much more articulate in writing than I am uh, verbally. Um, and I submitted uh, six pages of written testimony with extensive uh, references using hyperlinks. Um, but I'll just I'll summarize um, some of the main points from my testimony. Um, I'm 39 years old. I'm disabled. Um, in 2005, I was 22, and I had just graduated from college, and um, I became suicidal, and I was forced to have ECT at Hartford Hospital's Institute of Living, and it was a very traumatic experience for me. And um, after that experience, I got to connect with a whole lot of other people with similar experiences through the internet, um, including Sarah Hancock and Professor John Reed, who previously testified. And I've also um, read quite a lot uh, of, of um, literature and um, articles. Um, so what my experience, um, in 2005, when I was 22, it, the, my suicide attempts happened a few months after I had withdrawn from an antidepressant called Paxil. And at that time, there wasn't that much information at, out there about, um, the risks of the suicide risks of antidepressants, especially for 
children, um, adolescents, and young adults, and also the risks of um, withdrawal syndromes. And I had abruptly withdrawn from that medication. And um, today, I am I firmly believe that that was um, the main reason that I became suicidal, although there were other factors, um, such as um, some physical health issues that I had and uh, some history of some traumas and some verbal abuse from um, people close to me. And those things were not addressed by um, the doctors or psychologists at the Institute of Living um, before they decided to go and get a court order to force me to have ECT. And I also want to add that I was not catatonic, catatonic or psychotic at the time. I, I had injured myself, but I was fully lucid and verbal, and I was able to express my opinion very well. And um, the, the forced ECT was still, grant. the order was still granted by the probate court. Um, Excuse me, Mr. Doobie, but your time is complete. Thank okay, you. thank you. I'm just going to ask you a question, if you could, uh, as my question to you, can you finish your testimony, please? Yes, thank you. So I, I wanted to add, um, I really hope that um, the members of the committee will read my written testimony. It's very detailed. Um, I, I've gotten to learn about the experiences of a lot of other people like me whose experiences don't get discussed very much in um, medical literature. Um, because, and a lot of doctors just aren't very much aware of them. Um, I also want to add there, there are several lawsuits ongoing uh, regarding ECT in Canada, the UK and the US. Um, there's in California, there is a law firm that is involved in most of the lawsuits. This law firm, Wisner Baum, it has also made lawsuits regarding, um, the weed killer uh, roundup and they've won billions of dollars in damages and one of the expert witnesses for the lawsuits is Dr. Bennett Omalu who is a neuropathologist who is famous for discovering chronic traumatic encephalopathy and contrary to a lot of the ECT research literature he says that ECT causes brain damage and brain injury and he has testified He's testifying that way in court depositions. And I've also, I've linked to his expert report along with ex some other expert reports um, in my written testimony. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I want to thank you for your courage to come forward and share your personal perspective uh, and, and also your experience. And um, it takes a lot of courage and I want to thank you for your testimony. Thank and, you. Uh, there is a question from Senator Summers. Yes, good afternoon. Are you still there? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for sharing your testimony. And um, I'm very sorry that you had to experience what you did. I, I wonder if you could share a little bit more about um, the order that the judge had given um, for ECT. Was it for a period of time? Did you have a series of treatments? Or uh, did you have to go back and have a repeated uh, visit with a probate judge to continue the treatment? And secondly, I don't see your testimony loaded. Um, and I just was wondering when you submitted your testimony because I would really like to read it. Thank you. Um, so I, I submitted it uh, last night and then I tried to submit it again uh, this morning. And yeah, I, I've heard that um, there was a problem with scanning. Somebody told me there was a problem with scanning. Um, okay, so hope I get a hold of you. So if we can't, if we don't see it in the next couple of days, we'll reach out so we can read it. I want to make sure that we we have your testimony. Okay, I'm in touch with um, Kathy Flaherty of the Connecticut Legal Rights Project. Um, regarding my ECT, um, I believe the order was granted for 30 days. I think or. It could have been 45 days. I, I can't remember exactly. It was something like that. And it was, I had uh, 16 treatments according to my memory. Um, I don't I don't remember how often it was, but it was 16 treatments. Um, and I, I actually, I, it, I was honest with the staff about how I hated the treatments and they kept doing that because they interpreted my um, response as part of uh, mental illness. And um, so I, I actually started lying to um, to make them stop. I, I lied about how I, I was affected. 
Thank you for that information. And thank you for sharing your story today. It's, it's important for us to hear it. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other comments or questions, we will move on to our next uh, person on our list, which is uh, uh, Ron Bailey from Bailey Psychiatric Associates. Mr. Bailey. Yes, um, and uh, good morning, good afternoon. I'm uh, Ron Kennedy Bailey, uh, currently a psychiatrist. I want to thank you for the opportunity really to speak to you today uh, about this very important issue. Uh, I'll begin by saying kind of off the cuff, I you know, my heart goes out to uh, all those with their personal stories, personal comments. These issues are very relevant. I realize how complex it is, I think, for legislators as well. Uh, my comments certainly uh, acknowledge that difficulty, but hopefully point out, I think, a key issue that myself as a forensic psychiatrist, I really had to struggle with uh, throughout the entirety of my career. Uh, and those really what my, my comments, I think, lie. Uh, again, I'm, I'm a clinical and forensic psychiatrist. So my prepared to be provided. I'm also a past president of the National Medical Association. Uh, we remain the largest and oldest national organization representing African-American physicians in the country. I uh, just finished a four-year term as chairman of the board of trustees of the National Medical Association's Research Institute, the COB. Uh, our particular focus these last, I've been on board nine years, been a focus on lessening racial and health, health and ethnic healthcare disparities. Uh, so I have been asked by uh, R.J. Reynolds really to really share my experience as a forensic psychiatrist uh, working in the community on issues really raised by these proposed bans of flavored tobacco products. Uh, that includes the effects that uh, this ban will have on, on, on this particular community, on the African community. I present these facts uh, as I point out really not to endorse smoking cigarettes or use of any toxic substances, alcohol or otherwise. In fact, in my career, I've destroyed smoking all my patients and they can treat people to stop smoking. But I present the fact that it just cleared up misperceptions that I think it further lead to more danger, so-called unintended consequences of uh, that physical illnesses can be caused, I think, by uh, these toxic substances. I'll point out that um, really adult use smoking, the numbers show have been uh, declining, I think, um, in all races, including the black population. And that happens because of education. That's what I'm a proponent of. Good quality education, uh, investment, I think, in programs uh, for mental health treatment, uh, preventative, I think, are really the, the way to go. And that's what I think I, I certainly want to encourage. It can certainly help in assisting patients to quitting smoking. That's what I would be able to do, I think, in my career. That's what I'm a proponent of. I find other options to, to combustible cigarettes can also be important in that process of successful smoking cessation, a decline, let alone move to full abstinence. Uh, this concept of harm reduction makes sense. I think it's uh, the key term and the key theme for really all the things we do. I think in all of our uh, active psychiatric medicine, truly patients who have uh, issues regarding SUD, substance use disorders, or uh, proverbial addiction. I think that when you eliminate flavor from tobacco products, including e-cigarettes, there's also an important option being, being taken off the table. Look at the groups of African-American smokers that very often prefer flavored products. I also that as a doctor, I've looked at my whole career to lessening disparities in the AA community. And I've seen firsthand how very often good intentions initially can have unintended consequences. A popular term we use now, we see that in, in so many regards because very often uh, one strategy leads to think a reflex concern that could very automatically for certain groups even when the initial strategy is well-intentioned. We think often bans uh, don't change all consumer habits. Uh, they hope that they'll change some. But very often what they tend to change is how products are obtained. And at least it is fear that you may cause danger to a consumer and a community uh, that not, may not serve a long-term public health type interest. I also point out that illicit cigarettes can only make up this huge component of the market. I heard stories, I think in other settings, about a, a local uh, 7-Elevens or convenience stores and they lose tax revenue. And that kind of starts a chain reaction that very often has adverse implications in many communities. So if you ban flavored electronic cigarettes from the market, it may actually add to more illicit sales of tobacco products. Uh, we know that in Massachusetts, for example, they banned menthol cigarettes in 2020, and so sales go to other states, including Connecticut. Those bans may not reduce for the demand, but then we often see very often behaviorally this shift in where uh, the uh, current concerns, I think, occur and where people actually obtain those issues. My final and most important point is the great danger really lies in enforcement. And that's something where the African community has really suffered a huge brunt. Excuse me, Dr. Brunt. Bailey, but your time is yeah. complete. Thank you so yeah. much. I just have a quick question. Um, Dr. Bailey, where are you based out of, sir? Um, I'm based out of Houston initially. Uh, right now, I actually uh, live and work in, in New Orleans. Uh, the National Medical Association is in, based in D.C. I've done a lot of work for them over the last decade. So uh, you, you're... Physically right now in Houston or Texas or Houston, Texas or no, DC. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, probably, I'm physically calling you from a New Orleans, Louisiana today. New Orleans. Okay. And, right. and why are you testifying in Connecticut? Just out of curiosity. 
Uh, I, I'm a, a, a psychiatrist, been very involved in the National Medical Association, and uh, we've been contacted by a variety of groups addressing these issues. I think the big issue is the idea of unintended consequences. I want to share my thoughts and concerns, uh, but you, you're right, I don't live in Connecticut currently, but I've shared these ideas in, in places across the country, representing the National Medical Association. Sure. And 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 Dr. Bailey, your, your website says that you're a consultant. Didn't somebody ask you to consult uh, on this issue? Yes, yeah. I mentioned you know, I, 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 I'm involved in, in, in settings. In fact, the, the company RJ Reynolds uh, has been um, aware of some of my work and what we did on the NMA, especially through the COB, and uh, they've asked us to share those thoughts with you today. Thank you, sir. Well, what is RJR? I'm sorry. Can you repeat it? I, I know somebody did mention that earlier. Oh, uh, Reynolds. R okay. That's a tobacco company? Tobacco, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. I just wanted to clarify, sir. Thank you so much for your testimony. Truly appreciate your time. Seeing Thanks. all the questions or comments, we'll move on to the next person, that is uh, Nicole Pequette. Nicole. Good afternoon, Senator Anwar, Representative McCarthy Behe, Senator Kushner, Senator Marks, Representative Parker, Senator Summers, Representative Claridis Dietria, and the distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Nicole Paquette. I am a licensed funeral director and bomber and the legislative chair of the Connecticut Funeral Directors Association, CFDA. We are one of the oldest and nationally recognized associations of funeral homes with over 220 member firms. Thank you for raising House Bill 5246, an act allowing for the disposal of dead human bodies through natural organic reduction. CFDA submits this testimony in support of this bill, provided it is supplemented with much needed regulations as it concerns composting dead human remains as a new type of disposition. Human composting was first performed in Seattle, Washington in December of 2020. During the past two years, the process has become legal in five additional states, just recently New York. The process includes placement of unembalmed remains in a vessel with organic matter to speed decomposition, resulting in a soil or a mulch, of about one cubic yard. C CFDA member firms strive to provide a range of funeral service options to our client families, particularly as their needs evolve. Regarding natural organic reduction, we seek well thought out regulations to protect the dignity and respect of the decedent, the health and safety of those charged with the care and handling of the decedent, our client families and the general public. Some regulatory recommendations include that a facility which performs natural organic reduction be licensed as such, subject to annual renewals and inspections by the Department of Public Health. Cemeteries, crematories, and funeral homes should be allowed as entities that may own and operate such a facility, and their, their staff should be trained and certified. We understand that the functioning natural organic reduction facilities in Washington State are operated by funeral homes and that the governor of New York has moved to include funeral homes in their new legislation that passed recently. An inquiry into the death should be conducted by the office of the chief medical examiner. And this is similar to the process when human remains are to be cremated. We defer to the Department of Public Health for the suitability of composting the human remains of those with a reportable disease found on the annual list of the state epidemiologist. Much needed regulatory and language provisions would enhance this bill to be more appropriate for Connecticut and in line with existing statutes, including disposition. CFDA has requested to work with the Environment Committee regarding House Bill 6485, an act concerning natural organic reduction and green burials. And we respectfully request the same with the Public Health Committee as you continue to draft this legislation. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I make myself available to your questions and your comments. Thank you so much. My co-chair has a question or a comment. Thank you so much for being here with us today and for your comments, um, Ms. Paquette. And I thank you also for referencing the Environment Committee Bill, which is something I was going to do in my comments. Sometimes we travel down parallel pathways in our committees. And as we raise bills, um, just recognize that we also don't like to duplicate efforts. So I, I know uh, my co-chair and I will be in discussion with the Environment Committee as well. 
uh, so that we're all working together and can make sure that we all get in one vehicle together going forward. Thank you. Th thank you very much. And seeing no other questions or comments, we will move on to the next person on our list, which I believe is uh, um, Mark Krawczyk. I don't see them up here. Mr. Krawczyk, is, are you in this room? No, moving on to number 32, Gobinda Shrestha. And well, I see Dr. Vitali here. So Julia, come on over. Welcome. Thank you for your patience. And sorry about your patience today that they had to miss seeing you. Turn the mic on. Perfect. Good afternoon. My name is Julia Vitali. I reside in Coventry and I am a family medicine physician in Manchester. I oppose SB number 899, an act concerning title protection for physicians. I graduated from Eastern Connecticut Health Network's family medicine per res residency program in 2017. I was trained by many physicians, including allopathic, osteopathic, and naturopathic. As a family medicine physician, I chose to work in an office side by side with naturopathic physicians, some of whom you have heard from today. As an osteopathic physician, I am aware that historically there has been a difference between the term osteopath and osteopathic physician due to the importance of the word physician. The term physician has meaning and denotes a healthcare professional who has underwent a specific training to care for patients. It says to patients, that I work in this system with you and for you. Removing physician from naturopathic doctors would take that away. Different types of physicians have different roles in medicine. The naturopathic physicians I share an office with do not prescribe medications, but they diagnose and treat patients. They refer and collaborate with PCPs and other specialists. Most importantly, they provide high quality healthcare. Every day I see how their role in our healthcare system makes patients better. My naturopathic experience is not limited to those whom I share an office with. As part of my residency program, I shadowed under three different physician practices. Currently, I have primary care patients who see naturopathic doctors around the state. I know that their role in taking care of patients is very important. I am proud of the care my office offers because I believe it raises the standards of what primary care should be for patients. My practice in Manchester has retained more clinicians from the residency program than our local hospital has. And I believe that's due to the quality of care. Physician burnout is real and primary care is struggling. I am confident my colleagues and I can thrive and practice for another 30 years because of our collaboration with naturopathic physicians. My concern is that if you remove the term physician from naturopathic doctors, patients will not know where their role is in the healthcare system. They may search out others who do not have the same level of training. I'm also concerned that this may be the first step in removing access to care. If naturopathic doctors are not viewed as physicians, insurance companies may further remove access and patients will be left without the quality of care they deserve. I'm speaking today because I believe that continuing to recognize naturopathic physicians is in the best interest of our patients. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Within third, three minutes, exactly. <laughs> um, I, I just, uh, I, how long have you been working with the group that you are in? And tell us about the model of, of how your, your work is set up with the collaboration between the different specialties. So um, I started working in August of 2017. The practice name is Collaborative Natural Health, and we're in Manchester. And the model is we have naturopathic physicians, and we have a primary care team that we are separate but collaborative. And so patients can come to our office and they can choose to see just the primary care or the naturopaths, or they can see us both. I prefer when they see us both because I know that they get a better quality of care. And um, we provide full scope family medicine from the primary care point of view and the naturopaths work more as specialists. So um, 
they see a lot of patients who have primary cares elsewhere in the community. Um, and from a family medicine point of view, I also have patients who either don't have any naturopaths at all, or they choose to have them elsewhere, depending on where they live. In this particular model, there's a very close collaboration with each other, and, and uh, you're able to see the patients from one lens and another group sees it from another lens, and, and, and you combine together for comprehensive treatment. Yes. Okay. And then for full disclosure, uh, Dr. Vitali uh, trained at, uh, uh, you did your clinical work at Manchester Hospital, where I have been teaching residents and students. And yes. So as a third year medical student, I trained under Senator Dr. Anwar and also as a resident. Okay. You want to say anything about that on the record? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Any comments or questions? And I'm don't seeing no. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Appreciate you coming here. Thank you. Okay. Next, uh, I have uh, Mr. Peter Brennan. Welcome. Hey. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Very well. Thank you. Uh, my name is Peter Brennan. I'm the executive director of the New England Convenience Store Energy Marketers Association, Nexima for short. Um, Senator Anwar, Representative Carthy Vahey. Thank you for having me and through you to the members. Um, today I'm here in opposition to House Bill 6488. Uh, I join every previous speaker on this bill and opposing the bill, although for different reasons, I think, um, than some of the speakers. Uh, we represent the convenience store industry in the nutmeg state. We also represent the transportation fuel industry and the associated uh, vendors that supply them. Um, our reach covers almost 1,700 convenience stores in your state. We employ almost 25,000 people, and we generate over $6.5 billion in annual sales, which uh, constitutes a, a significant amount of tax revenue for the state of Connecticut. Um, I testify in opposition to this bill because being from Massachusetts and currently living in Massachusetts, I can tell you that flavor bans don't work. They haven't worked throughout history. Prohibition never works. Um, humans have been consuming tobacco products for thousands of years. They will find a way if they enjoy a product to consume it. The best place for these products to be retailed is at our member stores. All of our members train their employees on the 21 plus standard. They get a photo ID when these products are purchased. You know, if you shift these products to the black market, there will be a robust black market. And you're really just uh, thinning law enforcement uh, resources and increasing the resources that uh, those that participate in the black market have at their disposal. We've seen that in Massachusetts. Massachusetts uh, produces a tobacco task force report every year. Last year, um, they identified cross order smuggling of untaxed flavored electronic nic nicotine devices, products, cigars, and menthol cigarettes as the primary challenge for enforcement. There have been several cases where there's been seizure of millions of dollars worth of product. Um, I can send you the federal court dockets on that. This is not something that is uh, is limited to, to youth um, usage and again, our retailers prevent youth usage by carting everybody that comes into the store. Uh, the black market is much more vast than that. It is um, it is something that the state will have to deal with whenever it bans a product. So because we're only talking about a, a narrow category of products in this ban, I won't get into fully the uh, case against menthol, but I will say that all of my arguments apply to that. If the committee looks at a uh, menthol ban, in addition to the current products, it's just not gonna work. It hasn't worked in Massachusetts. Those sales have shifted over the border. The winners have been New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. Um, you know, I've submitted written testimony. I'm available to take questions, but uh, really I just wanna, wanna reiterate that these are legal products. Adults enjoy them. They're relegated to 21 plus as are other legal products such as alcohol and marijuana. This is a good system that we have in place. There's no need to, 
to give the bad actors that are willing to to drive up to New Hampshire to order these products online a new avenue to generate revenue for their organizations. Thank, thank you so much for your testimony. I, one of my colleagues and my friends, Representative Linehan, has a question or a comment. Representative Linehan. Thank you very much, Senator. I appreciate uh, the time. So my question is, you had said specifically, um, quote, prohibition never works. So I'm wondering if you have data to show um, that prohibition increases use, does it decrease use? Um, you're saying it never works, as in it never stops any use, but would you agree that it does in fact decrease use? Um, what prohibition are we talking about here? Just tobacco products or any prohibition throughout history? Really, I mean, you were talking about prohibition throughout history. So I guess my question is really around just about prohibition um, throughout history. If sure. we're going to apply uh, that standard to here. Uh, Representative Linehan, I appreciate that question. I would need a little bit more time to research other products, but historically, I think you can look at uh, alcohol prohibition. Uh, was a, a famously unsuccessful in the United States. Um, I can get you any data that we have on tobacco. I know that um, if if you just track the tax stamps from Massachusetts, New Hampshire. Connecticut and Rhode Island, you'll see that any, any loss in tobacco tax stamps that was seen in Massachusetts was more than made up for in the surrounding states in just the one year period after the ban. Um, we anticipate that we're gonna get new data on that soon um, for the fiscal year 22. So I can get you that updated data as soon as I have it. And um, you know, I'm happy to look more into the question of whether any prohibition has ever uh, worked throughout history, but no, I, I don't think that anyone can point to a success story for tobacco in uh, this century in this country. And then just one follow-up question, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Please go ahead. Thank you, sir. You know, I, I mean, I, I believe that prohibition, we cannot find any data that says prohibition has ever increased use. Uh, prohibition absolutely does decrease use throughout history. Uh, it certainly doesn't end all use. Um, and, and we know that there are obviously also black markets that pop up around that. And just like you said, could go from um, cross over the border. But if all the states around um, are doing the same thing, then with Connecticut right in the middle, I think that that's very helpful. But um, you also mentioned, and I'm just, uh, because I was very interested in your testimony, and you also mentioned um, that marijuana uh, now has a good system. But marijuana, you can only purchase them in age-restricted venues and in very particular venues that are written into statute. So um, given that uh, we know that some sort of pro, excuse me, prohibition does in fact decrease usage um, and then uh, making sure that it is less accessible, um, that actually would show to decrease usage amongst uh, teens and those under the age of 21 pretty well. I think we've determined that throughout the legislature. So I just want to get this on record because I'm not saying that your argument isn't um, a fair argument. I think it definitely is, but I just wanna make sure that people understand. It's not really about whether or not prohibition works and it's not really about whether or not um, we want to ensure that children don't get their hands on something that is inherently harmful and dangerous to them as the data does show. But in fact, you represent um, the convenience stores, correct? Uh, correct, Representative. Right. So you are so so. And again, I'm not saying that this is not an important point because I believe that it is. But you are not, in fact, coming at this from a public health perspective. Instead, you're coming at this from a business perspective. Correct? Uh, no, Representative, I'm very I uh, just want to make clear for the record. I'm the executive director of the and convenience store and energy marketers association. So uh, I have no expertise in public health. Um, I have no expertise. Also, just to clarify one thing in marijuana regulation, if I said that the way marijuana is regulated is a good thing in Connecticut, that is, um, you know, I'm over my skis on that one. I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing, how Connecticut regulates marijuana. Um, my experience is in, again, Massachusetts, where 
We got off the ground with marijuana pretty early on. Um, I can tell you there's a lot of dispensaries right now and there's a flooded marketplace. I take no position on marijuana. What I would point to though, is that uh, marijuana flavors tend to be encouraged. Um, the gummies tend to be encouraged. Items that can be consumed by children tend to be encouraged in uh, both the marijuana and the alcohol industry. And again, we take no position on those products. I think adults should be free to make their own choices. I think that um, the government obviously plays a very important public safety role in uh, protecting the health of its citizens. But at some point, you know, adults over 21, um, they should be they should be free to make choices that uh, make them happy. And you know, if there's a, a public health case against certain products, then I'll defer to the scientists on that one. That's not my role. Great, thank you very much. And I just want to end by saying um, I, I play a dual role here in that um, not only am I a member of this committee, I'm also um, one of the co-chairs of the Children's Committee here in the legislature. And one of the purviews of my committee, as well as the purview of this committee, is to ensure um, the health and safety of the people um, in our state, and especially for me, for children. So I always look at this as, um, is it best for children? Or is it best for, in this case, business? And I would have to say that I think ultimately restricting the um, ability for our children to get their hands on flavors is best for children. Um, and that should come first. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time. And thank you, Mr. Thank, Chair. Thank you so yeah. much. And, I don't and Representative, if, uh, you know, I think, we're willing uh, to help keep these products out of the hands of the children. Response, uh, sorry, I don't see any questions or comments. Uh, I think she made a statement. It wasn't a question. So that's why we are we are done with the time we have. We are going to move to the next person on the list, which is uh, Nancy Alderman. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Alderman, thank you for your patience. I have to unmute. Okay. And Can you hear me? You on. Perfect. Okay. You thank you very much. Well, so I'm Nancy Alderman. I'm president of Environment and Human Health, Inc., it is a nonprofit organization of 11 physicians and public health professionals. We are in strong support of this uh, bill uh, to uh, ban flavors in e-cigarettes. So much of the, I've been listening to all the testimony and so much of it today has uh, acted as if you were banning e-cigarettes which of course you are not banning e-cigarettes. You are trying to ban the flavors in e-cigarettes, many of which are dangerous in themselves. They are harmful in themselves. Uh, not only do they attract children uh, to start smoking e-cigarettes. Um, and so I think that is important. Shopkeepers can still sell e-cigarettes and they've been very vocal today and people who want to stop smoking real cigarettes can also start or whatever, continue using e-cigarettes. But it's critically important that we get the flavors out of these cigarettes. So we are, uh, even if it is not the most perfect bill in the world, there are some who have opposed it because menthol isn't included. And I would like to say that perfection is often uh, the, the uh, enemy of uh, progress and of the good. And so we think on balance that this is a really good bill, that you have weighed all the pros and the cons. You have allowed um, the shopkeepers to continue to sell e-cigarettes, and you have allowed uh, menthol, which many people, of course, uh, feel you should have banned. But uh, again, uh, I think you have balanced it and balanced it very well. The other thing I would like to say is that Connecticut is coming to this a little late. We already have flavors banned in Massachusetts, California, New Jersey, New York, and Rhode Island. So we're not um, blazing new ground here. We're coming a little late to it. Also, by allowing flavors in Connecticut, when they are banned in the neighboring states, I'm sure makes shopkeepers happy 
because those people can come over to our state and buy flavored cigarettes. That's not a good idea. It's not good for Connecticut and it's not good for our neighbors. We need to join our neighbors and do what they have done, which is protect their children from flavored cigarettes. And it's a little bigger than this. There are a number of flavors, not all, but many, that are actually harmful, more harmful than the nicotine. And so uh, people are not aware of that and they need to be. So not all flavors are the same. Excuse me, Ms. Brennan, your time is complete. Okay. Thank, thank you so much for your uh, testimony, and um, I appreciate your advocacy on, on various things. I don't see any questions or comments, and we will... Oh, there is a question. Go ahead, Representative Wielander. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was wondering if you would be able to expand on the last point that you were just making um, about the different flavors some being more harmful than others? If, if there's any details that you can share with that, please. Well, number one, I think I, I, I saw, I read uh, that vanillin is, uh, is, is not a, a good one. Also, if you remember the whole issue with buttered uh, popcorn, flavored, buttered flavored popcorn, it was fine for people to eat it, but the, manufa the people who manufactured it got lung disease from it. Um, some of the flavors have that compound in it. And um, so, as I said, some are worse than others. Um, I'm not an expert on all of them, but some are. You can find them online. I can find them and send them to you. But all flavors are not the same. I know that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, seeing no other questions or comments, we appreciate your testimony. The next person on our list is John Martin from San Diego, San Diego State University. Um, please go ahead, Mr. Martin. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. John Martin. I'm a professor emeritus of psychology and a former professor of psychiatry at two major US universities and medical schools. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist specializing in addictions and health behavior change. I'm here today to express my concern over HB 6488, which would ban most all flavored tobacco products. As principal investigator, I've been awarded more than $4 million in federal and state research grants on smoking assessment and treatment, some of which was cited in the Surgeon General's report on nicotine addiction. I published approximately 70 scholarly articles, 20 book chapters, and two books in the areas of smoking behavior and treatment, alcohol abuse, and health behavior change. I was responsible for the largest clinical treatment program for recovering alcoholic smokers ever conducted, the findings of which were published in flagship psychology and addictions journals. My research group was among the first to address the question of compensation and smoking topography as it relates to treatment. My statement today will be addressed in greater detail in my written testimony, supported by recent studies from major scientific journals. In the meantime, from my public health perspective, I would like to make the following five points regarding this proposed law, its unintended consequences, and its potential for harming harm reduction. First, there's a growing scientific consensus that ends are substantially safer than combustible cigarettes, representing a real opportunity for tobacco harm reduction. Second, ends have proven effective in smoking cessation, outperforming nicotine replacement products by a margin of two to one. Third, flavors play an important role in motivating smokers away from combustible cigarettes to vapor products. According to data from the Population Assessment of Tobacco and Health Studies, PATH, 75% of adults who use ENDS choose flavored e-cigarettes. Fourth, eliminating, eliminating flavors from ENDS products undermines, if not removes, this effective alternative to cigarettes, thereby discouraging youth and adult smokers from using ENDS to help quit, cut down on, or to choose not to smoke. And fifth, banning flavors will ultimately reverse the strong gains made in tobacco harm reduction. The question must be asked, by banning flavors, will we be unintending, unintendingly violating the do no harm oath that physicians and by proxy healthcare providers overall adhere to? I've been compensated for my time here by RJ Reynolds, 
but my comments and concerns are my own. I hope that my presentation will help guide your decision making that's make, making on this very important public health issue. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you so much for your testimony and thank you for sharing with us who paid you for your testimony, I mean, your for the services. Um, having said that, uh, I don't see any questions or comments. We thank you for your testimony. The next individual is number 39, Patricia Farrell. Okay, let's see if I can get this. You're on, good, go ahead. Am I? Okay. Um, good morning, my name is Patricia Farrell and I'm testifying in support of Bill 898. Since 2011, my son Daniel has suffered from catatonia due to a condition called Down syndrome regressive disorder. Over the years, its effects have become increasingly severe. By the time Dan was 23, he went from being a happy and productive young man to experience near constant bouts of total dysfunction. Among other things, these entailed periods of extreme anxiety and agitation, insomnia, a refusal to eat, drink, take medication, and spontaneous acts of unprovoked aggression, including throwing objects and physically attacking caregivers. There were times he could not control his bowel or bladder, or he would go days without going at all. He went through endless failed trials of medications, hospital consults, medical procedures, and ER visits. As you can imagine, this put us in a desperate search to alleviate his suffering. In 2018, our research yielded a glimmer of hope after consulting with many doctors across the United States specializing in Down syndrome and catatonia. We were told that electroconvulsive therapy might be a viable treatment for him. We learned in fact that ECT is considered the most effective treatment for catatonia with a response rate that ranges from 80 to 100%. Indeed, that proved to be the case for our son, Dan, as we had feared losing him um, if we didn't find a treatment like this. Over the last five years, his ongoing treatments administered at an average of seven to nine days have given our son back to us. His horrid dysfunctions are now a thing of the past, provided he receives ongoing and consistently spaced treatments. I'm also happy to say he hasn't experienced any cognitive deficits and in many ways functions better than he did before the disorder took hold. In fact, many individuals who I am familiar with who have this disorder have lost years with the catatonia, not with the ECT. Dan's treatments, it's contrary to popular notions of ECT as a barbaric procedure, Dan's treatments are given under general anesthesia with a mild muscle relaxant inducing a safe and pain-free seizure of less than 60 seconds. I dropped him off this morning at nine. My husband picked him up at 10 and he's been sleeping for a few hours and he's up and he's beginning to smile. Some nights he goes to the teen center the same night he's gone. I can tell you that in cases like Danny's in which long-term maintenance is a necessity, the mandated 45-day probate approval can create additional hardship. For one thing, a court martial has to serve the probate papers. If we're unavailable at that time, on vacation or don't happen to be here, Dan's ECT can be delayed, resulting in a return of symptoms. It also takes my son away from his work program, which we're happy he can do again, adding to the days he misses due to the actual treatments and also pre-op preparations he has to do. In addition, the required coordination among the hospital court and attending individuals, individuals has at times delayed his treatment. Again, such delays can cause significant, very significant depression. Bottom line, given the fact that Dan's ECT is part of a medically approved long-term maintenance therapy, probate every 45 days negatively affects his treatment. Um, I know there's many states that do not require a court order for ECT or ECT maintenance, but at the least, I would hope that we are able to extend um, the amount of time between. Thank you for your consideration. If there's anyone who has any questions, I can answer. I pre and post pictures of Dan um, before ECT and after and notebooks full of other information to share. Thank you so much for your testimony. Actually, I have had the opportunity to see his videos before and after the ECT. Now, um, many of the people who have spoken earlier, they feel that ECT did not work for them 
but there are some patients it is working. If you're not promoting ECT, the question is for the ones it works for, uh, it, we are trying to make sure that in those difficult circumstances with the social and, and health conditions that the challenges that the families have, that they don't have to spend the time for the probate judge and the process. Can you Could you explain to us how is your life impacted, uh, Ms. Farrell, because of this existing law and how it would improve if we, it improved from 45 to 90 days? Well, I think it's just very, you know, as I stated earlier, is that, you know, between those 45 days, Dan has to get a pre-op at the, the doctor's office, even to do the um, ECT, a court martial comes to the house. At some points you're wondering, you know, that's anxiety producing just because he may not with his IQ, he may not necessarily understand, you know, what's being asked of him. We are his legal guardians in every way, except for ECT. And I know that there's medications that my son has been on that has card, caused far worse effects than ECT um, has ever, I mean, it's been fine for him. Um, you know, there's people on Ambien that are getting in their car and, you know, taking off and driving somewhere or doing things they don't even remember that are harmful. ECT has saved my son's life. And, um, but as your question states, the ECT, um, the, you know, the, having the court order at 45 days, now that he is in a good place and he's going to a work program and, he's able to function and have a, um, a healthy life again, um, it disrupts that. Um, he, he would have to be taken out of his work program in order to be present for that. He has to be present at our house for the court martial to come and have to physically hand him the papers, even though we're his legal guardians. And at one point we were on vacation and the only reason I knew anybody was there was because I had a, a ring phone. And at that point, we had to delay his treatment because we couldn't get back home to get those orders in time. Um, so it's just um, many of those kind of things are just interfere with uh, that, you know, the coordination between it's, it's a lot of work for the hospitals too to get all their information together and then get it to the court. And the court has a big caseload and then, you know, our schedules and, it, it makes delays in the treatment. And when Dan has a delay in his treatment, um, he disintegrates, he, he regresses. Um, at one point when he regressed, um, not, not during this maintenance treatment, but before, um, he wound up in the hospital for 30 days to get him back on track. He was supposed to be the best man in my daughter's wedding and was not able to attend. So that's how badly it affects him when he does not get his treatments. Thank you so much. Thank you for your yep. testimony. I mm -hmm. uh, appreciate that. I will see if anyone else has any comments or questions. Um, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Farrell, for uh, sharing the testimony. I, I hope it, it helps us uh, be in a slightly better place. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Omar. <clears throat> Next is Jim Williams with the American Heart Association. Mr. Williams. Yes, good afternoon and thank you. Uh, I, I'm Jim Williams. I'm with the American Heart Association. I would like to thank the leadership and members of the Public Health Committee for giving me the opportunity today to speak on House Bill 6488, which would prohibit the sale of most flavors and electronic nicotine delivery devices and vapor products. While this bill, if passed, could have a positive impact on those most likely to use these products or who do so now, mainly those in suburban communities, we cannot support this bill as it does not recognize the very real issue of racial equity and making sure that any intended health outcome is extended to all. We ask that you either support an amendment to prohibit the sale of all flavors and all tobacco products to include menthol cigarettes or support the withdrawal of this bill so that the issue can be properly dealt with next session. I would also like to thank many members of this committee who have shown great leadership and partnership on other tobacco issues, such as Tobacco 21, and most recently appropriating funding for the first time in close to seven years for tobacco control. Those are huge wins. However, for us, for us to support this bill, it must be expanded to include all flavors and all tobacco products. Sadly, this bill simply does not go far enough and the intended health benefits leave far too many people behind. 
Instead of reading all of my testimony, which you have before you, I will instead ad address a question that perhaps many of you have. Isn't something better than nothing? Although we did not request this bill this session, we do recognize that e-cigarette flavors are a real problem and are undoubtedly responsible for hooking kids. But this issue is more dynamic than just e-cigarette flavors. The purview, the purview of this committee is the public health of the state, of every resident, not just some of the residents. Many, many people are still addicted to menthol cigarettes, and many more will become so. This bill leaves many residents behind and hopefully realizing the intended health outcomes. For example, we know that tobacco use is the number one cause of preventable death among Black Americans, and tobacco-related health disparities in the Black community are largely the result of the tobacco industry's intentional targeted efforts to hook generations of Black Americans to deadly and addictive products. Today, 85% of Black smokers smoke menthol cigarettes. Obviously, there's opposition to including all flavors and all tobacco products in the bill. That opposition, if we are being honest, is rooted in one of three concerns. First, the sellers, think R.J. Reynolds, convenience stores, gas stations, are mainly concerned with loss of profits, to which I say, your product is the only one on shelves today that if used according to manufacturer recommendations, will addict you, will make you sick, and may kill you. Consider selling something else. Second, it's difficult for legislators to take away the thing that makes the source of their constituents' addiction taste good. Without the flavors, these products simply would not taste good, and the industry knows this. This should not be a Democrat issue or a Republican issue. Addiction and tobacco-related disease does not care about political ideology. I would ask those constituents, if you're being honest with yourself, would you like to quit, if not for yourself, then for the sake of your loved ones? Would you like to make it more difficult for your kids to go down the road that you have? Finally, as a state, we are addicted to balancing our state budget in part on the over $300 million in cigarette revenue that we take in every year. That's revenue on the backs of the health of our fellow citizens. It's a reality, but no matter how you look at it, it's morally wrong. So yes, my organization and others who have spoken or will speak today strongly suggest that we put our heads together and figure out how to do this comprehensively to positively impact as many Connecticut residents as possible. If Massachusetts can do this, why can't we? I would excuse, guess that, excuse me, Mr. Um, Williams, your time is complete. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for your testimony. I uh, appreciate your testimony and, and uh, what you're stating. Um, I do not have any questions. Uh, there is, uh, Representative Kennedy has a question or a comment. Thank you, Mr. Williams, for being here today. Um, I was just wondering, could you just finish that last sentence where you're referring to Massachusetts? Sure. Let me just pull my document back up. What I was saying was that Massachusetts has passed a comprehensive uh, flavor ban that I'm sure you heard in part today. I, I believe it was uh, 2020. And what I was saying was that if Massachusetts can do this, why can't we? I would guess that everyone in this hearing has a loved one, a family member, a neighbor, or a friend whose life has been touched by tobacco. It's time we make the hard decisions in the best interest of everyone. That's why we support prohibiting the sale of all flavors and all products. And I'd be more than happy to answer questions either now that you have or at any time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Mr. Williams. Thank you, Representative Parker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Jim. Uh, we've asked a similar question to other folks, so I'd be curious to get your thoughts on this. How do you balance the desire to potentially make some progress this year? knowing that there might be an opportunity to uh, refine policy into the future. Really, can you speak to, I know you sort of read this in, in your comments, but I'd love to just hear you speak to it. Can you speak to um, why you believe that uh, moving forward without this full ban is is the right move and um, what you think about the risks of potentially uh, having harm along the way if we don't take an action now that at least gets part of the way there? Sure, and, and I did address this largely in my comments, but I think uh, ideally, our first priority would be to prevent uh, kids from going down the road of tobacco addiction related disease and death. But we also want to pay attention to adults and others that are, you know, today addicted and utilizing those products. You know, a, a tobacco flavor prohibition would still leave tobacco flavor uh, available. So people who are interested in what they call harm reduction could still use tobacco flavored e-cigarettes um, 
not we're not trying to take that away. But what we, what we are trying to do is to prevent kids from going down that road of addiction and to help those adults who are addicted today. And I think by by having a comprehensive flavor ban, you take away the, the biggest selling point that the tobacco industry has for their products and what is most attractive to, to people, uh, including kids and adults. I appreciate you sharing that. I'll be honest, I'm not sure that I totally, that you got to the core of um, the sort of timeline of making some progress and, and how that plays out. But I, I, you know, as you know, I really appreciate your perspective and would love to keep talking with you about it. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. My honorable uh, co-chair has a question and then she is going to conduct the public hearing after that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Mr. Williams, for all your work and uh, for being such an incredible partner over the years. Um, I really, I think I'm just going to echo a little bit what Representative Parker was talking about. And uh, you really, I think, laid things out very clear clearly. I referenced this earlier when Ms. Kenobi was here, uh, that this committee is very much um, and has been prior to my position and uh, membership on this committee addressing issues of racial equity and uh, health. And you're sharing the statistics related to the use of menthol cigarettes, I think is very powerful. And you talked about the three issues that we are really facing, that the seller's loss of pro profits, the, the issue around flavors and harm reduction, and the budget. And that is always the question here in the legislature is how do we make progress towards a goal um, when we recognize some of the realities and the, the forces against doing so? So I, I just, this is more of a comment than a question. Um, I, I just want to go back maybe to see if you can emphasize something that you said, which was you're wanting to come back next year um on this and and maybe give you a chance to say a little bit more about that absolutely um you know if, if we are unable uh this particular legislative session to pass a comprehensive prohibition on all flavors for all tobacco products i would suggest taking a step back and allowing advocates and others to figure out how we can get that support that we need because the public health committee's cognizance is over the health. Um, you know, ideally, the public health committee should be able to pass the best bill possible. Um, but you know, once something like this gets to the finance committee, it takes a whole different direction, and the importance there will be much more so on the loss of revenue, which we know would come up if this bill were to get to, to finance. So I, I think that you know, my organization and many others, including the American Cancer Society, American Lung Association, Tobacco-Free Kids, um, are, are more than willing to put our heads together and figure out how we can get that needed support where it has not been previously. I, uh, namely, you know, from the finance angle, as well as from the urban angle. I mean, we know that e-cigarettes are a bigger problem in the suburbs. We also know that uh, menthol cigarettes are a bigger problem in the urban community. I, I think in order to get the urban legislators more on board, you would have to increase the voice within their own communities. And by giving us time to do that, I, I feel pretty confident that we could come back next legislative session and do that. Although my first choice would be to amend the bill you have before you to include all flavors and all products. But if that's not politically possible this session, I, we would like to partner with all of all interested legislators uh, to do that. And, and we'd be more than willing to start off by doing an informational forum uh, at, at your, uh, whenever you're available to give you all of the information and data that we have to support that. To also answer any questions that you may have. Mr. Williams, thank you. I love that, you know, very practical, very honest, very straightforward assessment of where we've been and then the clarity of where you are hoping that we, especially as a public health committee in the best interests of the public health can go. So thank you very much for the conversation.
You're welcome. And Representative Wielander. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Williams. This is actually more of a uh, comment than a question. I just wanted to um, bring up something that you mentioned, the the personal impact of tobacco products. And as a former smoker myself, who it took a lot longer to quit than I ever thought it would, considering I didn't actually smoke for very long. Um, and as someone who has been personally touched by um, the family members uh, who have been impacted by tobacco use, I think that no matter how we go forward, we have to remember the human health aspect of it and what can we do best to serve the state. So thank you for making those points. You're welcome. Thank you, Representative Wielander. Representative Zupkus, and I'm sorry if I missed your hand on Zoom earlier. Please proceed. That's, that's okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, hi, Jim. Um, uh, you know, when I look at this again, I say addiction is addiction. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what's your zip code. Uh, I'm concerned about is addiction for anybody. And the other concern, obviously, is our kids. Like you said, I don't want my kids or your kids or any kids smoking pot, drinking, uh, vaping, any of those things, because I truly believe it is not good for them. Um, but my question to you is, you know, you're talking about what can be done and what you would uh, put in another bill. Would you also add in to uh, ban edibles, flavored edibles? Because I think that's a big problem and should be part of this whole conversation. We should always include, um, you know, the whole marijuana piece. It's bad for your lungs. It's bad for your heart. There's flavors. It's all of what we're talking about. And would you be, uh, would you be putting that also into legislation? Well, you certainly have heard recently about issues with edibles. Um, my organization is fact and data driven. Uh, much like you heard from uh, Ruth Kenobi from the American Lung Association, um, we are now formulating a, an actual position on marijuana. Although myself personally, I would only suggest that you put clean oxygen into your lungs. Um, but as far as putting marijuana products into a tobacco flavor bill, that would be completely up to the purview of the, the legislature. My association doesn't have a position on that yet, but as soon as we do, which I, I believe will come very soon, I'll be more than happy to share it with everybody. Thank you, because I know there have been, and I wanted to say this to Ruth when she spoke and it got away from me, but there are studies that prove that marijuana is bad for you know your brain and kills brain cells and your lungs and everything. Um, so I just think when we're talking about uh, things that are bad and we don't want our children to do and all of these issues that we should include everything. Um, so I was just curious as to your answer to that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Representative. Seeing and hearing no other questions. Thank you, Mr. Williams, for taking the time to be with us today. You're welcome. Okay, next on our agenda. Let me just, I believe is Mr. Katz, Gerald Katz. Mr. Katz, are you here in the Zoom room? If so, if you could unmute yourself. Okay, Mr. Katz, I'll just call one more time. Oh, you okay. Are? Mr. Katz, we can hear you now. We cannot see you. Are you able to turn on your camera to join us? No, I, I could just talk. You don't have to see me. I didn't have my hair done tonight. All right, please um, proceed. My name is Gerald Katz. I just, before I start, I just want to let you know that no one asked me to talk or no cigarette company asked me to talk on their behalf. I own a shelf food mart. 141 Willow Street, New Haven. I've been in business 40 years. Um, I am opposed to the bill. I just want to also mention that I have, you know, when, you know, committee members or people that talk and they mention kids, um, I don't understand that because, you know, you take the 5,000 convenience stores plus is my understanding that everybody cards. So I don't know where kids, you know, are, are, are can receive uh, these e-cigarettes. Two years ago, there was a bill to ban menthol cigarettes. 
it was passed after 40 years of being a proprietor of Jerry Shell, I would have to shut down my store since I could not have been able to afford the decline in revenue. Convenience stores owners pride themselves, such as baby food, pampers, formula, milk, etc., that people may need at times that other stores are closed. I'm glad that there were people in our state house that realized how important our stores are to exist. A year ago, a version of the same bill was brought up and again did not pass. I'm glad there were enough intelligent people in the state house who realized how unfair this bill was. Now the same people who proposed the bills come up with a different type of bill to ban flavored tobacco and vapor products. 90% of the people who buy these products will use the vaping products to help them stop smoking. 50% have good results to help them, to help them stop smoking. We can buy legalized flavored marijuana and flavored gummies. How hypocritical it is that government needs to stop coming up with these bills that could put convenience stores out of business. Connecticut needs all the business that they can get, not to mention the needed tax revenue that will be lost. Um, talking, uh, representing, you know, approximately, again, 5,000 know, convenience stores, we are trained that anybody that comes in our, house, our store that asks for a e-cigarette or flavored tobacco must show proof ID. So I don't have much more to say. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Katz. We appreciate it. Is there any questions I'd like to ask? You know, I would I would simply, you know, I mean, being in business for 40 years and going through this, you know, sometimes I wonder if in next year you might consider banning cigarettes and um, uh, lighters which is used for vaping sometimes. And I'm, so, I'm sorry if I sound so angry. It just seems that, you know, some of the committee has already decided on what they're going to do. And this is what happened a couple of years ago. But again, anybody want to ask me questions, I'm available. Thank you, Mr. Katz. Seeing and hearing none, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you very much. Next on our list is number 43, Lisa Singley. And I see you on Zoom. If you can unmute and please proceed. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lisa Singley. I'm a licensed naturopathic physician and a licensed acupuncturist in Connecticut. And I apologize if some of my comments are a bit redundant. Um, naturopathic Naturopaths are trained to diagnose and treat patients using safe, effective treatment modalities, such as nutrition, health, healthy lifestyle education, herbal medicines, vitamins, supplements, physical medicine, and counseling. Naturopathic physicians are an important part of the current healthcare system in Connecticut. We see patients that are referred from other physicians and healthcare providers, and refer patients to other providers when they require care outside the scope of our practice. Naturopaths offer safe, effective, cost-saving treatments that provide patients with a choice with regard to the type of health care they want to receive. The purpose of this bill is really unclear to me. If it does not change the scope of practice, it seems unnecessary and potentially confusing to the people it is meant to serve. For these reasons, I strongly oppose this bill as written unless it includes an exemption allowing healthcare providers such as naturopaths and chiropractors to continue using the title physician. I think the term physician is appropriate here because we are clinically trained to diagnose and treat and that's kind of how the people of the state have learned to know us. Um, so changing that would dramatically change the way we practice. So thank you very much for hearing my testimony today. Thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. Seeing and hearing no questions, actually just double checking that online. Thank you. Thank Next you. on our list is uh, number 44, Nancy Allisberg. Good afternoon, co-chairs Anwan and McCarthy and honorable members of the Public Health Committee. 
I am testifying as a retired civil rights and disability rights attorney of 40 years, not retired 40 years, but worked for approximately 40 years. And I'd like you to hear my testimony through that lens. I'm also from West Hartford. Um, I'm testifying in support of Bill 897 and in opposition to Bill 898. With respect to Bill 897, um, I like the idea of being able to rely upon um, my healthcare proxy having to respect my advanced directives. However, what concerns me about it is that there are many people who will execute their healthcare pro their, their advanced directives at some time when they um, execute a will and then forget about it. And 10 or more years may go by before they are actually in need of implementing those healthcare directives. Um, I think at that point, hopefully the individual would have had robust discussions with their healthcare proxy who would know what their wishes were and how they might have developed over the 10, 15, 20 years since they were executed. I would therefore recommend that there be an amendment to 897 so that uh, it apply only to healthcare advanced directives that have been issued within the last two years. Um, that way we could be assured that those advanced directives accurately reflected the wishes of the person. With respect to Bill 898, I'm strongly opposed to any changes in the timeframes within that bill. I think the first thing that we need to be clear about is that it is not appropriate to, for a legislative body to make policy changes based upon individual cases. So while you are hearing many stories about how ECT worked or ECT didn't work, um, I would hope that you would make decisions based upon the professionals who um, know ECT the best, um, both the physicians and the, the um, judges who have to implement it. Additionally, when the bill was drawn up, it was drawn up very carefully with the time frames having great significance. As Judge Marino testified, a normal course of treatment of ECT is three times a week over the course of 30 days. When the bill, the 45 days was arrived at, it was because the providers felt they needed a little additional time in case there was something that went wrong within that 30 days and the time need, needed to be extended. All the stakeholders, all the stakeholders, Demas, the Psychiatric Su Survivors Movement, the advocates all agreed that that was a reasonable compromise. That's not to say everybody agrees that ECT should be done, I don't think that's what we're here to talk about today. We're simply talking about the timeframes. So I get very, very frightened when I hear um, the probate court judges talk about wanting to extend it for 90 Excuse days. Excuse me, Ms. Alex Burr, your time is complete. All right, I'm just going to wrap up. I get very concerned when I hear them talk about extending it to 90 days or to 120 days. Tom Barrett will be testifying with Kathy Flaherty later on. He has the history. He was involved in the um, um, bill when it was drafted. And I ask that you pay close attention to his legislative history of how you arrived at the original 45 days and not change it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Alice Berg. Is there questions? Questions, Representative, or actually, excuse me, Senator Gordon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for testifying uh, today. I just had one question about a comment that was raised uh, by the person who was testifying about putting a time limit on an advanced directive. I'm a doctor and I deal with advanced directives all the time. Mm -hmm. And you can have an advanced directive that is signed and sealed, so to speak, five years ago. And it's still very valid because we have ongoing discussions with our patients about their advanced directives. And if nothing has changed, we don't always change the document. We document in the medical record this discussion. So I just wanna I just wanna ask why would there be a need to have a blanket decision about if an advanced directive is quote unquote too old, why that would be considered 
not something to follow if, in fact, it has been updated with a discussion with a doctor or another healthcare uh, professional and in that patient's medical record, which is not just a medical document, it's also a legal document whenever we put things in a medical record. So I just wanted to ask that question just because of the comment that was uh, made. Thank you. I appreciate I appreciate the question, Senator Gordon. Um, unfortunately, not everybody has a primary care physician who is as thorough as you are. My primary care physician updates my advanced directive every year when I have a physical. But number one, there are many people, as I said, who don't have such thorough care, many people who can't afford to get that kind of care. Um, and I would say it's probably not a universal practice for many people who have advanced directives to be able to update them with their healthcare practitioners um, every year. I think it's a great practice. That's why I think there needs to be some kind of time frame because people who do not have the ability to get um, a health care directive updated with their physician every year at their physical, um, that the, the 10, 15, 20 year um, health care directive be questioned. We want to encourage robust discussion between the healthcare proxies and the individual who is designating the proxy. Um, and things change over time. There are new treatments available. People listen to stories and they have different feelings about what they want for their end of life care. And if it's been updated in a medical record every year, I think that's fabulous. I'm looking at the cases we do as lawyers, and as you probably do as legislators too, the worst case scenario, somebody who hasn't updated their healthcare proxy since they first executed a will 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Any other questions? I'd be happy to respond. Yes, absolutely. Please proceed. The floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be very quick. I'm mindful of the time. I just want to be careful that if we're thinking of worst case scenarios, we don't hurt the people who are doing the best case scenarios. So I don't want to throw the good out with any anything bad. we got to be very careful if we put time limits on advanced directives. I've taken care of patients who have had advanced directives 10, 15 years old, and they're still very valid and very much updated in the medical records. So I would just caution doing that because I think we could miss a lot uh, in what people want and don't want that gets uh, verified by a doctor or another healthcare professional. So I just want to raise that as a caution. Thank, thank you. you. Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. And thank you, Ms. Allisberg, for your testimony and for the exchange. I appreciate it. Thank you. Next on our list is Anthony Carruthers, who is with us on Zoom. Mr. Carruthers, are you able to? I am uh, unmuting. And, and so. if you're able to turn on your camera, we always yes. appreciate that. Yay. Wonderful. <laughs> Welcome and please proceed. Hello. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here. I, uh, my name is Anthony Carruthers. I'm a retired Chicago police officer. I retired at the rank of commander a few years ago. I have 32 years of law enforcement experience. I was in fact invited to testify on behalf of R.J. Reynolds, but I can tell you that the views and opinions are my own. They're based on my experience as an officer and also as a black person. And I specify that for a reason. I'll come back to that shortly. Um, for one thing, it was said several times today that uh, we should, we're behind times. There are cities and states around us that have already passed such a bill. Having said that, in June 15th, 2022, three people charged with stealing cash and cigarettes in a robbery spree in Connecticut. They robbed uh, approximately eight stores during that spree. Um, in December of 2021, man stole more than 2,000 cigarettes and cigarettes from an employer. Uh, estimated to be worth over $243,000. That was in Connecticut. This is why you do not have any type of ban in place. This is why it's legal to have these things. And I can tell you, I can assure you, my experience tells me the places around you who have such bans, that's where these stolen products are going to go. 
Unfortunately, you are going to experience a higher crime value whenever you ban a product because you banning it doesn't mean people do not want it. I have to specify this also as a black man because time and time again, people say, well, you know, this affects the black community 80% more, 85% more. Let me assure you, I've been to more meetings than I could possibly remember, 50, 100 meetings. I have spoken to people in the black community all of my life, well past 50 years, and particularly in the past 15 years. And when you talk to them, they will tell you, you know, we need better, we need grocery stores in our community. True. We need mental health facilities in our community. Yes, we do. We need better jobs and education. All true. Not one time in over 50 years, close to six, better past 60, has one black man or woman ever said to me, you know, we got to get this menthol out of cigarettes. That is excessively low hanging fruit on the minds of black people in America. Some people use that, and quite frankly, I found when people have special interests, they usually use a particular minority or they use children to try to get home their message. The, this menthol means nothing to the majority of people in the Black community, I can assure you, nothing. If anything, they choose to do it, and they feel like every other American, if they choose to do something that's lawful, they should be allowed to. People ask, well, does a, does a ban uh, prove anything? We, we had a ban in the 1920s called Prohibition. It was the number one driving force which created organized crime to gain the most money ever in the history of America. In, 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 in a few months ago, six months ago, when gas was at a very high rate, California had an article where they had black market gasoline being sold. Right now, because of the high cost of eggs, I just read an article three days ago where people are, are now have black market eggs coming across the border. Whenever something is banned or unattainable that people want, there will be a way to obtain it. Thank you so much. Thank you for your remarks today. Are there questions? Seeing and hearing none, thank you for taking the time to be with us and sharing your perspective. Thank you so much. Next on our agenda is, I believe, Karen Healy. Is Karen Healy here? Oh. Miss Healy in person. I actually forgive me, Miss Healy. I'm sorry. Is MD Islam here in person? And it looks like you are up after all, Miss Healy. Welcome. And please remember to turn on the microphone when you testify and please proceed. Hi, good, good afternoon, Senator Anwar and um, McCarthy and Ray. Hi, my me members of the Public Committee, Health Committee. My name is Karen Healy and I live in Hartford and I'm a, I vote too. I'm a person recovering from mental illness. I spent 24 years of my life in psychiatric hospitals between Hudson River Valley Hospital, New York, Cedar Crest and CVH in Connecticut. I am now living successfully in the community. I am a member of the Keep the Promise Coalition, a member of Disability Rights of Connecticut PAMI Council and the Connecticut Council of Developmental Disabilities. I was chosen to be a part of these advocacy committees because of my story and how I lived my experience, which I used to help people. I'm here to talk about the um, opposition of S SB 898. Well, I have a history of um, hurting myself very badly all my life since the age of 16 and a half. So I was put in a hospital in 1989 in Bikipson, New York, in a St. Francis hospital with a local, local psychiatric unit where I was the youngest one they had. They didn't have a young adult unit or adolescent unit. Um, I remember what, starting my first time in a hospital at that point for psychiatric psychiatric issues of hurting myself. Um, I received my first treatment at ECT. Don't remember the whole thing, but I remember a couple of times sitting in front of the nurse's station in a jerry chair with a posy, with a diaper and drooling all over myself. And I didn't know what the heck was going on and where I was and what was gonna happen to me next. I received, I believe, in two or three weeks, about 18, 19 treatments, and they did not work for me at all. I remember sitting in one of my rooms, and I took a, uh, a paper clip, and I hurt myself. And I'm like, okay, if this treatment was supposed to help, then why am I still doing this to myself that brought me into St. Francis Hospital? In 2006, I was a patient of Cedar Crest Hospital, and I remember my birthday, November 10th of that year. The doctor, um, the psych, the medical director of Cedar Crest said, oh, we, because I hurt myself very bad. I was in the ER on and off for like the last, the whole year there. He put me in, you know, when the prisoners get transferred, the wood leather, the handcuffs for 72 hours. They were so scared that I was going to do something to myself. So they did that to me for 72 hours. And I won't forget that till this day. Um, and then I, 
um, at Cedar Crest, I received some more ECT treatments at the IOL, um, and they didn't help me because it didn't. I was like the gentleman, that younger gentleman saying earlier, who was an ex, who dealt with ECT being an inpatient and outpatient person. Even though I was hurting myself to the point where I was being in the ER every other day, being sutured, surgery wise or whatever, for removing objects from my body. Um, I was competent, I was together, I was talkative, I was not having a conservator at that point. And remember, they put these ECT treatments without asking me and talking to me about it. And I think after the ECT, I went downhill instead of going uphill, like it's supposed to help you. Um, and then in um, a couple of years before that, I was in a research protocol at Columbia and Presbyterian Hospital in New York for borderline personality disorder, because that's one of my diagnoses. I remember sitting in the TV room with my mom next to me after three ECT trims, sitting in a wheelchair, peeing on myself all over the rug and having people look at me as other patients laughing and making fun of me. I feel that ECT could help some people and doesn't always help other people. For someone who has the right and can talk for themselves and is, is able to speak up for themselves and have a sense of human, human, ad, human and responsibility, no matter what they go through, they should be have the right to say yes or no, no matter what they've been through or what they're in the hospital for, for um, dangerous to themselves or dangerous to others. It doesn't mean that we do not know what we're from wrong. And my last thing I will always say, because I've done eight testimonies last year and made the heart recurrent twice. My last statement is people, people with disabilities are as human as anyone else. Just because I have a mental health condition doesn't mean that I'm not any that I'm not different than anybody else. Thank you for having taken this opportunity to testify today. My name is Karen Healy, and my email address that wants to contact me is KarenHealy73 at gmail.com. And I really appreciate you guys having this testimony today because it means a lot to me for someone to speak up what I've been through. And the other, I've been out of CVH for eight, um, eight and a half years, and I'm still on the community. When I was left, I was told I would be back the week after. Guess what? Eight years later, I'm still in my own place in the community successfully. Ms. Healy, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us, for sharing your experience and your testimony, and for your bravery and sharing your own personal story. I'm very grateful for that. Are there thank questions you. from members of the committee? Representative Kennedy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick comment. I just want to thank you for sitting here all morning into the early afternoon with us and, and so, so proud of you. Eight years is a great time. Thank you so much for that. And uh, thank you for coming out to testify. It really means a lot. Thank you so much for that comment. I appreciate that. I was acknowledged. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you. We are grateful. And it's, it is so nice to be able to be back in the building together. It absolutely is. And to have the opportunity to testify online. And with that, um, we are going, actually, we have someone else, I believe, uh, here in, in the room. Nikki Colley. Is Nikki here? Wonderful. Welcome, Ms. Colley. And um, please proceed. If I, excuse me, if you don't mind pressing the button so that everyone can hear you at home as well. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, good afternoon to the chairs and ranking members and other members of the Public Health Committee. Um, I am Nikki Colley, Director of Legislative Affairs at the Connecticut Energy Marketers Association, um, and I'm opposing HB 6488. Uh, senior members own, operate, and distribute motor fuels to over a thousand con convenience stores across Connecticut. There's a lot of st at stake for our, uh, our industry in Connecticut right now. Uh, first, the state is going to great lengths to completely electrify our transportation sector, which will have massive impact on our industry for years to come. Uh, our competitors like big box retailers and grocery store chains are allowed to sell beer, uh, gasoline, which again, puts us at a disadvantage. Um, even now, package stores now sell a number of items that were traditionally only sold by family, uh, small family convenience stores like lottery tickets and food items. We want to remind this committee and the legislator that we are not big box uh, retailers and we are not ExxonMobil, Shell, BB, BP, and other big refiners. We represent small, locally owned family businesses that are working to provide for their families. With the state's efforts to electrify the transportation sector, jeopardizing our industry's future, coupled uh, with the advantage our competitors are selling the same products we do, um, now we have a proposal to ban even more of the products we rely on, which will result in business closures. 
Many people have opposed this bill in the past because of the impact it will have on the state budget. Today, I'm here to say that this will have a profound impact on our business bottom line and should just it be just as important to lawmakers. We're also opposed to this bill because legal age uh, adults should retain the ability to buy and consume the products of their choice from responsible retailers. Banning the freedom to choose tobacco products that have already been introduced to the market in a time of heightened sensitivity between communities and law enforcement is bad policy. Prohibiting the choice of law-abiding illegal age appropriate adults will inadvertently contribute to the illegal sales of flavored tobacco while simultaneously making criminals of those individuals selling the product and putting more pressure on an already strained police force. I would also note that the FDA has already taken regulatory action by banning over 8 million flavored electronic cigarettes and flavored nicotine liquid products and has announced that it has plans to publish a final rule in August 2023, banning the sale of menthol cigarettes and all the flavored cigars. Finally, the state recently legalized a recreational use, uh, recreational use of marijuana, ending decades of prohibition, um, and this new legal product is being uh, sold in the form of gummies and other edibles that I assume is just as attractive to underage uh, people, especially children. We ask that you consider how the language in this bill contradicts the actions of the General Assembly, which ended the prohibition on uh, marijuana. Connecticut retailers take the proper precautions when guarding against the sale of tobacco products to underage individuals. And for those that are not following those laws and restrictions, actions should be and are taken. Thank you for listening to my testimony, and I'll take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other questions from members of the committee? I see Representative Subkiss. Please proceed, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just had one quick question, and I've been wanting to ask this because, um, as I've heard uh, a few people talk about how um, convenience stores are the ones that are selling to underage, and I'm sure it happens just like kids can somehow get liquor. Uh, but my question is, so what? what is being the people that are selling this illegally, or how can um, this be approached so it doesn't happen? Um, because if it's happening, but no matter what you're selling, if you're selling it to a minor, it should be stopped. Yeah. So we totally agree that it should be stopped. I know that our members, we uh, participate in the We Card program. Uh, we have training for our employees to make sure that these sales are not being made to underage people when it comes to the black market and how children are assessing these um, these products. Uh, we do not know all the answers um, and honestly how to stop it in um in totality, we want to be a part of that solution if we can contribute because at the end of the day, our members are part of these communities. They have children that go to the same schools um, as everyone else and they want to stop their own children from consuming products that they should not. So um, again, we do believe that safeguarding these products by having them in stores that can make sure that they are not being sold to underage people is the most important way to prevent that um, for the time being. Thank you, because I, um, it, you know, I don't know how I feel on this bill. There's a lot still to learn and to be heard, uh, but people are saying, I don't believe every store does it, um, but for the ones to do, how are, what are we doing about it now? So if it's a problem now, um, what is the state or is the police or who that does something? So I thank you. I was just wondering if you had any ideas, but I, I definitely don't think it's every store. That wasn't my intent of the question. I just want to also state that we have contacted the um, Department of Revenue Services to get the statistics to see uh, what those numbers are uh, with underage sales, if we can track where they're coming from. Oh, um, other again, because we do want to be part of a solution to make sure that these sales um, are not happening, especially amongst our members. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Subkiss, for that. And I would just add, I think in earlier conversation, one of the things we heard, it's actually the over 21 uh, places that are having some issues, but to um, to your point, uh, Ms. Kali, uh, we we will look into those statistics. It's a kind of a complex web between the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, the Department of Consumer Protection, and the Department of Revenue Services when it comes to uh, the issues around these items. So we're going to look into that as we go forward. Any other questions, Representative Cavros-Segraw? 
Thank you. And it's more actually of a comment than a question because uh, we have experienced this in, in my district and we do have uh, multiple gas stations that unfortunately are have sold and are selling to minors. And then unfortunately what happens is uh, we've got kids that are selling them to each other on the buses. And it, and I know it's not a unique problem to my district. I started on this issue in 2018 with vape pods. In fact, I took it to, at the time, Attorney General Jepson. I think the issue that we're facing to the last person, to uh, Representative Zupkis's thing, is, is enforcement in terms of we don't have enough people that are actually available through the Department of Consumer Protection to participate in enforcement. So I don't know if you've heard that, um, but I think that, it, you know, it's not the police that are doing it, nor do I think it should be. But um, in terms of actually enforcing store to store to store, that, that's just not happening. And so when we pull numbers on where we think it might be happening or where complaints have been made, I don't think we're getting accurate numbers as to how many places this is actually occurring. Yeah. We've also reached out to DCP as well, and they actually referred us to uh, DRS. So. <laughs> Good. Thank you so much for your comments. I don't see any other questions or comments. We thank you again for your testimony. Appreciate you coming in. The next person on our list is Jennifer Tirado. Uh, welcome to the committee and, and please go ahead. Hello, thank you. Um, let me just get my, okay. Dear honorable members of the committee, my name is Jennifer Tirado and I'm a resident of Meriden, Connecticut. I work for Advocacy Unlimited leading the Alternative to Suicide Network. I'm also a person who's dealt with my own mental health struggles and I have diagnoses. I'm someone who's received services and as a peer supporter, I'm someone who has provided services. I'm testifying today in opposition of bill number 898. I want to observe that the committee has clarified the intention of this bill. So I partially amended my original statement and I want to thank the committee for the further clarification of intention behind this bill. While I understand this is a last case resort and most cases, I would urge decision makers to advocate broadening the scope of treatment options, considering the grave risks that are involved with electroshock. With people I've supported, I've heard horror stories of me memory loss. I would like to speak on this. I posit that ECT tra treatment without the opportunity for informed consent stands in opposition to human rights of psychiatric patients. It is not only a bodily violation, but strikes at the core of someone's identity, since one of the most signif the significant effects is the memory loss. This isn't the only document the side effect of this treatment, as I'm sure you all have heard. There are cardiovascular complications, seizures, brain damage, as previously mentioned here. Also, I would like to cite a 2020 study of the US Veterans Administration, the largest provider of ECT currently, revealed that those who received ECT were almost six times more likely to die of suicide than their peers with similar diagnoses who did not receive ECT. Allowing an electroshock without informed consent exemplifies a disregard of uh, people making their own healthcare decisions and especially when we consider that there are a wide breadth of emerging evidence-based mental health alternatives becoming more accessible through peer support agencies, advocacy initiatives, there are other options. I urge decision makers to really look at a broad scope. There has to be another resort other than ECT. Throughout my life in recovery and serving others who dealt with diagnoses, I've seen with my own eyes the profound damage and trauma wrought through forced treatment. And for some people, the damage is irre irreparable. And we've seen examples of this already. Uh, by contrast, I've seen in others and experienced myself the personal growth and triumph of choosing our own care, the power of mutual support. I also wanna urge legislators to look at um, a 2017 United Nations report, which really um, drives home this point. The crisis in mental health should be managed, well, quote, excuse me, quote, the crisis in mental health should be managed not as a crisis of individual conditions, but as a crisis of social obstacles, which hinder individual rights. Mental health policy should address power imbalance rather than chemical imbalance. And again, this is a quote from a 2017 report of the United Nations. So are we going to leave behind forced treatment of the previous era or fully embrace the value of informed consent? We have the resources to move beyond what ECT truly represents, a blunt and simplistic instrument, all too capable of destroying the very thing it seeks to repair. 
I urged the committee to consider real world implications this would have on some of our most vulnerable Connecticut residents. If this bill is truly what represents what mental health is our, in our state supposed to be about. And I know this is more about- Excuse me, Ms. Tirado, your time is complete. Thank you. Thank you, I'll take questions. 10.30. Thank you, I, I don't have a question. I just wanna make a comment. I think there's a little bit of a confusion. For some reason, many of the people who are testifying, they are talking about the merit of ECT. That is not on the bill. That is above and beyond the scope of this uh, legislative body. We are not talking about whether ECT works or not works. It is going to work in some, it's not going to work in other. We are not taking away anybody's right or giving anybody more rights on that part. And that's going to be decided by the way the, the state, the, the, the clinicians, the physicians, the psychiatrists decide in those individuals. And there will be cases that are out there which will work and the others it will not work. And we can't decide that as a legislative body. So I think there's a little confusion on this. What we are saying is for those, those who it works for, it is important that we can move it from 45 days to 90 days. The probate judges themselves have said that that's okay. And I, I think we are, we are the messaging may have been inaccurate. And I think that's because of the language of the bill, maybe perhaps confused individuals, but this bill is not about electroconvulsive therapy is good or not good. And that's something that uh, I think many people have spoken. I wish it's worthy to clarify that going forward. Next is, uh, I don't see any question or comments. We'll go to next uh, number 50, uh, Dr. David ML, Connecticut State Medical Society. Senator Anwar, Sen Representative McCarthy Vahey, and members of the Public Health Committee. Uh, my name is uh, David Emmel, and I'm here representing the physicians and physicians in training of the Connecticut State Medical Society in support of uh, Senate Bill 899, um, an, an act concerning title protection for physicians. In my written testimony, um, I started by going back 50 years and talking about a time uh, when uh, the distinction between practitioners was very clear. There were very few, uh, if you went to a hospital that you came in contact with, and it was very easy to tell who was a doctor, who was a nurse, who was a technician. Um, those times have changed dramatically, and now we have a, a much more complex healthcare team. They're all valuable members of the team, and, and we do not denigrate any of them or the contributions they make to healthcare. However, with all these extra people in the mix, um, it's become confusing to patients. And patients don't always know who they're talking to, um, what their roles are, and especially what their level of training is. This is not, this title issue is not an access issue. Uh, remo removing the use of the word physician by several of these groups is not going to deny anybody access to health care. They'll still be able to get the same care they get and make the same choices. These positions are well established. I think people know that but it will eliminate a lot of the confusion. In my own field, ophthalmology, I'm often confronted by people who don't understand that there is a difference between an ophthalmologist, an optometrist, and even an optician. And they think they're going to one when, uh, that they've, they've made an appointment with one when in reality they've done something else. And, and that's not serving the patient. And that's why we are uh, supporting this bill, um, particularly with regard to terminology like ophthalmic physician. If you were making a decision about who you were going to see for an eye problem, you might, if you were uh, a little bit naive, um, think that you might think that the optometric physician was better trained more had more experience than an ophthalmologist, which of course is not true. Um, and that's the kind of concern that we have. It's a safety, not an access issue. Um, I would also bring up something that happened a few years ago back in 2020, um, when the uh, chiropractors uh, issued a declaratory ruling on whether a chiropractor could perform a medical examination for non-commercial pilots. According to federal law, this requires that it be done by a physician uh, because Connecticut statute or because 
um, allows them to use that word, the Chiropractic Board of Examiners drew the conclusion that chiropractors could perform these functions. I have a copy of the exam form for these procedures and they're quite detailed. It requires um, the, the physician to do a, a very comprehensive exam, including- Excuse me, Dr. Amel, your time is complete. Thank, thank you. you. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, go ahead, please finish what your, your, your example you're giving. Thank you, Senator. So it, it would require them to uh, look inside eyes with an ophthalmoscope, inside ears to examine uh, eardrums, um, use a stethoscope to determine whether there are heart murmurs, listen to heart uh, lung sounds. It's a very comprehensive exam. It also requires uh, a review of all the medical systems and the medications the patient take. Chiropractors do not prescribe medications. We live in a world where um, there are a ton of medications and every year there are new ones. And it's very hard even for a physician to keep up with all this. So this is an instance where we think uh, patients who want to fly a, pi a pilot an airplane may be given a disservice because they're, or the people on the ground who might get hit by the airplane if it falls out of the air. Uh, as an example of how uh, the term physician is being misused. Thank you so much. I want to see if anybody has any questions or comments. Yes, uh, uh, Dr. Gordon, Representative Gordon. Senator Thank you, Gordon Mr. Chairman. Gordon. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you to my uh, physician colleague, David Emmel, for the work he does advocating for patients statewide through the State Medical Society. My question is, and more of a clarification, if I may, Mr. Chairman, to uh, Dr. Emmel, is it was, it's been touched upon about that there can be an access problem for people seeking care if this bill were to go through. And I just wanted to ask uh, Dr. Emil through you, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that, would there really be an access problem? Do you feel that this would pose an access problem or the argument that some people are making that this could cause an access to patient care really isn't well-founded? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really can't conceive of how it would have any impact on access. It, it had will have enormous impact on truth and advertising and representing their, their abilities um, and what they can offer patients. Do you have a follow-up? No, I'm all set. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good. I, I see Representative Baum has a question, please. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, good afternoon, Doctor. I just have a quick question about licensure. It's my understanding that MDs and chiropractic physicians both pay an annual fee of about $565 for license. Is that correct in your, to the best of your knowledge? Uh, yes. I, I and, don't remember the exact amount, but it's about that. And, and if, if the statute were to change and chiropractors were going to be henceforth not able to call themselves physicians, presumably that cost of that license would drop considerably. Um, would you be in favor of that? I, I don't really have a position on that. I, I don't think the doctors of Connecticut uh, are particularly concerned um, other than the fact that um, the fees we pay are, are, are exorbitant in the first place. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Anwar. Thank you. I, I just want to clarify because the, there's a difference between the title doctor and di title physician. So the doctor title for the chiropractors, nobody's touching that. Uh, is that your understanding too, um, uh, Dr. Emil? Yes. Um, the, these um, healthcare specialties, you know, go through their own education. They get degrees. Uh, we respect those degrees uh, as long as they're not abused in a way that would make somebody think they're a medical doctor with an MD or a DO degree. Thank you. Uh, Representative Denning. Thank you, Senator Anwar. Um, Dr. Emil, I'm glad you came here today um, and expressing your opinion. You talk about patient confusion, and I thoroughly understand. I practiced for 40 years as a certified registered nurse anesthetist, and nobody had any idea what I was doing or why I was there. And I know I always said, I'm here to give you an anesthetic to have you go off to sleep. Then they knew why I was there. Your, your 
major complaint, as I understand it, is that um, patients are confused. And yet, when you introduce yourself, I'm assuming you introduce yourself as doctor and not physician. And that's what I'm saying. Is this not part of the problem? Is that while you're trying to make while you're trying to make a distinction, you yourself are adding to the confusion by your own titling. Um, I, I don't think that's the case um, because they, there's it, it's common parlance, at least among physicians who have an MD and a, and a, or a DO to use either words um, and, 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 and interchange them. And that's been true for a very, very long time. But don't you don't you think um, that that about, adds to the confusion? No, I, I I don't believe it does. Okay, I thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else has any question or comment? Uh, I I wanted to thank you. Um, I, I, perhaps maybe I should ask this question. You've heard our our uh, naturopathic uh, physicians in the community who are saying it's gonna impact them. Have you had a chance to listen to any of the testimonies so far? I did listen to one piece of testimony and, and I, I, I don't uh, agree with that. I, I think uh, if naturopaths call themselves naturopaths, their patients will understand perfectly that nothing has changed and they will go back to the same person um, or seek new care from another naturopath if they leave the state or do whatever. Uh, I, I don't think it will act, impact access at all. Okay. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. Seeing Thank no you. other comments, we will move on to the next person on our list, which is uh, Mark Thompson. Good afternoon, Senator Anwar, Representative McCarthy Vahey, and members of the Public Health Committee. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to address Senate Bill 899, an act concerning title protection for physicians. My name is Mark Thompson, and I'm the Executive Director of the Fairfield County Medical Association. We fully support the Public Health Committee's putting forth legislation that will provide important uh, transparency and protections for patients. Connecticut patients are being unknowingly treated by non-physicians under the mistaken assumption that they are allopathic, medical doctors, MDs, or osteopathic, doctors of osteopathy, DOs. If done on purpose, such deception is fraudulent in that it misleads patients about the actual training of their treating clinician and the actual value of those services. A unique aspect of the problem concerns clinicians who have acquired doctorates in disciplines other than allopathic or osteopathic medicine. This includes, but is not restricted to doctors of psychology, doctors of chiropractic medicine, doctors of naturopathic medicine, doctors of podiatric medicine, doctors of optometry, doctors of pharmacy, and doctors of nursing practice. Many people do not understand the differences of these doctorates when compared to allopathic or osteopathic medicine and may therefore become even more susceptible to misconception when clinicians with these non-medical degrees are performing their services in venues which are customarily associated with medical or osteopathic physicians. While SB 899 is a step in the right direction, we propose a more encompassing state law that would require all individuals engaged in the clinical provision of any service to clearly identify their actual professional expertise, title, credentials, and all written and verbal communications with patients health insurers, hospitals, pharmacies, medical laboratories, and all other providers of healthcare goods and services. Healthcare practitioners should be required to identify themselves using the commonly recognized suffix after their names for the type of healthcare profession for which they have a Connecticut license to practice. Penalties for noncompliance should include monetary fines and professional sanctions including licensure suspension for repeat offenders. We encourage legislators to expand SB 899, and we would welcome the chance to work with you on crafting the final version of the legislation. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, 
anyone has any comments or questions? I'm not seeing any in this room. I just wanted to thank you for your patience. And I presume you have submitted a written testimony too? We did. We did that earlier this afternoon. We'll read uh, all of them. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Next is uh, Dr. Lauren Young. Thank you so much for your patience today and thank you for being with us. Thank you so much to everyone here. I know it's been a long day. I've been here for most of it with you and I can only imagine that you do this all the time. So thank you so much for your time. Um, I am Lauren Young. I am a resident of Mansfield and I own a practice in Manchester with satellites in Glastonbury, West Hartford, Stonington and Danbury. I'm here to oppose SB 88, uh, SB 899 and ask that you consider keeping naturopathic physicians um, allowing to use the term physician. I am a naturopathic physician. I have been a physician my entire career practicing naturopathic medicine, which started in 2007. I have never been mistaken as a medical doctor, and I have never been mistaken as an osteopathic physician. I have been confused as a nutritionist, an herbalist, and a homeopath. People are often surprised that I went to a federally recognized accredited medical school and they're surprised that I'm licensed. They're surprised that I am covered by most insurances and that the insurances recognize me as a physician and cover my services. I run lab tests, I do imaging, I diagnose um, everything from urinary tract infections to diabetes. And the only the difference is that I, while I practice with naturopathic modalities, I don't have the prescriptive rights in Connecticut. I am happy to refer often for vaccines. Uh, <laughs> medicine specialists and taking care of patients with holding a standard of care for medicine. Um, conversely, I receive uh, referrals from a myriad of specialists um, to help um, with stress reduction, lifestyle medicine, supplement evaluation. Um, you're gonna receive a lot of test, um, testimony from my colleagues, from cardiologists to general surgeons who are incredibly concerned with this proposed bill and how it may impact naturopathic medicine. Our training as naturopathic physicians is in pharmaceuticals, um, clinical diagnostics, but also in ethics. We're required to take a jurisprudence ex exam to, as part of our licensure. And I have to carry the same malpractice that uh, medical and osteopathic uh, physicians also have to carry, the same levels of, of insurance. Um, we also have a state board that monitors performance in our practice. While naturopathic medicine, medicine um, and naturopathic physicians have been using that term for over, at least 100 years, integrative medicine is relatively new. Often some of these alternative medicines are less um, evidence-based and substantially less regulated. Multi-level marketing, people with doctorates but no background in medicine, and other opportunistic businesses saturate this field. This is very different than conventional medicine. Allowing me to hold on to my title as a, a naturopathic physician allows us to maintain our title to help us stand apart to the general public. Why is this important? Public safety. Naturopathic physicians are the only practitioners trained in drug-herb interactions and other natural modalities, but are licensed, have malpractice, and are able to be held accountable by our state boards. If our title is taken away as physician, a person with a doctorate in sociology could run a nutrition program and would have the same status in the gen general public eyes. No offense to sociology professors, love them. Um, we'll be lost in a sea of, of natural practitioners and we won't stand out with having the standards that, that the state of Connecticut has put in place to protect our general population. I wanna share another example. For health conditions where people are desperate, vulnerable and want anything to give themselves hope. Cancer is an awesome example of this, unfortunately. And a lot of opportunistic scenarios come up to prey on people who are scared, who are, are nervous about doing chemotherapy and those type of things. All naturopathic physicians in the state of Connecticut have malpractice, which requires us to require a, an oncologist on board with any cancer treatment that we provide for our patients. We have Excuse to me, Ms. Young, your time is complete. Thank you. Um, actually, uh, can you please finish your testimony? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So as I was saying, so we are required every year to sign with our malpractice. When we renew, we have to sign a, a commitment that we will only see cancer patients with an oncologist. What's that going to do for the general population is we are going to protect them from any other integrative. So they're not going to try to do 
other other modalities without their oncologist and without radiation, without surgeries, without special things that we know evidence-based will make a big difference for these people's lives. Every naturopath has to commit to that in order to have malpractice. So I would like to, one more thing, and we'll, we'll skip some of this. Some of this is just me like wanting to be a physician my whole life. We'll skip that. So what that's going to translate to is if someone's outside of their scope of practice, whether it's signing off on pilots or it's uh, on a pilot's license or it's practicing oncology and saying, I can cure your cancer, those people will be brought to boards. And so using the name physician will let the general public know there's a system in place to protect you. And if this person doesn't perform properly, there are boards that will oversee that. And I, I'm just nervous about taking away the word physician from that pr perspective. A couple of, I actually, it's weird to really agree with the medical societies that went right before me, because in a lot of ways we do. And then there's a couple, like the truth in advertising is terrifying for me that I'm going to suddenly be on the same level as a doctor of biochemistry, who's probably very passionate and probably more at the gym than me, but doesn't understand a differential diagnosis and that you should be ruling out a sarcoma, you know, um, I, I, that, that piece of things is really important for safety. And I really hope that that's a piece of the message I can speak to access. And if I would have two more seconds, I would love to. Well, that um, was my next question to you. Oh, thanks. Good. I was going to say, could you just ask me that question? I was one of the first naturopathic physicians that, that accepted Aetna. They didn't know what we were. They, um, we are, we are the outside of the scope when it comes to that piece of things. While we're very lucky to be um, paneled with most insurance companies, it is not a, it, it is the thing we constantly have to advocate for. And I am very concerned about losing the title physician and how that will work. How it worked for me is I was in a, a, I was working with a gastroenterologist. We were sharing space together and he was sending me patients for, and they had Aetna and they, I was like, oh, they don't cover. And so they, I had to go and get on the phone with Aetna and explain to them who I am. What, oh no, I'm a physician. See, I'm a physician. This is my license. I'm covered by some of the other part. And then we had to advocate there. So access is going to be impacted. If we can't use the word physician, we're going to, we're the same as, like I said, an herbalist and a homeopath and some very like talented practitioners who aren't, aren't physicians, aren't practicing medicine, aren't held to a standard, aren't having malpractice that are protecting the general population. That, that is a huge concern for me. I don't think that any of my colleagues should be signing off on pilot's license. If we don't have, if we can't review medications, if we're not sending our scope, if we're practicing outside of our scope, we should be reported to the boards. That's that's a different story. Thank you. Representative Carpino has a question and some of my colleagues uh, online have questions. So let's start with Representative Carpino. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I understand your concern with the insurance and I'm not here to debate that point, but I do just want to point out for the record that the insurance companies do pay medical providers who are not doctors or physicians. But my question is a little sure. different. I'm undecided on this bill. I have one goal and that is to make sure that patients have the best and easiest available information when they're making decisions. So my question to you is, is really, really simple. After hearing some of your uh, colleagues testify, when I go to your website, it lists you all as physicians, all as doctors, and then it writes your, your type underneath. How would the average individual who goes to your, your, your website know that when they're flipping under the physicians section, um, what those categories mean? Because they all say DR before your name, you all say physicians, but for some it's naturopathic. Um, and others it's different and I'm not here to, yeah. to, to pit one against the other. I'm, I'm truly worried about a patient not knowing the difference when they choose a provider. Absolutely. So there's also an APRN on that same list. And that's part of that's because I'm the web designer in my spare time. So, um, if you click on to become a new patient, it'll say, how do you want to interact with our practice? And it'll say like, if you just click on, there's that Big Apple, start your journey, click there. It'll say, do you want primary care? Do you want a naturopathic physician? Um, it, it distinguishes them before you even onboard in any way. I could, I probably should write practitioner instead of physician there because my APRN is not a, a physician. So I will, that's a semantics on my website. But if you look at that next click, it's, it's very, we, we are very different when we have our, our primary care and our naturopathic physicians so that no one makes the mistake of thinking that there's a naturopath versus a osteopath being seen. 
I appreciate wearing many hats at a small business. Um, I would disagree <laughs> that it's semantics. Um, I should, I'll, I'll, I'll fix it tonight. Don't <laughs> listen. I'm, I'm not the internet police. Um, I'm just looking out for patients. I don't want them confused. And I think we're all here today because I think we share that same goal. I think mm -hmm. we probably differ in how we're going to solve that problem. But I just asked you to keep that in mind when a patient is calling, um, they're not necessarily going to know that who can prescribe antibiotics and who can't and what their admitting privileges are or are not. So that's not a question. That's just a comment and a little bit of a window, at least how I'm looking at this proposal. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We have some other people who have questions as well, and I will ask uh, Representative Denning. Hi, thank you, Dr. Senator Anwar. Um, yes, thank you for testifying. I appreciate your time. Um, talk to me a little bit about how you interface with a patient when they show up their very first time what you can offer them, what your training is, and has anybody ever called you um, and or asked you for something that you could not prescribe? And uh, from what I'm hearing from other people, it's okay if they call you doctor, they, you just can't be called a physician. And would that eliminate any of the confusion? Um, so uh, when we onboard patients, and you can see it on our website, we will say, you know, we'd like you to establish with a naturopathic physician first. And then after that, we will basically, because the demand is so huge for primary care in the state, the naturopaths will often triage who needs to be up the list to get into primary care quicker. So an example would be if someone's got a hemoglobin A1C of 11, we're going to be like, yo, we got to get this person up the, you know, we, we, we triage, we are taking on patients as a naturopath first. So a naturopathic physician will consult them. I introduced myself as Dr. Lauren Young, as um, as any of the physicians usually typically introduce themselves by doctor first. Um, and the scope of practice is pretty um, straightforward that we are gonna take an intake, do a history, um, potentially order lab work or do any diagnostics. Oftentimes I may refer out to specialists or to other therapies that may be appropriate. Um, I'm trying to understand if I'm answering the question properly. You are, but I, I, you're, you're going the right way. I, um, my question has to do with, do you explain to them what your limits are when they come and to your office and, and what you can and cannot do for them? Yes, they are explained that not even from me, but out the gate. So our onboarding process is someone applies, they would fill, fill out the form online. It would go to one of two or three of my um, front office staff that their full-time job is to onboard patients and they have scripts for them and they explain that naturopathic physicians can't order you know can't order any medications and are focused on lifestyle and since that's such a core value to our practice that they would then start with that piece of things because what happens is that if someone wants to see the primary care first um they'll then have a million questions about their supplements and the primary care is overwhelmed like i that's what you're supposed to see a naturopath for um, that is a big part of why we onboard with a naturopath first. So they know that they're meeting with the lifestyle doctor first, so the, the, the natural doctor, so to speak, you know, the, the naturopathic physician, the term physician is letting them know that we are on the same page. We are part of the system. Um, actually I have the same admitting privileges at Manchester hospital as, uh, Dr. Vitale and one of my colleagues, um, but I, you know, I, I, at the same time, I recognize that she has a skill set that I don't have, and we have different scopes and we refer to each other all the time for that purpose. Um, Thank you. And finally, if I may ask, can you explain to me your, your training? Sorry, what was that? How, can you talk to me about the training that you went through to become a physician of, uh, or a neuropathic physician? So naturopathic physician, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, as a naturopathic physician, uh, there are accredited schools across the country. Um, the, the first two years are primary, um, sciences. So there's two sets of boards that we have to take the first, but the first two years are biochemistry, physiology, anatomy, um, all of the, uh, you know, the science-based core sciences. Um, I did a lot of my schooling at the university of Bridgeport. So actually we shared the same pathology teacher as Yale medical school. Um, and then uh, the second two years are um, clinical diagnosis, pharmacology, um, and then we are also using natural modalities like nutrition, 
um, vitamins and um, herbal supplements. Um, we're trained in all those kind of drug herb interactions. And then all the other allergies, endocrinology, gastroenterology, cardiology are all a part of that piece too. Um, I'm happy to give um, the public health committee, um, there's a comparison of essentially what we're trained in and compared to um, a con the conventional medical um, school training. So you can see hour for hour what our training is compared. It's, it's very closely compared. In many states, we are primary care physicians. Um, in many states, Vermont, New Hampshire, um, Maine, um, we are full prescriptive rights and we can be primary care. Um, in, in Connecticut, the, the scope looks different. Um, so I still have the training of the, I could go to Met, to Vermont and I could prescribe oxycodone and give vaccines and practice conventional medicine as a primary care doctor. In Connecticut, I have a limited scope where I only- Thank you very much for your testimony. Absolutely. Thank you. Next is Representative Pong. Yes, hi. Two quick questions. Um, one is on behalf of Representative Cook, um, Mr. Chair, who's having technical difficulties, and she asked me to ask on her behalf a question. May I do that, please? Please go ahead. She wants to know, Dr. Young, in your opinion, are you aware of any incidents which have prompted this conversation? Do you know if there's been any issues that you're aware of that have uh, brought us to this point of making this distinction? I don't know of any scenario where someone confused a naturopathic physician for a conventional medical physician or an osteopathic physician. Um, okay, thank you. Um, and then in the interest of time, I'll just be quick. Um, interestingly, since physician comes from the Greek physic, meaning simply healer, one of the questions, I think if I could restate your testimony, is this accurate? You believe that rather than lower the bar for treatment and put patients at risk, your designation as a physician actually holds you to a higher standard. You mentioned the licensure board, the oversight, um, the limitations of your practice. It, am I getting that correct? Do you think that the designation actually not only does it not allow you to slip under the radar and practice things that you're not qualified for, in fact, it does the opposite by holding you to a higher standard. Have I got that right? I wish I was as eloquent as you. That was perfect. Yes, absolutely. I think that really elevating naturopathic physicians and getting us in front of the general public so that they know we have this resource of integrative medicine and it's in a way that's very safe for the general public. There's accountability, there's malpractice, there's um, you know continuing education, there's licensing, there's standards that we can hold that we know that the schools that are, are accredited federally, these are things that we you know, had put in place a long time ago and that states are fighting to put these in place to protect. There's a lot of states that aren't licensed for naturopathic medicine and it's the wild, wild west and taking away this term makes it a little bit more like that. I'm on the same page as a, as a, again, a doctor, no offense, a doctor of sociology who decides to run a health group. And yes, I, I have access to healthcare, health insurance now. I know the battle I had to have to get coverage with insurance. And it does make me nervous because the word physician definitely was in my corner, you know? Thank you. Thank you, doctor. And uh, thanks, Senator Anwar. Thank you so much, Senator Slap. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, quick question. What's the difference? Um, and I don't. I don't really. I thought I knew the answer, and maybe I don't. Have. So, what's what's the difference in your uh, opinion between a physician and a doctor? Oh man, this is this is gonna be fun. My my stepmom's a doctor. She's a minister that got her doctorate, and uh, if she's watching, I love you. <laughs> but uh, so then we got. I got told that that year. Uh, that we have two doctors in the family and you're like, yeah, it's the same. And I work with people who are struggling with really life, uh, like, you know, medicine is the difference, right? Um, and, and that's the thing that we're really looking for is medicine is a physician. And I'm I'm here to say that naturopathic medicine is is such an important piece of things that needs to be there. And otherwise I'm a naturopath and and a doctorate in ministry is a beautiful thing and she does great work and she has a hard job, but I hope she's watching and laughing. Um, but so like that, that's the difference to me is that if we take about this away and I'm a doctorate of, of naturopathy and I'm a naturopath, 
that will not stand out to the general community. You're right. You know what they were saying? Like your patients are still going to see you. My patients are going to still see me. You're right. I'm going to ha- still have a, a career and I, and, and those things will still be intact. But the person who doesn't know my training, that, that switch won't flip when they don't, when I hear, oh, you're a physician, that means something. And, and I understand that that's what you're trying to protect is the sacredity of that word of, of physician. But that has been in our vernacular as naturopathic doctors since the, you know, since like for over a hundred years, that's why I was at UConn looking at pre-med and I learned that you could be a naturopathic physician and that you could, you know, bring integrative medicine to the masses in a safe and effective way. That sounded awesome. And that's what I went to school for. And that's what I want to be is a naturopathic physician. So is it, would it be correct to say that, um, you know, in the medical setting, all doctors are physicians, but all physicians aren't doctors. Uh, so in a medical setting, all, all, all physician, all, all doctors, right? That's right. right? Yeah. It's, it's like the, the, uh, the square and the rectangle thing, I right? Know, like, right? Oh. And then my, my kids are doing that and the rhombus. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, I mean, the semantics of it from that perspective in the medical community, I mean, have we had any scenarios where anyone's accidentally asked a naturopath to do surgery? I'm not sure that that's the concern where I, I would have around this. It's the general public, right? And that doctor... And I get it does not Im- imbibe the, the, the background in medicine that physician does. And that is the concern. So, um, not all doctors are physicians. All physicians are doctors though. Right. Okay. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not trying to be cute, but I mean, I think this is right. This, this bill is all about, um, semantics in a way, because we're saying that this stuff really does matter. So I'm just, I'm just trying to, kind of get a handle on it and why the, like even the term naturopathic physician, well, I'll ask you this question and then I'll, and I'll stop and give my colleagues a chance to jump in. But um, is it important, do you feel like to have naturopathic in front of the physician as a, I don't know, is it a modifier or is it, you know, like in terms of, are there other kind of physicians that we, that we um, put something in front of you know what I mean? It, like there's a distinction that's being made there, I feel like, right? Like, why is that important? Um, I mean, so uh, osteopathic physicians do it all the time too. Um, and for a while, there was a lot of, cont- in the, in, historically, there's a lot of contention between osteopaths and MDs for the same issue. Um, and then they kind of fold it into the system. And um, so osteopathic physicians oftentimes will present themselves as osteopathic physicians, not just straight physicians. Sometimes they do just as straight physicians. I don't, um, is it important to me to see the word naturopath in front of the word physician? Um, it is to me, cause I want people to understand the type of doctor I am. Um, I'm going to change my website where I, so I, I technically there is an APR in there too, but, uh, you know, I think that the point is, is that we're medically trained and that's important to have that there. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of a scenario where you would ever drop the word physician without using the word naturopathic. And yeah, that, right. that feels like semantics to me, as to me personally. I don't, I don't know. Like, um, to, and, I guess my last question is to be a doctor, would you agree? You have to either go to, I mean, in this case, you'd have to go to med school, right? Am I, am I right in that? Or, I mean, obviously, you know, there's doctors in other fields in terms of academia, et cetera, but in terms of in terms of this field in medicine, to be a doctor, would you have to go to med school? So that's the issue, right? Right there, this is the exact issue. There are doctors of sports physiatry and there are doctors of biochemistry that are on Facebook groups, are doing lectures in health groups and gyms and are not licensed, are not with malpractice and are not held to a board or any level of accountability. And that's the concern, right? Is that no, most doctors in integrative medicine aren't necessarily medical doctors or, or trained in any level of med, not medical doctors, med, doctors trained in medicine. The word I'm looking for is physician. A lot of the doctors in integrative medicine aren't physicians. And that's why it's so important to let us hold on to this term so that they understand that we, all of the things I've been saying to you. All right. Well, I appreciate your time and you answering my questions. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for Thank you for your testimony. I don't see any other questions or comments. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks. That was a workout. Thanks, guys. <laughs>
And the next person is Kathy Ludlam. Kathy, Miss Ludlam, you're yeah. next. Hello, Senator Anwar, Representative McCarthy Leahy, and members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Kathy Ludlam. I am a consultant, author, trainer, and disability rights advocate. Um, I have submitted testimony. I encourage you to read it. Um, I am going to summarize in the interest of time because I have a lot to say. And I am opposed to SB 897, an act concerning a patient's directions regarding life support systems, not because I disagree with the concept. Um, but because I believe the wording will not um, do justice to the intent, which is to make sure that a patient's stated wishes are followed and carried out. First, I want to I want to say that there is a serious societal misunderstanding of what advanced directives are. Although we all know they are intended to express the wishes of the patient, um, too often when you hear someone has an advanced directive, it is assumed to authorize a limitation or withdrawal of treatment when it might actually say they want full treatment. So I am suggesting that a bill be raised not just to record that an advanced directive exists, but to encourage people to actually read what it says. Second, um, SB 897 specifically requires the healthcare representative to honor a wish for withholding or withdrawal of life support, but it does not ensure that the healthcare representative honor a wish for full treatment. Surely this is a mistake in the drafting because that's not honoring choice. Um, and I'm sure that's what your intention was. Third, people's choices and circumstances change over time. And an advanced directive is not intended to stand alone, but to be used with a healthcare representative who can make those in the moment decisions that happen in the unpredictable healthcare journey. Um, without allowing people to override, the healthcare agent to override an advanced directive for withholding of treatment, many people will die prematurely and against their wishes because there were circumstances such as an accident that they could not have foreseen and might well have survived. Fourth, it's extremely important to choose our healthcare representatives carefully. That person should be someone we trust. They are holding our life in their hands. There are times when people have a healthcare representative who doesn't know them, and that makes their stated wishes even more important. But it's most important that the healthcare representative get to know the person, know who they are, know what their values and their thought process is so that they can make the best decision when those tough times arise. And finally, as someone who uses life support equipment every day, I struggled to write my own advanced directive. But after a time, I came to something that I was comfortable with. I included it at the end of my testimony. And I hope you will look at it. I forgot to indicate that it was there, so you might miss it but it's on the last page. And I wanted to show you that there are alternatives to the boilerplate language so often 
given to us by attorneys that just says, I don't want anything done. There is a way to nuance it. And there is a way to make it affirming of my fighting spirit, which is what I think I did. But at the same time, it does not hamstring my healthcare representative for making a decision for no care or withdrawal of treatment if that becomes appropriate later in my life. Excuse me, Ms. Lundlum, but your time is complete. Thank, Thank you. you. I was just going to say I asked you to vote no and to come up with a new bill that truly supports people's individuality and choice. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you for your testimony. Seeing no questions or comment. Oh, there we have Representative McCarthy uh, has a con. Not Representative McCarthy, but uh, Representative McCarthy. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I just wanted to thank Kathy for coming forward to give her testimony. And just so I understand it correctly, are you suggesting perhaps that we need to look uh, fuller at the advanced directive form itself to see if there's not room in that form to uh, use some of your suggestions. Thank you, Representative McCarthy. I think I have two points. Um, well, I have a lot of points, but my two main points are that this current bill that we're talking about today is only mentioning withholding or withdrawal of life support. And if the point is to empower the person whose life it is and whose advanced directive it is, I think it needs to have not that language, but just encouraging the health or requiring the healthcare representative to follow what the person said for withdrawal or not withdrawal, for full treatment, if that's what the person wants. That's what I want. Um, so I think that's a mistake in the bill. So I'm bringing it up that way. But my other point is that you can't make this such an ironclad thing that decisions cannot be made. It's intended to guide the actions of the healthcare representative, not to handcuff them, it seems to me. And then when you talk about changing the language of the state, um, if there is state language about um, advanced directives, I'm not an attorney. Um, but when I wrote my advanced directive, which you will see is very different from anything you've ever seen before, I put it before my attorney. And I said to her, make this legal. And she said, well, it's very different. And I said, but is it legal? And she said, if you put that on the bottom, and she gave me language, and you have two witnesses sign it, then it's perfectly legal. So I guess I'm not trying to change a state statute but to, um, for what advanced directives say, but to open up options so that people's advanced directives actually say what they want them to say. Does that answer your question? Yes, and I thank you very much for uh, expanding upon it. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Seeing no other questions or comments, I wanted to <laughs> thank you for your testimony. Just wanted yes. to quickly make a comment uh, because there may be a little confusion there. Uh, whenever there's a, a form that is filled, uh, there is a, a conversation that should happen around that. And then within that, if there's an option to say that the person makes a choice, um, and what, that's what the bill is saying, that that form should have the option of a choice for a person to say that this is what I want, and I don't want anybody to change it. What happens is as soon as the person is unable to make a decision, somebody may potentially say things that the patient never wanted. And that is somewhat of an abuse when a patient was competent to make that decision. And I think having that option available, if the person makes that choice, they would have that choice. And then if they don't have the choice and they don't want to do that, that's their trust and that's a good thing too. So it's it's not uh, ironclad. 
But thank you for your testimony. We have the next person on our list uh, to speak is Dr. Um, Kardis Tonser. I may have mispronounced your name. I uh, that's, that's perfect. How uh, do you pronounce uh, it? Uh, it's Kardis Tonser. Right How are you? Welcome. Thank you. Um, uh, Senator Anwar, Representative McCarty, Vehi, and distinguished members of the Public Health Committee on behalf of the 240 orthopedic surgeons of the Connecticut Orthopedic Society who are advocating for their patients, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on Senate Bill 899, Title Protection for Physicians. My name is Tarek Kardasonser, and I'm a physician and president of the Connecticut Orthopedic Society and a practicing orthopedic surgeon in Norwich. Much of my testimony uh, was already said by Dr. Amel, and many of the questions um, have probably already been answered, but I'll try to be uh, brief. The orthopedic community appreciates the committee's foresight, leadership, and initiative to assist patients in what is oftentimes an overwhelming and confusing healthcare market. Selecting a physician or allied healthcare professional for the care and treatment can be very confusing. Patients have the right to know who's caring for them, and the patient's protection bill gives consumers the assurance that if they are being treated by a physician, they are being treated by an MD or a DO with the completed level of training and education required to earn those uh, credentials. This proposed bill is a good initial step toward the goal of full disclosure and transparency for consumers, allowing them to be fully informed when deciding who cares for their or their loved one. In addition, correct and clear identification of the person administering care is a critical piece for the overall consumer awareness. To ensure uh, clarity and consistency, the Orthopedic Society respectfully requests that this bill language be amended for statutory conformity and include the deletion of the use of physician throughout Connecticut state statutes by any other profession, including but not limited to homeopaths, chiropractors, podiatrists, and optometrists. Uh, <clears throat> currently, there is a truth in advertising statute in Connecticut that addresses the appropriate and fraudulent use of healthcare professionals' titles. We see this frequently on websites and uh, on social media and advertisements as uh, we had already found one error just a couple uh, testimonies ago. Uh, this is commonplace and patients are frequently confused. Uh, the Connecticut Court Peak Society recognizes that we are requesting several modifications to the proposed bill language and would welcome the opportunity to work with committee members to ensure that the intent of the bill's language applies to all the allied healthcare professionals identified in the various statutes. Um, I will say also that uh, to answer a couple of questions that came up earlier, doctor is a title. Right, physician is a description. So the, yes, there are a lot of doctors. Dentists are doctors. Dentists are not physicians. All right, a dentist is a, a dental a medical doctorate or a dental a doctorate of dental surgery. They don't call themselves physicians. Even dentists who operate on the jaw and wire jaws and prescribe medicines and do surgery, they don't call themselves physicians. Right? They can prescribe medicines, but they call themselves doctor. And at the end of the name. The description is DDS or DMD. We have no problem with that. We just think that isolated by itself, the term physician should be used only for a medical doctor, MD, or DO. Um, I'm happy to answer any uh, uh, questions you may have. Sure. Thank you so much for your testimony. Yeah. I'll just start. I just wanted you to know that there is a separate bill because a number of other groups had reached out to us, including the nurses, on truth in advertising because the nurses also feel that uh, the title nurse is sometimes confused and, and used in a manner which is not uh, the individuals who have the training. And, and, and so there will be a separate bill that we actually voted to uh, raise as a, as a committee. Um, uh, so I, I, can you, ex because you, you have said something that I've not heard before. Can you repeat what you just said about the title doctor and, and, and the so, other Yeah, a doctor is a title that comes before one's name. So my father was a PhD of an engineering, a professor, and he was known as Dr. Cardestunzer. But at the end of his name, his description is PhD. So I'm Dr. Cardestunzer, but then my name is MD or physician. There's some descriptions, but doctor, there are plenty of doctors who are not um, physicians. Um, it's a title, like Mr. Right? In, in England, in fact, Misters are in medicine are, are I think, above doctors in their pecking order. Um, but it's a title and physician is a description. And I think it's a very important description. The, a, a chiropractor is not physicians. Right? They can't prescribe medicines. They can't do surgeries. They can't do invasive things. They can only touch from outside. Um, 
Now, we had a naturopath testifying earlier that she's a physician. I, I, I know of her and she's great. Her patients love her. But she has to call colleagues in that are physicians to do certain things. And we don't want to take away anybody's ability to access to care. The doctor's a title. Physician is a description. And I think that's important. <clears throat> Thank you so much. That, that's helpful. Uh, Representative Denning. Uh, Senator Anwar, thank you for the time. Doctor, I have a question for you, uh, and I understand the distinction. I, I'm a nurse anesthetist. I've had uh, many, many times when I would uh, call a doctor, doctor, for specific communications. And my guess, what I'm confused about is um, if it's a title and, you're, and it's your job, when every time you meet a patient, do you say, I'm Dr. So-and-so, your physician. Uh, no, because we have to wear a badge or an identification with our name on it. So mine says MD. There's a state statute saying that we have to actually have our license or our descriptor on our badge. And every hospital or healthcare institution, that's a state statute, as you know. Um, so I don't say I am a physician. It's written on my badge. I do say I'm a doctor or Dr. Carter Sunser. But the patients know who they're seeing, generally speaking, when they see an orthopedic surgeon. Now, my physician assistant, PA, he wears a white coat, and many people call him Dr. Okaboy, and he corrects them, says, I'm not a doctor. I work with Dr. Carter Sunser. I'm his PA. That's appropriate, right? Patients need to know if they're seeing the doctor. They can't tell. White coat someone talking with authority position, it can be confusing. And, I, and nurse anesthetists all the time in the hospital, they correct patients. They're all about the doctor. That's appropriate. Patients deserve to know who's taking them. The question is, if there's so many different types of physicians, it's utterly confusing. Right, but isn't it on the onus of the doctor to clarify to the patient who they are and what their scope of practice is? I think so, yeah. So how does this bill eliminate that or clarify for the patient what they may or may not know? Because you and I both know that in the hospital setting, a doctor, uh, no one knows who they're talking to, whether it's a nurse, whether it's somebody who came in to uh, clean the bed. They're all wearing the same color scrubs. They're, yeah. they're, they yeah. know, you know, nurses used to wear caps. Um, doctors were it was always known who the doctor was it was always known who the nurse was now there are instead of two professions there are 40 and the confusion is there and I would love to have it done too but I've always felt just as I've always clarified myself when somebody called me doctor that it was my job to say to them I am not a doctor I am a nurse anesthetist isn't it how does this bill eliminate that well I think it's going to try to simplify the fact that um, by removing, again, we're not talking about removing the word doctor because that's a separate issue and we, we're not opposed to the conceptually the word doctor in front of people's names. But if you're going to be Dr. Smith and you're a naturopath, then you should have NP after your name, right? You don't put MD after your name when you're a naturopath, you put NP. So if someone says, oh, what kind of doctor are you? I'm a naturopath. That's, we're happy with that. I'm a podiatrist, DPM, uh, you know, but I'm a physician comes to a certain level and the reason people want to call themselves physicians is because it imparts a sense of credibility on their profession. And, you know, I, I you know, it's, it's a stretch for a chiropractor to be a physician, in my, in my humble opinion. When you're I, talking I, to a critical care doctor, you know, in the ICU and a chiropractor, there's, they're vastly different. And I would say I'm a doctor, chiropractic doctor. Um, I'm not sure if I answered the question. Well, I, I fully understand what you're saying. I just don't understand why, since you value that the word physician, you would not introduce yourself to every single person you met as Dr. So-and-so, and I'm your physician. Um, well, if they asked, I would say that, but I think MD is synonymous with physician. And actually in our hospital, you have to have the word physician on your badge. Um, so, you know, in a People ask me, sure, but remember, physician is a descriptor of the type of profession, not my title. So I see your point, but um, it, it's not the vernacular is not to say, "Hi, I'm physician Carter Sunser." Vernacular: I'm Doctor Carter Sunser. What are you? I'm a physician, um, or I'm a surgeon. Um, uh, but I think 
to lump everybody who practices healthcare as a physician is is a slippery, dangerous slope. Because there are doctors of doctorates in APRN, nurses who are primary care doctors. They might as well be physicians too, right? It, you know, it's it's. I, I thank you for your time and your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Senator Anwar. Thank you, Representative Zupkus. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Dr. Cardis Um, I apologize if I Perfect. hacked that. Um, but you made sense to me. I completely understand there's um, all kinds of doctors. I, I like my naturopathic doctor. I call him doctor and I have a respect for physicians. I call my primary physician doctor such and such. Um, but And I understand one is a physician, one's a podiatrist. Like I understand all that. So thank you for kind of clearing that up. My question is... Um, I've heard that there are a lot of these issues. So whether it's an APRN, I think somebody said an APRN, uh, they had issues. How how do you police this? Like, so has it ever happened? Have you ever been in a situation where a patient was confused and they were given, you know, being an APRN and I'm saying I'm Dr. Zupkis and I'm really an APRN. Have you ever, ever had that experience where the pa patient's confused? Oh, oh, frequently. Absolutely. In, in my small town here, we have at least one APRN who's a, who has her doctorate and she is has a shingle outside her office and she's Dr. So-and-so and she's a primary care doctor. We also have a physical therapist in town who has a PhD and he's Dr. So-and-so. And patients come to me and say, Dr. So-and-so says, this is my problem. Mm -hmm. And I know who they are. And I have to tell the patient, well, they're not, they're, they're not a physician. Um, and um, I, I you know, respectfully disagree, or I think I'd go in that direction. Um, and I have to kind of undo what they've been told because the patients think that they're being seen by, you know, a physician with all the capabilities that I have, and they don't have them. What we're, what the Orthopedic Society would like in this bill is to have a way to actually enforce this because there isn't a way right now. I just tell a patient, don't worry about it. that person you saw is a, a doctorate of therapy and not uh, not a physician or, or a surgeon. So right. So and I don't mean to cut you. I only have a couple of minutes, yeah. so I want to continue down this path for a minute. So um, you so the APRN who's a doctor. I'm Doctor Zupkis, and I'm really um, but I'm an APRN. So when this happens, what do you do? So how do you correct them from doing this at this time and place right now? Well, specifically for me, they refer to me for a special problem with the hand or elbow because I'm a hand surgeon. And so I take care of the problem and I don't get involved with the patient's further ongoing care with her nurse doctor. Um, I'd like to, I'd like there for there to be a way, I think I owe it to our patients. So in my small world, I tell them, I correct my patient, but the patient goes back to her doctor or physical therapist thinking they're doctors and, and, and they're lost. They're confused. So so how how is this to be policed? So right now, if it happens and you don't call them out or call and say you shouldn't be telling them you're a physician, um, and I don't know if they say I'm Dr. Zupkis and, and I'm not a physician, yeah. that's just my title, Dr. Zupkis, um, how, how is it going to be policed? Are the doctors now, when they hear it, going to call whoever they're going to call, the Department of Public Health or whatever, and say, hey, you know, Dr. Zupkis is saying she's a doctor and she's yeah. not a physician, but she's another doctor. So I'm curious as to how it's going to work and what are the repercussions? What do you think well, the re repercussions should be? Yeah, well, I, I don't really have a plan for how to police it because I'm not sure it's illegal currently for this nurse to call herself a doctor. Uh, there may be, it may be illegal, there may be some truth in advertising issues, but I'm sure the State Department of Public Health could have a hotline or something where we call anonymously and report somebody. Um, you know, we could come up with a, a thorough plan, but I wasn't prepared to come up with, you know, perfect uh, solutions for that. But I think it's a very critically important thing. That you know, we have to police ourselves in, in medicine. There's ways that I can police my own colleagues, um, but I don't know how to police uh, a chiropractor who's uh, acting as a physician or vice versa or nurse or you know other allied health professionals. It's complicated. So just and I'll I'll stop after this one. So when you say a chiropractor, do you? think, and I'm asking because I really don't know, do you think I could go to my chiropractor and they could say, oh, I'm Dr. Smith 
and then continue with the, you know, the appointment. Is that sure. yeah. your, yeah, they, your, can, they mean, can do that. They can currently do that, I believe. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, okay. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Representative Zupkis, actually. That raised so many questions for me, but I, I see Representative D'Amico, and I think that raised similar questions for him, so I'm going to try to use him to be able to ask the questions that came to my mind. Well, th th thank you, Senator. I, 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 I'm not so sure that I'm going to anticipate all of your questions, but maybe one or two. So, so Doctor, thank you for coming to testify today, and thank you for coming from my uh, hometown of Norwich, as a matter of fact. I appreciate that. So, um, um, you, it, earlier in your testimony, you, you made a suggestion as to how this bill could, could be strengthened uh, even further, and I, I'm not sure that I quite understood what what the distinction is between your suggestion and what's currently in in uh, Senate Bill 899. And if you've answered that already, I apologize and and I'll I'll, I'll withdraw it. But I don't think that you have necessarily. No, I think uh, what we were suggesting is that that the word physician be re removed from all other statutes in the, uh, that that are existing already. It's very confusing. You can go back and look through them. There's uh, the reference to physician all over the place, and some there sometimes there's not, sometimes there is. And we'd say let's just keep it simple. If you have an MD or a DO, you can be physician under statute. Otherwise, you can't be. You can still be a doctor of naturopathic or homeopathic. We just want to okay. simplify it because that's what patients are expecting. That's the history, and that's what you know. It's less confusing. I see. Okay, so so I so hearing your testimony, you prompted me to, to to get you know grab my statute book and take a look. And yes, you are correct that there are statutes that refer to homeopathic physicians and and, and others, as you mentioned. So 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 your 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 proposal is to is to take the reference. It, the, the the statute reference to, for example, homeopathic physicians and just refer to them as homeopaths. Yeah. Is, is that correct? Yep. Or homeopathic doctor. Ah, okay. Um, um, okay. Um, I won't comment one way or the other. I just wanted to make sure I understood your uh, you. your, your suggestion. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah. And I'm Thank sure you. Senator Anwar will now uh, 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 pepper you with uh, further questions. <laughs> Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Um, thank you, Representative D'Amico. Uh, so again, um, uh, Dr. Kardistone, sir, thank you for your testimony. I wanted to just explore a little bit because there's long-term impact with right now what's happening is that um, for the patients that, and that, that we are hearing from or interacting with, they are getting extremely confused with everybody's a doctor, but also at times the doctors don't stay in their lanes, or the, the quote-unquote doctors. Uh, for example, uh, a doctor who's a doctor of chiropractor, uh, they may actually move away from their lane or at least anticipate to move from their lane. Um, uh, an uh, optometrist doctor, they may want to move away from their lane and then do something else. And that's what adds to the confusion. And then how does that reduce the future of medicine and anybody who wants to actually go through medical school when there are so many other paths to create confusion on the title doctor, and, and that's why relevance to physician becomes even more relevant. No, I would agree. So you're just you're making this distinction between doctor and physician. And you know, we would agree that it, it, it's gonna be it would be impossible to remove the doctor title from a, a lot of healthcare providers. Um, we're not su su suggesting to, we do that, but physician should be you know, limited use. It can't just start being used all over the place um, just because someone thinks they went to a medical school um, or, 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 or just, some, it, it, we're not looking for access to care. We want access to care. We want naturopaths and chiropractors. We refer to chiropractors all the time. Uh, this is not something we hire podiatrists. We, we work together with, uh, with um, all these specialists. We just think that physicians should be limited. And patients demand that and expect it. And it's historical context. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Seeing no other questions or comments from my colleagues. Oh, there is one, actually. Uh, this one. Go ahead, no. uh, uh, Representative. Um, I'm just trying to understand. Initially, the confusion was the use of the word doctor with some of the people who had gotten doctorates and whether they were an APRN or, or some other um 
physician in a hospital setting. Um, now we've moved on to dropping the word physician unless the person is a medical doctor. So for the naturopaths that have used this for over a hundred years, then they need to drop that. Am I understanding that? Um, you're asking a question of me or? Uh, I'm, I'm just asking of, of the doctor here. Yes. Well, um, I'm not aware that naturopaths have existed for 100 years as a as a formal profession, nor am I aware that they've been using the word physician for 100 years. And you're, possibly you're correct. I, I, I don't know. Um, we're not trying to remove them from anything that they do. We just want truth in advertising. And just because they decided that they're going to be physicians, I think is is a little bit um, not completely accurate because then everybody's a physician. A nurse is a physician, a primary care nurse is a physician, and then it gets confusing to patients. I mean, oh, I, I'm in total agreement yeah. with you. I just was, you know, taking in the testimony of some of the people that were naturopaths sure. and was looking into what they actually called themselves as physicians and, you know, just removing that word and the uh, implications that it would have for that field. I That's suspect awesome. it won't have any, you know, they can be doctor and of some sorts and NP, naturopathic doctor, doctor mm -hmm. pod podiatry medicine, DPM. You know, we're not taking their title, their license, their ability to practice or access to care at all from them. Again, we refer to the to many of these allied health professionals. Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Representative Reddington Hughes. Um I I I think uh, this was very helpful. I many of us uh, are probably understanding the depth and and, and uh, rationale for some of this a little bit better, hopefully. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. The next person on our list is uh, uh, Mr. Gregory Conley. Uh, thank you for your patience. Mr. Conley, you're on. Good afternoon. My name is Gregory Conley. I currently serve as the Director of Legislative and External Affairs for a trade association called the American Vapor Manufacturers Association, which represents stakeholders in the vaping industry. I am here today to urge you to oppose HB 6488 because blanket prohibitions invite illicit markets and the failure to distinguish between combustible and non-combustible nicotine products will lead to negative impacts on public health. Now, depending on the survey, 10 to 18 million American adults vape each month and millions of these individuals have used vaping as it's intended to quit smoking and reduce their health risks. There are also one to two million Americans who use tobacco-free nicotine pouches, which are oral products that are toxicologically nearly identical to FDA-approved nicotine lozenges and have attracted little or no attention by youth or this committee, yet they'd also be banned under this bill. The majority of these adults want flavors. Uh, the one thing that uh, tobacco-free nicotine pouches and vaping products have in common, they are tobacco-free, so there is no flavor. You only flavor you have in a vaping product that is quote-unquote tobacco is an artificial flavor. Uh, so much like cannabis users, for years before legal markets came in, they are going to seek out this product regardless of whether retail sales are legal or not. At the risk of biasing you all against me, I will admit I am from New Jersey. And in New Jersey, we have had a vaping flavor ban for about two years now. And I, during this hearing earlier, when I walked up the street to grab food right next door, there is a smoke shop also sells incense, bongs, pipes, etc. I've been buying my vaping products there. And there are dozens of locations within a few miles of me. So unless you pump constant money into enforcement, this is just going to keep popping up again. We've also heard reports New York and California that have these bans. You're starting to have trunkers, which are known in distribution circles as people who travel around with products in their trunk. No licenses, no ID checks, they're trunkers. They move on when business is done. Uh, and to close off, I wanna thank Representative Foster for her incisive science-based comments earlier. Um, on the theme of science, I wanna point you to past testimony and we'll submit it with my written testimony from Dr. Abigail Friedman of the Yale School of Public Health. She's one of those excellent scientists great credentials, no financial conflicts of interest that Representative Foster was re referencing. She previously wrote testimony in opposition to a, to a bill very similar to this, and her advice was that we need to recognize e-cigarettes offer a potential tool for harm reduction, and we need to be vigilant, 
uh, vigilant about disincentivizing youth vaping. Public health policy must respond to both of these interests. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks Thank again. you so much. I have uh, my colleague, Rep. Senator Slap, who has a question or comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Gregory, for your testimony. It, uh, is the vaping um, recognized? I mean, we, I think we know the answer, but recognized uh, by the federal government or by government as a smoking cessation um, tool? And, and if not, and I think we know it's not, why, why not? No, because what we think of as smoking cessation, which is the common way people think of it, you are no longer smoking cigarettes. The FDA's definition of smoking cessation is you are off nicotine altogether. So these products can be used to get people off of nicotine, but the way that we are studying them, the way that the FDA actually requires these products to be studied in clinical trials is not smoking cessation, no more nicotine, it is no more smoking. So no, they are not smoking cessation tools, they are harm reduction tools. Some of, uh, some folks who testified earlier, and I believe a few of my colleagues who know a lot more about this than I do, said that if they were to be um, re recognized smoking cessation tools, that there would need to be significant changes to your industry. What, is that true? And if so, what would those be? The major issue is that to get a new a novel nicotine replacement therapy product through the FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation Research, which is completely different from the tobacco division. That's going to be tens of millions of dollars minimum for one single product. So the only companies that stand any chance of ever putting a product through that process are RJ Reynolds, Altria, Philip Morris International, those that have cigarette sales to actually subsidize their vaping work. All these companies that are small and medium-sized businesses would stand no chance of ever getting their products through. And, and that's not the model that the UK follows. The UK regulates these products. You have to submit ingredients. You have to notify each member state before you enter a new product into the market, uh, ingredient list, et cetera. But they do not uh, say that because you're not a cessation tool, we have to treat you identical to cigarettes. Okay. Is your argument essentially that, I mean, we have a product that is uh, not good for you. It's extremely popular, especially among our youth, but we shouldn't take steps to curb that or to, or to prohibit it in terms of flavors because people will just find another way around it. I guess, I'm, I'm, I mean, it's somewhat of a leading question, but I mean, we don't do that with uh, heroin. We don't do that with, you know, we, we draw a line somewhere where we say, you know what, there's, th these are products are not good for people. I'm just wondering how, what's your philosophy in terms of where do we draw the line as public policymakers? Sure, it is a leading question, but it is a fair question as well. What we have on the market today are cigarettes that 30 plus million American adults are smoking. So you can't have a discussion about alternatives to traditional smoking without talking about those cigarettes. And those cigarettes are gonna remain on the market with or without this bill passing. So yet, so no, we should not just leave these products to be sold by anyone without ID checks, without extensive and huge fines for breaking the law, for supplying them to minors. But to just say that when we have 30 plus million Americans smoking, that we should take these alternatives, which by the way, yes, there is popularity with youth, but that popularity has dropped 50 to 60% between 2019 and 2022. That wasn't just COVID, that was Tobacco 21 and other measures. So no, I don't think that nicotine, which is actively legal and for sale in a deadly form known as cigarettes, is really comparable to heroin, cocaine, and other drugs that have always, virtually always been in that illegal market. Thank you for your answers, I appreciate it. Um, thank, thank you for your questions. Chairman. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Denning. Thank you, Senator Anwar. Uh, Mr. Conley, thank you for testifying. Uh, the tobacco industry settled with the federal government for billions of dollars for responsibility. Is, is, um, are the vaping companies preparing for that? Should it turn out that it um, is more harmful than we find out in the future? So one company, Juul, which was funded by Wall Street investors and based in San Francisco, they did make grave mistakes with their marketing and they have settled with numerous state governments. When it comes to vaping product companies, what we can say is that the UK government, the Canadian government, the government of the Philippines, numerous public health bodies around the world, they continue to study this issue and they continue to say 
that the, all the evidence points to no more than 5% or less the risk of smoking cigarettes. And there is no evidence that's coming out. Even the FDA, which is no great fan of vaping because of youth usage, even the FDA does not believe that there is a risk if somebody vapes and from switching over to smoking, that there is going to be negative public health consequences that are in any way comparable to if they continue to smoke cigarettes. Again, just are you prepared if we should learn in the future? Because it took a long time before we were able to document the harm from cigarettes. Are, is the industry prepared to handle the, the potential payout that they have to do if it should turn out to be more dangerous than we currently know? So the cigarette companies that also sell vaping products, they have billions of dollars of cigarette revenue. So if there is ever a settlement, then they will be well suited to pay that settlement. But we don't believe that will ever occur because we are now 12, 13, 14 years into this. And if we had the same scientific capabilities in the 1930s and 1940s as we did today, it would not have taken decades to conclude cigarette smoking is going to kill millions of people. It's only because we did not have decades of medical advancements that we were left in the dark about what the effect of cigarettes were immediately, not in 20, 30 years, immediately on the body. Thank you, Mr. Conley, and thank you, Senator. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Um, I have my colleague, Reverend, uh, I wasn't a Reverend, <laughs> Representative Kevras de Gras. I am actually a Reverend in the Universal Light Church and a Justice of the Peace. See, I need uh, it's all, almost hard to know where to start uh, in terms of your testimony today because you know, I, I can speak both anecdotally and also to the fact that you said how many millions of people are using vapes as a cessation tool. But I think the reality is no one is actually, see, you know, ending smoking. They're, they're not, if you are going to stay on the vape, okay, it's great that you've stopped smoking a, com a combustible cigarette, but now you're on a vape product, which by, you know, when you look up, okay, what's inside of a vape product, you know, flavorings and other chemicals. We know for years, like for instance, the cosmetic industry, they love to hide things within fragrance. So the reality of this, and then, and then to be so disingenuous is to say that, you know, we didn't know for years that cigarettes were harmful. Well, that was because the cigarette companies were hiding the studies. In addition to that, we have to have longitudinal studies. So, it's it, I, I it's really disingenuous to listen to this today to be perfectly blunt when the companies are on track to make 40 billion dollars by the end of this year off of people engaging in vaping so my question to you is honestly how how anyone could think that this is a cessation device or that it is in some way better for people's health when the reality is that you're just replacing one vice for another, and we have no idea the damage we might be causing, especially to teenagers who are still developing and their bodies are changing. And, we, and we've seen collapsed lungs. We've seen, I mean, in state, we've seen kids that are so addicted, they've swallowed vape pods, plastic and all. It's unbelievable to me. <laughs> I Reverend Representative, I'm not sure if there was a question in there, but I will comment on it. What we what you mentioned with lung collapses, those were related to EVALI, a condition that was caused by illicit THC cartridges. The FDA was out on front in saying that smokers who have switched to smoke-free vaping products should not go back to smoking out of misplaced fears that vaping would cause immediate lung injuries. Again, those were caused by illicit THC cartridges, not legal nicotine products. I don't believe anything said in our testimony was disingenuous. There are millions of Americans that have quit smoking with vaping. The FDA agrees that that is a positive move that is an adult smoker making that switch. And we believe we are backed by people like Dr. Abigail Friedman, from the Yale University School of Public Health. So if you wanna call my testimony disingenuous, I would invite you to have that conversation with her and maybe make that same charge about her research. Yes, that was one study that she had. That was not a longitudinal study. And so the fact that we keep referencing it and the fact that a tobacco proponent would be referencing it really calls into question the validity of that study, frankly. Furthermore, I believe that there is an entire pack worth of nicotine in a vape pod. So if you're telling me that it's a good thing for people to be on that much nicotine, depending on how many pods they smoke a day, that's the, the nicotine equivalent of how many packs of cigarettes. What, what's the, what are the long-term health effects of nicotine? 
Smokers smoke for the nicotine, but they die from the tar. They die from the smoke. Those words were published in the British Medical Journal, I believe in 1972 by Dr. Michael Russell. And those are words that guide the FDA's regulatory stances on nicotine. Nicotine is not a carcinogen. Nicotine is what keeps people using the product. But there is a reason why the FDA also says the gum, the patch, the lozenge. If a smoker, an adult, wishes to use those products long term, as long as they are not smoking, it doesn't matter if they're, you, they're chewing eight pieces of gum a day or 24. The FDA's position and the general public health position is that smokers smoke for the nicotine, they die from the tar. Well, since you didn't answer my question, I'll answer it and then I'll turn I believe it over to the wonderful chair. It increases blood pressure, it increases heart rate, it increases flow of blood to the heart and a narrowing of the arteries. So nicotine is not a health substance that we're putting inside of our bodies when we're consuming even one vape pod. So to that again, disingenuous. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for your time. Thank you so much for your very good questions, uh, uh, Representative Kevras de Gras. And I just wanted to mention that whatever was said by uh, Mr. Conley, um, American Heart Association would disagree with it immediately, and then American Lung Association would dis disagree with it as well. So, but again, I know you represent, and who has re required you to say what you're saying, and then we take Excuse that. Excuse me. Please do not try to say that I only just parrot what I'm paid to do when I've been advocating for these products well, uh, as arm reduction uh, tools for 12, this. 13 years. We, we it's insulting. Sir. Ask a point question. Of order. Or point of order, Mr. Chair. Point of order. Uh, reps. Uh, Let's stop this person from speaking further. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you, sir. Point of order, Mr. Chair. Yes. I, I just think we need to remember that even though many times we disagree with the people testifying, we have to try our best not to personally attack them, but just try and make our points to these people in, in the most Thank you. Um, uh, next professional way possible. Thank you. Thank you. Next person on the list is um, number 54. Eight, uh, Robert Brody. Whoa. Oh, sorry, Michael Madden, Dr. Madden. Sorry about that. Sorry. <laughs> Dr. Madden. Hi. Okay, yeah, you hear me all right, I guess. Uh, my name is Michael Madden, MD. I'm a family physician with over 40 years of experience in clinical care and public health settings. I'm also a paid consultant to the on tobacco harm reduction to the Reynolds Corporation. But the data I will present is almost entirely from government-funded research and any opinions are my own. While well-intentioned, HB 6488 is driven by emotion, not facts. Solid public health measures should be based on data and research, and equally importantly, they should balance the needs of the whole population, not just one age group. The bill ignores the need for hundreds of thousands of Connecticut adults who smoke to have safer alternative products. They are the population whose health is most at risk from smoking and they need access to accurate information and acceptable products. This bill does not reflect the most recent data on adult use of vaping for harm reduction and the current status of youth vaping. Here are some facts you should consider. Vaping is safer than smoking. As stated recently by Brian King, the director of the FDA Center for Tobacco Products, quote, we do know that e-cigarettes as a general class have markedly less risk than combustible cigarette products. And the Royal College of Physicians, the AMA of Great Britain, estimates that vaping is 5% the health risk of cigarettes. Second, vaping is the preferred method of quitting by adults, and they choose non-tobacco flavors 50 to 70% of the time, depending on the survey. A 2022 study sponsored by the NIH showed that 27% of smokers who used flavored vapes other than tobacco flavor, successfully quit compared to only 16% of those who use tobacco flavors. Third, vaping is more effective than nicotine replacement products in helping adults quit smoking cigarettes. In a controlled trial published in the New England Journal in 2019, twice as many vapors quit smoking compared to those who use traditional nicotine replacement products like patches and gum. And after an exhaustive review of the medical literature, this year, the prestigious Cochrane Reviews from Oxford University stated that it, with high certainty that quit rates were higher in people randomized to nicotine electronic cigarettes than those randomized to nicotine replacement therapy. Fourth, 
In 2021, the FDA began authorizing and has authorized over 20 vaping products and allowed them to be marketed as, in their words, quote, appropriate for the protection of public health, end quote, based on their review, the FDA's review of the scientific literature. Five, many believe that teen vaping is rising, but in fact, based on the National Youth Tobacco Survey, it has dropped roughly 50% since its peak in 2019. In fact, in 2022, only 2.6% of U.S. youth used e-cigarettes daily. Six, most importantly, despite the increase in teen vaping up to 2019, youth cigarette smoking is, rate is lower than at any time in the past 50 years. Fewer than 1.5% of U.S. youth smoked even one puff of a cigarette in the last 30 days. There is no gateway effect. My written testimony contains links to the articles I've mentioned, so you have ready access to the, to the latest science. I thank you for your time and attention. Thank you so much for your testimony. Seeing no questions or comments, we'll move on to the next oh, person. Senator, I have a... Oh, so does Representative Kitt. That's okay. I, um, I, I would like to um, ask you to clarify your evidence about there not being any gateway effect for these vapes. Um, being the mother of teenagers, um, I can say that in my experience, there definitely is a gateway effect between these vapes and other substances. Well, and sure. Happy to answer that. Um, so if you look at a chart compared to the percent of kids who experimented with vaping in 2019, which admittedly was 28% had vaped at least once in the last 30 days, then you would think if there was a gateway effect, we ought to have seen an increase in cigarette smoking. And that's what I'm talking about, a gateway effect to cigarettes, the dangerous product. But in fact, the rate of teen smoking cigarettes has continued to fall at at least the same rate, if not more. And as I said, in 2022, uh, only 1.5% 1, 1 of US youth were smoking at all. So there's no gateway from vaping to smoking, which, and smoking is the most dangerous product. So there is not a gateway effect, as some have alleged that if kids vape today, they're gonna to start smoking cigarettes tomorrow. There is not data to support that based on the National Youth Tobacco Survey. But if you're talking about smoking cessation and harm reduction from smoking, wouldn't an unflavored vape have the same effect as a flavored vape for that purpose? It wouldn't I think be it's attractive to young kids. Right. I, I think that's an interesting theory, but unfortunately, adults like other flavors. That's part of the attraction. As I said, 50 to 70 percent of adults who make that switch from a tobacco flavored cigarette choose a either menthol or other flavored vape product. So but they, as another, another witness stated that you know, we had flavored cigarettes in the past and we banned them because we knew that they were attractive to young people. And in the interest of their public health, we no longer sell closed cigarettes. Well, well I'll, I'll reference what I said at the very beginning. We need to balance these issues. And the most important people, frankly, in the near term, we need to worry about are adult smokers. What can we do to get them off the deadly product cigarettes? And if we have lots of options like different flavors that are attractive to them, we have more of them that will make that switch. As I said, 50 to 70% of them pick a flavor other than tobacco. Fewer of them are gonna switch if they don't have options. Thank you so much. Representative Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Dr. Madden. Um, I have no disparaging remarks. I just want to thank you for your testimony and for the thank links you. that you provided in your testimony. It's very helpful. Um, I think these public hearings, we need to learn and get as much information as possible. And if I'm allowed, Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to ask this question because uh, it was mentioned previously about gateways to other drugs. Isn't marijuana a gateway for our young children? You know, the, the, the gateway issue is, uh, reminds me of the, the Reefer Madness uh, movie from way back, or people who said, well, geez, people who drink milk, a lot of them smoke marijuana. You know, there's associations and then there's cause and effect. And I think that's the key thing that we need to look at. And we need to look at real data because it's an interesting theory to think you start vaping and may go on to cigarettes, but actually kids don't. 
if they if they go on to any regular use, it's going to stay vaping based on the data that we have from the National Youth Tobacco Survey, which questions kids every year, and and really was the genesis of a lot of the concern about vaping back in 2019, when the percent who experimented with vaping had it at least once in the last month went up to 28 percent. Fortunately, that number dropped to a low of 11% in 2021, creeped back up just a little bit last year to, 20, to 14. But again, that's experimentation. That's not regular use at a level where you become a dependent user. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, thank you, uh, Dr. Madden. Um, I guess we have a lot of reading to do, all sorts of statistics and facts. I'm happy thank to follow much. up with you if you have follow-up questions, and I think you'll come Thank you. We have one more question. We have uh, Representative Reddington Hughes. Oh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Madden, I just have a question on, you know, with youth uh, and procurement of these vapes. I mean, are there any statistics on the enforcement um, of, you know, the places where these are being sold and how that can kind of dovetail into all of this? You know, I, I testified uh, to the Connecticut legislature a couple of years ago when you were considering the T21 laws and fully supportive of that. Um, you know, many of those uh, laws and every one of them differs from one state to the next, unfortunately. So I, I think it's hard to make general statements about that. Some do have penalties. Some do. Most of those penalties tend to be financial and then pulling of the, the license of that entity to uh, to do it. But the level of enforcement really is going to depend on what you might write into a bill to support the cost of that enforcement. And one and one last question: Are there any states that have successfully implemented that? A, a lot have done it. I, I have to be honest with you and tell you, I don't have data on who has done a great job of, in, of enforcing their uh, their laws and and relative to others. I do know that some do. I do know that. Some uh, have pulled people's licenses, but I, I, I'm, I'm a big data geek, so I, I don't have data to answer that question specifically for you. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for your testimony. We will move on to the next person on our list, which is Dr. Robert Brody. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dr. Robert Brody. I'm a licensed naturopathic physician practicing in Fairfield County in Newtown, Connecticut, and I oppose Senate Bill 899. First, I would like to make it clear to the community just what a naturopathic physician is. Just like an allopathic physician or an osteopathic physician, we are licensed medical providers. Instead of having an MD or a DO after our name, I have an ND after my name. Naturopaths, as some of us call us, are Western medicine physicians like MDs and DOs. Naturopathic medical education is accredited and federally recognized. Naturopathic medical schools have, have the same cost and rigor as allopathic and osteopathic medical schools. Aspiring naturopathic physicians must pass board certification exams to earn their license. We're required to take state law to take continuing education courses like MDs and DOs, and we are licensed and carry the same level of malpractice. We uh, have been licensed in the state of Connecticut for 100, over 100 years as naturopathic physicians under the Department of Public Health. We have the fancy license law that we pay every single year. Like all healthcare providers in the state, our first responsibility is to help people. Under Chapter 370, we use the title naturopathic physician to distinguish ourselves from other types of physicians, such as allopathic physicians, otherwise known as MD, or an osteopathic physician, otherwise known as a DO. Just like these providers, we follow all the directives from the Department of Public Health. Removing the word physician from naturopathic doctors strips them of our hard earned rights and reduces our medical capacity to that of a doctor of education or a doctor of physics. Both prestigious degrees, but lack the supervision and licensure of the Department of Public Health, as well as lacking malpractice and medical training. This puts the people in Connecticut at risk as it opens up the possibilities for patients being treated by individuals without the standards and training required of a physician. And speaking of the risks, naturopathic physicians are medical providers uh, trained extensively in drug herb interactions. It has been reported that over one third of Americans are taking over the counter supplements. Maintaining physician status and healthcare access to NDs means giving the general public physicians that are trained in these supplements, as well as pharmaceuticals, 
uh, without these physicians as a resource, people uh, will still utilize supplements or try fad diets, but their resources will be the, the clerk at Whole Foods or their friend, Facebook group, et cetera. Let's keep our community safe. Thank you for all the committee members for serving our great state. I'm open to questions. Thank you so much for your testimony. Seeing no comments or questions, uh, we will move on to the next person. That is uh, Ms. Loretta Wilson. Thank you so much for your patience. Welcome. and. Uh, Unmute yourself and go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. With all due respect, greetings. My name is Loretta Wilson. I'm in Michigan. I oppose SB 898. An old familiar phrase is force is always met with resistance. Um, I, my comments are not memorized, so I'm going to be reading. I'm a survivor of 60 documented electroshocks. Unfortunately, memories of my life events were grossly compromised, so a major portion of those memories did not survive with me. ECT may temporarily interrupt a depressive episode, but it cannot correct or cure it. My testimony in part was registered with the FDA during in January 2011 meetings that were held in Gaithersburg, DC. It is imperative that duration of benefit become the priority for every ECT recipient. History shows the benefit is extremely limited at this time. According to Johns Hopkins Medicine, quote, although ECT is effective, its benefits are short-lived. For this reason, Patients must take antidepressant medication after ECT or may continue receiving ECT periodically to prevent relapse. The statement is located on their page under frequently asked questions about ECT. A, provident, a Providence report by Michigan State University's professor of psychiatry states, the outpatient maintenance ECT provides a measure of relief from these symptoms for one to two weeks. The report date is June 16, 2000. If you are familiar with electroshock, you know that general anesthesia um, does not anesthetize the head. The head and jaw is not included in this anesthesia. When electric current is passed through the brain, the patient instantly experiences a jaw clenching power far greater than the normal 75 pounds per square inch. The clinching is sustained throughout the convulsion. Electrical engineers repetitiously emphasize there is no such thing as safe shock. I've already touched on ECT benefit risk. I asked Google if Medicare covers ECT. Here's what I learned. Medicare pays $2,500 for each outpatient electroshock, no cutoff number is implied. ECT is very costly. Being prescribed for just 10 treatments less than a month would equal $25,000. That's a pretty stiff price to pay for a projected benefit of two weeks or less. The cost is extreme when patients' risks are factored in. The strain on the national economy is in the billions of dollars annually. At what point is enough enough? Excuse me, me Ms. Wilson, your time is complete. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, seeing no questions or comments, we appreciate your patience and, and uh, speaking to us today. Next person on the list is in person over here, Mr. James Icobellis. Thank you so much for your patience and thank you for being with us here. Thank you and um, good afternoon, distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. I'm Jim Acobellis, the Senior Vice President of Government and Regulatory Affairs at the Connecticut Hospital Association. This afternoon, I'm here to testify on Senate Bill 897, an act concerning a patient's uh, directives regarding life support. Uh, we appreciate and support the goal of this bill, the goal being to ensure that patient choice is the North Star when it comes to end of life decision making. Over the past several decades, we, and when I'm 
use the word we, I mean society in general, have, have come to um, the understanding that patient self-determination and self-choice should be that North Star. It wasn't always a smooth journey. It was, it was jagged, but, but through it all, th that has become the centerpiece. And as we uh, go on this journey, um, it's essential that we do what this committee is doing today and reevaluating to make sure that the law continues to effectuate patient choice. Uh, but we need to be very cautious when we do this because we have developed a set of interconnected and interwoven statutes, about 25 of them, that effectuate this role of advanced, dec advanced decision making. I'm, I'm here today to talk about some specific language in this bill, which I knew I had to come here when I gave it to three or four different health attorneys and they all told me it meant something different. So we need to, I think, clarify on lines 41 to 43, when we say a healthcare representative appointed to this section may not overrule or otherwise revise the, the directions. And then it goes on to say, or a person orally communicated something to the physician. We are unsure whether or not the healthcare, the individual has a healthcare representative and other legal documents, um, a, a DNR or a living will. And then how does these do these oral statements then arise to take precedence over these documents? Or are these cases where there is a healthcare representative but not other documents? Or what are these statements that have been made, but they don't arise to the level of withdrawing or taking back a living will, a DNR, or a health representative? So we can look at it a variety of different ways, but, but what we know is that language we think needs to be clear so the patient's choice can be effectuated. So we're, we're here to say that we're work, we want to work with the committee to, to make sure that we get this right, because this is more than an academic exercise, because these conversations happen every single day in every single hospital across the state, and we need to make sure that we get it right. And it's specifically crucial when we talk about oral statements. Um, and you'll hear doctors, as you know, Dr. Anwar, when we talk about the sister from California who comes in after the uh, uh, brothers and sisters in the state are working with their parents. Uh, how, do how do the statements, the oral statements fit into this patchwork and under what circumstances? So we're happy to work with the committee, but we felt it was important enough to come in and highlight that language and uh, offer our assistance going forward. Thank you. I appreciate your uh, looking at this from that perspective. Um, ha have you heard from within your network that there's an issue where at times um, patients previously written documentation of their views were not followed by family members and, and they received treatments or support that was against their will? I, I think it's fair to say that when we get to this, the someone's end of life, having family members who have had different conversations with other family members, um, some family members being involved in the creation of the healthcare representative more than others, um, that clarity is not always there. Clarity needs to be there. I mean, let me give you sort of an, uh, an example. I have uh, three sisters and I have two that live in, um, in Connecticut. I have parents who are, um, in mid 90 and uh, late 80s and we we have conversations and there are conversations that my father and my sisters and i have about oh i'd like to be around to see x do those what do those conversations mean to me versus one of my sister who may be on a phone does that mean that they want to revoke some of the the formalized living documents all of this is a sort of a daily conversation and I think to your point not always always clear um as when you get to the sort of this stage in life it is really hard it's really hard to have the conversations so I, I think the best answer to your question is yes there is there's always the need for more clarity but we need to make sure that what we do here today doesn't add on what is going to be today tomorrow and down the road difficult conversations. 
So theoretically speaking, if if uh, the the forms that we have for the the advanced directives, if there was an option available in those existing forms to say, depending on the individual circumstances, um, they may be able to have that uh, opinion, and they can actually check mark or address or write to that that their wishes are final and they don't want the healthcare proxy to change them should they not be able to make a decision? Should that option be an option for people in the state? Well, I think, I think that tr the, the, your goal here is to make that clear and final, but these documents sometimes are created five, 10, 15 years prior to being implemented. And science has changed, medical care has changed, um, which is the reason the healthcare representative is part of this conversation, because they are someone that you trust to make these decisions when you can't, trust the, them to make them in gray areas. Um, so I'm not sure, I would have to think about that, but part of, part of the problem is, you make a, a living will, you make a DNR, you make a, um, a healthcare representative, and you put those documents away and you put them in the safe and you tell your kids where they are. And that could be 15, 20 years. And medical care changes so much in that time, which is the need for the healthcare representative. So I'd have to think about it, but I think that the grayness about it may be concerning that the healthcare representative may be in areas that aren't always black and white, and how do we deal with that? Very fair answer. Uh, Representative Palm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hi, Jim. Thank you so much for being here and for your sensitivity and uh, in handling this very difficult subject. I know from my own experience um, as healthcare representative for my mother and mother-in-law, it can be terribly difficult to make decisions and any nuance is really not not our friend um these things need to be put in in very tough terms so that other even well-meaning forces including within a family can't come and change them um so thank you for for understanding that my question to you is do you believe that any lack of clarity is also exploited, whether intentionally or unintentionally, by a hospital? Does the care vary from facility to facility in that regard? I don't think I would ever use the word exploited. Um, I think the lack of clarity and the, la and the increased, I shouldn't say increased, the number of individuals that are involved in this conversation, when, when an individual gets to the end of the life, makes it challenging. And uh, I think that that hospitals and physicians are very cautious, which is why we have the ability to go to the probate court. Um, and why I think that, that you see that more often than I think we would like, that people do go to the probate court because of that um, uh, sort of lack of specificity. So let me let me just rephrase the question in a more positive light. Would more clarity help doctors, physicians, hospitals, healthcare facilities do the right thing, do the intended thing? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, Senator Marks. Um, thank you so much, Chair. Um, so I am a nurse and this is a very difficult subject. I mean, we kind of just put acronyms to everything. You're a DNR, you're a, um, you know, CPR only. I, I talk to patients about it every day. We have to ask our patients when we admit them, um, what are their uh, wishes if they have a living will? Most don't even know what a living will. They think a living will is like a, live, a will that I'm leaving my house to, to my kids. And they'll say they don't want anything done. And then I'll say, if you were to have a heart attack right now, would you want me to do CPR? And they say, yes, absolutely. Um, I, I, I see the, the meaning of this bill because I have a very detailed um, living will and I have a conservator so that my four children don't have to fight over what we're gonna do um, when, if, hopefully in a long time. But uh, I, 
I have prepared, if, if I was to be put on a ventilator when I have made it very, very clear, I did not want it because one of my kids came in to the hospital and my conservator wasn't there. And they said, oh my God, you have to put my mother on that ventilator. I, I mean, that was my wish. So I do see where this bill is coming from. I think the biggest problem with all of this is that healthcare professionals and elder care lawyers and senior centers aren't discussing this, the, the importance of having um, living wills and advanced directives. And I think if it really was presented at senior centers all the time with really good classes, and that if you are a DNR, you have to wear that orange bracelet. I know it's an ugly orange bracelet, but I tell my clients that really our DNRs, that if you don't have that orange bracelet on your wrist, that's not fair to the firefighter or EMS that comes in and they are going to do CPR unless they see that orange bracelet. And there's probably a lot of people here that are saying, what are you talking about an orange bracelet, Martha? So I, I think we have so much more in education that we have to do with this subject. Um, but I think this is a great way of starting it. And um, I haven't decided what I feel on this yet. I just know that I hope my healthcare directives are listened to uh, when that time comes. Thank you, Senator. I we agree completely that as much education and as much conversation, these are hard conversations on what it really means, what a DNR really means, what an advanced directive really means. Who do you trust to make these decisions five, 10 years from now? Um, I don't think there can ever be enough education around this conversation um, because the more you know, the more you know. Um, so um, thank you for that. Um, I, I'll give a little bit of a background and, and, and present to you this reason for this. Um, I've been in, in conversation with a number of uh, physicians and, and, and uh, residents who have been training. And in various hospitals within the state, um, there are instances where an individual has had um, irreversible damage to the organs and they're on a ventilator and uh, they are, there's no hope of recovery. But uh, the healthcare proxy says that keep them on the machine. And, and there've been instances that they've been on machine for months uh, and they are being artificially fed with no hope of recovery. And, and the, the healthcare proxy is going against the will of the patient who is in that situation. And um, the ones who are providing care, whether it's nursing staff or residents or physicians, they feel it's it's an ethical challenge that that they are in that difficult situation. And, and there's and I'll, I'll say this because we are having an uncomfortable conversation, so might as well make it really uncomfortable. <laughs> and and um, when you talk to the hospital systems and and the hospital systems, they will have a lawyer who'll come in who say, well, the dead patient doesn't sue. It's the living relatives of the patient who dies they sue. So let's keep going. And and I mean I'm I'm making it too simple, uh, but that's part of the challenge. Is that in the midst of that challenge, the patient is the one who's suffering. And at times, that person who is making the decision on behalf of the patient is not physically around either to make our lives more challenging. And in, in some of those situations, this was a story one of the residents told me. Very emotional. And, and perhaps this person may come and speak to this, but these are the scenarios that there may be an opportunity to prevent that from happening and then have somebody get that instance when they know that the person who is going to be the next of kin, uh, who's gonna make the decision are incapable of making that decision. And it's not that they're doing it for a bad reason, they're incapable or have issues that are there. So that's the, the challenge and I think there are cases happening enough times that people feel that there's an opportunity to see if there's a fix for it. I, I think my first response would be, I would hope there would never be an attorney that would come in and say anything close to that um, because they shouldn't. Um, but I think where we need to continue to have the conversation in the education, especially with new physicians is, their understanding of where an individual is on the journey toward the end of life is different than where the patient's family probably is, right? Um, 
and how do we deal with those types of situations? Um, and as I said, when you are um, going through that as a patient um, and patient's family member, it's hard to deal with what you know in your head versus what's going on in your heart. So we have to be able to balance, I think, balance those items. Um, and it gets even more complicated if you're fortunate enough to have several family members around. And all of us who know with brothers and sisters, we're rarely on the same page, right? We try to be in those situations, but we come at it, we come at things really differently. So it's so it it it, it is it is all part of this. Um and I think Representative Palm conversation about education and where an individual is in the hospital in this end of life uh, journey. Um, we, I think, as I said before, the more we know, I think the more we know, but it's still going to be hard to uh, balance the head and the heart. This is very helpful. Thank you so much for, for your testimony and, and answering some of our difficult questions. Wait, wait, we have one. Oh, sorry. We have uh, <laughs> represent uh, Burger Jivalo. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. But thank you for your um, insightful comments. I think um, a number of my colleagues and you have brought up uh, the very um, large elephant in the room, and that is a, in our society, we don't really like to talk about these uncomfortable things. And death is that the last on the list of things that we're going to discuss with our family members. Um, one of the concerns that I always have when we talk about living wills and um, medical directives is that to put something in writing has a cost. So we are overlooking the members of our community who cannot afford to access whatever um, attorney or even online sites and fees and that kind of thing to get this um, type of language in writing. So I just have a question that you may or may not be able to answer about um, physicians themselves, whether this could be part of the conversation in an annual physical. Is this something that down the line could be um, part of your medical record? This is what I wish in this circumstance. Could there be a questionnaire checked boxes, that kind of thing. Could it be that simple or is that putting entirely too much um, pressure on a doctor to know that they are um, hearing clearly what this or asking the right questions to get to that answer? I think we know the amount of time that you have with your physicians, unfortunately, is is limited. But I've noticed personally that as I've gotten older, the conversations have evolved. Have have we gotten to that stage yet on, you know, on on a living will and that that we haven't, um, but I don't, I don't think, I think the more conversations we have in the more different settings, where whether it's the senior setting or with your or with your physician, um, can help this. I mean, as I was preparing for today, I went back in my head and went. Okay, I created a, my wife and I created the will, we created the living will, but that was when my son who was now 27 was much younger, so we'd have to do that, is that even, even when you, life moves on, and sometimes you don't keep up with it, so the more I think we have the conversation, the more it's going to trigger me to say, wait, do I have the representatives, do I have the DNR, and if simply that conversation in your physician office triggers enough to increase the number of individuals who have expressed their will um and I, and not the living will but expressed their will or or their desire I think we're moving in the right direction because the number is I think Dr Anwar will tell you of individuals who have these documents is low and I think I read somewhere it's probably under 40 percent 30 percent of people that have all all of this um and it comes you usually it has it when your parents get to be a certain age and you start to think, oh, I think we now have the conversation about the car keys. We now have the conversation about this. Have they done all that? These these conversations make the car keys conversations much easier, right? And the car keys is an easy sort of one com compared to these. Um, so the more often we can start this conversation in the more different places, I think we'd be happy to look at and consider how how to do that. 
Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Representative Nicole, uh, uh, clear this detra. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I think to everybody's point, it's this is it's changing and we need to make sure because this is a very hard decision that a lot of us, some people make the decision maybe in their 30s and then it could be 30 or 40 years later when when that time comes. And then you have your wishes at 20 or 30, but your family decides, no, I'm not ready to let them go. And I think it's important for physicians and doctors to have that constant conversation with their patients to say, are you still on the same page? Is, is, your, is your living will, your advanced directive, are, are they all still the same? Do you like them where they are? So in case they, people start to change their mind, there's always that conversation going through. I think that's that's really important as, as far as that. And I appreciate all your comments on this. Thank you. And, and medicine has changed, right? Medicine has changed from when you created something 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. If you have a family history of something, and now medicine has changed to really make it something that's chronic as opposed to terminal. Exactly. Right? That's a completely different conversation, completely different thought process. But you're right. You have, we have to, we have to keep, keep doing it and exactly. keep having the conversation. Thank you for your testimony. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chair. My honorable co-chair has a question and comment. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate this conversation. It is, um, there's a lot to it. And I appreciate you noting that sometimes we've made these documents a long time ago. The military requires when your spouse deploys or when you deploy to create these documents. So I'm realizing I had that done when I was quite young. So, <laughs> and certainly things have changed, but I want to just ask you a question specifically about, um, the part that you referenced in your testimony lines, um, 41 to 43, about the oral communication. And in the language in the bill, it's that such person orally communicated to a physician, healthcare provider, or such person's healthcare representative, legal guardian, conservator, next of kin or designee under section 156R and, and were made part of such person's medical record pursuant to. So you, you are concerned about this piece. And I just wonder if you can be a, even a little bit more specific about what in that, is there a specific suggestion that you might have? And I know we can talk about this offline, but um, just if you can speak to that, that would be great. I, I think the example here is, is saying there is the individual has a health care representative, right? That's the first part of the section. They have a health care representative. And this says they may not change or overrule the directions related to life support um, that are set forth in a, in a document, a living will, or that they've orally communicated. So the question becomes, if the individual has a living will or a DNR, what are they orally communicating that's different and when did they orally communicate it? Did they orally communicate it prior to creating the document? Did they co communicate it afterwards? Was it, um, because these documents are created with formality, which is, which is important, but we also know that you can revoke a living will in a DNR by just saying, I want to revoke it. So this language doesn't do that. It doesn't rise to that level. So what is it, right? If it doesn't change the living will of the DNR because it doesn't rise to the level that automatically revokes it, what is it and, and what kind of position are we putting the physician in? Versus, or is this someone who does who just has a healthcare rep and doesn't have any of these documents, and they've made a decision and had a conversation with their physician, and it goes in the medical record? That un, that lack of specificity on what is this circumstance that we're trying to get at, and is it in the right place under these twenty five? different sections. So I think the conversation with uh, um, Senator Anwar was helpful in beginning to think through just what we're trying to get at, and then come back and say, yeah, there is language to do it, but in this this whole scheme of 25, it may be clearer to do here. So I'm going to take it back to try to understand 
specifically, and we'll probably need further conversations on just the circumstances that we're going for. Make sure we get that really clear. And then how do we do it? And do we have to do it in one section or five or six? How do we make sure that it is clear as possible? I hope that was a little more helpful. Extremely. And I know I'm I'm putting you on the spot and, and it kind of, it is full circle back. It's this is a very complex conversation and we will have to continue it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We could probably keep you here all night, but we have other people who need to speak. <laughs> Thank you for your Thank testimony you. Thank you. And, and your good, good, important conversation. Next is uh, uh, Mr. Jordan Fairchild. Thank you so much for your patience. We look forward to hearing your testimony, Mr. Fairchild. You're, I know you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. So there's something not right. Can you hear me now? Yeah, now we can. Oh, okay. I apologize. I'm in my car. Um, okay. Uh, good afternoon, Senator Anwar, Representative McCarthy Vahey, and distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Jordan Fairchild. I live in Hartford, and I am the coordinator and community organizer for Keep the Promise Coalition, which is a grassroots group of Connecticut advocates with lived experience of mental health conditions, addiction, and disabilities. Um, Keep the Promise Coalition is opposed to SB 898. I do want to just say thank you for um, making the commitment to adjust that language um, to preserve the role of the probate court in this process. We are, however, opposed to the idea to extend the length of the court order authorizing ECT to 90 days. Um, a lot can change in 45 days and even more can change in 90 days. It's entirely possible for a patient to regain the capacity to consent to treatment during that time um, and decide not to consent to ECT during those 45 days. It's even more possible during that 90 day period. Um, we are talking about involuntary treatment and we need to take much precaution, uh, as much precaution as possible to make sure that the individual receiving treatment uh, is actually receiving treatment that they would consent to if they could consent. Um, in other cases of forced treatment in Connecticut, the court is at least required to appoint a conservator to make specific medical decisions uh, and go before go through the informed consent process. But for ECT, that's not required. And therefore, no one has to give informed consent for the procedure to be forced on someone. This is one of a few reasons why it's actually easier to force someone to undergo ECT in Connecticut than it is to forcibly medicate someone. There's also no biological test to determine whether someone is even incapable of consenting to ECT. I'd just like to remind everyone that's a subjective decision. Um, today, you heard from Chris Duby, who spoke about his experience with involuntary ECT. In his written testimony, he recalled knowing that ECT was not working for him, but he was telling the doctors that it was since he thought it would get his treatments ended sooner. This shows that in cases like that, sometimes even the effectiveness of these treatments is often subjective. Um, really, we need to exercise a lot more caution in these cases, not less. My written testimony makes specific recommendations about how to improve the current statutes regarding ECT and forced treatment, and we fully support the recommendations of Connecticut Legal Rights Project. Um, I want to use my remaining time to just emphasize that forced treatment more often than not does not work and it often does more harm than good. We know that in the long term it turns people away from the behavioral health system and can often be a very traumatic experience which worsens people's mental health. People can't be bystanders or worse be made victims in their own recovery and really more protections are required in this case. Um, thank you for the opportunity to submit testimony and please address the lack of due process protections for people subjected to involuntary electroshock. Thank you so much. You are within three minutes. You were articulate. You were very good and you were very patient and you had your car parked. You are superb. <laughs> very impressed. So I, I, I want to thank you for being very, very focused and, and a good testimony. Um, I don't see any questions or comments. So thank you so much for your patience today with us. Thank you, uh -huh. Senator Anwar. Thank you. Next person is number 64, Jennifer Zajak uh, with the Hartford Healthcare. Welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. 
Thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of SB 919. It's an act establishing a task force to study childhood and adult psychosis. I'm Dr. Jennifer Zajak. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and I work in early psychosis diagnostics, treatment and prevention at the Advanced Services for Adolescents with Psychosis, which here we call ASAP for short. It's an intensive outpatient program at the Institute of Living in Hartford. So, uh, to give you a little background, our ASAP Intensive Outpatient Program is the only clinical program of its kind in the country. It's the third of the kind in the world, and it's designed to support teens in a pro-social group setting, providing the most up-to-date clinical interventions and testing available. We work collaboratively with the Ola Neuropsychology Research Center as part of an international consortium who studies psychosis in adolescence, along with our colleagues over at Yale. Early intervention is critical to address the symptoms and functioning of youth experiencing the earliest stages of psychosis. Based on the most recent literature, adolescents who experience psychosis, or what we call the clinical high-risk syndromes, did not necessarily progress into a schizophrenia spectrum disorder if they receive appropriate treatment at the appropriate time. Unfortunately, there are not enough treatment programs to meet the needs of this population right now. Therefore, it's important for the legislature to create a task force to bring together relevant stakeholders to improve access to care in our state. Based on our experience, there's a clear need for training of clinicians and providers to accurately identify prodromal risk states and first episodes of psychosis, as well as training on how to treat these conditions appropriately with evidence-based practices. There are numerous medical conditions and or exposure to substances and to toxins, et cetera, that would need to be adequately and correctly ruled out as causative before moving on to the diagnosis of a prodromal psychotic risk state. We find this is often missed in the community and prolongs appropriate clinical workup and treatment. For example, we've had multiple referrals here for teens who ended up having misdiagnoses of things such as autoimmune encephalopathy, temporal lobe epilepsy, and pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric syndrome. There can also be overlapping symptoms between autism spectrum disorders and early psychosis, which can lead to further diagnostic ambiguity. In forming a task force, I would encourage the committee to consider child and adolescent psychiatrists with extensive experience working with this population, child and adolescent trained clinicians, youth and families with lived experience, and researchers in the field. Thank you all for listening to my testimony today. I welcome any questions committee may have. I, I do. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you for your patience, Dr. Sejak. Um, uh, so, so you're aware of the uh, the program at uh, the STEP treatment plan at, yep. at Yale? Um, yes. How is that different with yours? Um, great question. So we do partner with with our colleagues over there as well. So this the STEP clinic is for 16 years and older. And it's for outpatient care, which would be medication management and individual therapy. Yale, uh, the colleagues over there we work with also have a clinic called Prime. And that would be for teenagers that may also be experiencing the same things that I just talked about. And that's a research funded program as well as providing some degree of outpatient care. So the difference in what we're doing over here in Hartford is offering the intensive outpatient level of care which is a group therapy program. And that group therapy program runs for about four to six months for the length of stay. So it's much longer than the average intensive outpatient program. Yeah, uh, uh, I'll share with you a little bit of a background of why this bill is here. Okay. Uh, last session was all about uh, children's and, and to some degree adults' uh, mental health. And we had three big bills. And then one of the area that was missing in, in those bills was about uh, uh, the first uh, uh, schizophrenia spectrum disorders. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that is uh, seen in later adolescent. And then of course, after 16, 17 years of age, then it becomes a lifetime issue in some individuals, mm -hmm. but it's very treatable. And it, it's, uh, so that's why we wanted to see if we can use the evidence-based uh, uh, results that have shown that the trajectory of the life of that individual can be changed in, in uh, if we have intervention in a comprehensive manner, they can be part of our society in an effective manner. And that was the, the rationale. Can you share with us that about your experiences around the same 
So. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you for sharing those sentiments. I agree with you. One of the things that I'll tell colleagues that I work with here that are in training is 10, 20 years ago, you know, even when I was in training and residency, often what we learned at the time was once you have full episode psychosis or you're entering schizophrenia, this is a permanent thing. So even if you're a teenager and you're starting to have psychotic symptoms, this is going to be schizophrenia no matter what. And that was the language that we used back in the day. Fortunately for us, I think in our field in the last 10 years, there's been so much more research worldwide. And what we have found in our program is we absolutely for a subset of patients can prevent the conversion from teen psychotic symptoms into a full schizophrenia spectrum disorder. This is huge. This is groundbreaking. We really have a chance here to get in and identify these kids when they're still fairly young so that we can do active treatment to prevent them from worsening to the point that they need to constantly be in the mental health system. This is again, very helpful. Um, my, my colleague, my co-chair has a question or comment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you very much, Dr. Zajac for being here with us. My question is during uh, testimony you referenced, I believe that you are one of a kind here in the country and, and one of just a handful in the world. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, this may sound like a silly question, but why is that? Is this just such a new? Discovery? I think it's, oh, I think it's a great question, actually. Thank you for raising it. Uh, the way things have been looked at for some time is really to focus on outpatient level of care, which is when you a patient comes into a clinic and gets to see people individually. And that's been something that we have seen across this country that in the last 10 years, more of those clinics have opened up, which is a really good thing. But what we ended up doing here is utilize the group therapy model, which stems from the model of partial hospital programs, PHPs, which are considered a higher level of care because the teenagers needed more of the pro-social component. And so what the research that we've been doing is showing is if you're capturing the teenagers between 13 and 18 years old and putting them in a low stimulus environment where they're actually getting to do socialization in a healthy monitored way, that is preventing worsening of symptoms down the road. Why hasn't that been done more? Honestly, I'm not 100% sure. I know that there is concern about the managed care um, covering services. We've been really lucky in that we've partnered and have done a lot of outreach and networking where we, we've been able to manage our kids. Um, but unfortunately, I think there's other areas where that's not happening. Further, I happen to know there's some states, uh, one that comes to mind is Washington State, doesn't even allow in their state PHPs or IOPs, which is what we are. So that's just a level of care. It's a bundled billing service um, and managed care has not agreed to pay for that service there. So I know I have colleagues out in that state that are going to be speaking to their legislative body to see if they can even get generalized PHP and IOPs. So I think those are some of the barriers. And with that being said, some of this research has only started coming out in the last 10 years. So there's definitely some forward movement here. Thank you. I'm actually very glad I asked the question because I, I tremendously appreciated the answer and the work that you're doing. It seems um, a lot of times in our world, we think of things individually and what you're talking about is the group piece that is so important and successful. And I look forward to following your work and learning more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, have you been in touch with Vinod out of Yale? Yes. Uh, yeah. Our group and the Olin Center, our research partners work very closely with him. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure because he's submitted a pretty detailed testimony on this subject as well. And I think Perhaps you and 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 uh, he and and also Demas has done some amazing work. I, I mean, I'm, I'm proud to say publicly at, at this time that when I looked at the data on step uh, treatment and its benefit, it was uh, very fulfilling and, and impressive because um, when I work with some of the people who are in the homeless situations, mm -hmm. many of them have had undiagnosed, unmanaged conditions that have led them to be that. <clears throat> And, and and right now we have an opportunity to fix that and change the trajectory for a lot of the people. Mm -hmm. And and Demas has been working 
very collaboratively with academic institutions to be part of that solution. So I just wanted to mention that uh, uh, as a comment, and I know my colleague, Representative McCarty, has a question. Okay. Yes, um, thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Sajak, for your testimony. Um, you mentioned the ages of 13 to 18. Is there any research or is there any um, work that's being done with it? Uh, under 13, or is that not uh, prevalent at all? Also, another great question. That's something that I'm working on right now. We are receiving more and more referrals for kids younger than that age. Um, it is possible to have something that's called very early onset schizophrenia. It's not a common diagnosis, but it occasionally occurs with prepubertal children. And generally that's with children that have very heavy genetic loading, multiple family members with the diagnosis. So yes, that is a population that absolutely needs more attention. We haven't quite gotten there as a system yet, but that's something that we're looking at. Well, and I, I thank you very much for your very valuable work. I think it's so important. And also for, in your testimony, asking that we have families and individuals that can speak with lived experience on the task force. So thank you very much for being here today. Oh, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, any other questions? No, okay. Seeing none, uh, we are going to go on to Brian Lynch. Mr. Lynch, welcome. Please proceed. Hi. Uh, I'm, I'd like to thank you, um, Senator Anwar, as well as Representative McCarthy Bay. Uh, I am Dr. Brian Lynch. I'm a practicing optometrist in Brantford, Connecticut. I reside in North Brantford. I'm currently serving as the legislative chairman for the Connecticut Association of Optometrists. I'm here today to oppose uh, Senate Bill 899. Um, I thank you for the opportunity to chat and express our concerns. I also apologize to those representatives and senators who were able to join us last week and hear my, my concerns last week and have to listen to this all over again. So I apologize to you, but I thought it was worthwhile to testify again for those members of the committee who were unable to attend. Um, my opposition to 899 is that basically restricts the practice of medicine and surgery to those licensed under chapter 370, which is the medical doctor's chapter. Um, this is simply the resurrection of the definition of surgery bill that has been before this committee many times and has failed uh, for a multitude of reasons. The intention here in this bill, the way it is currently written, is to restrict the scope of all non-MD providers. Um, and that is certainly the intention. It's been the intention in the definition of surgery bills in the past. Um, it's also very redundant. Connecticut statutes already address who can and who cannot do surgery, who can and cannot uh, practice medicine. It's very clearly defined in chapter 20-9 of the Connecticut statutes. It's also addressed in my individual scope of practice. It's very clear in my what I can do, what I can't do. So again, the way in which this is currently written is redundant from a point of A, it says it can only be, we can only practice um, medicine if indeed we're licensed under chapter 370. And at the same time, it says this won't interfere in my scope of practice. So it backpedals immediately the way it is currently written, showing its redundancy. Secondly, the bill also restricts who can and who cannot call themselves a physician. It's very clear within my statutes currently under chapter 20-137 that I can refer to myself as Dr. Brian Lynch, optometrist, or as Brian Lynch, optometric physician. As long as I qualify and allow the public to know that I am an optometrist, I can use the term physician. This bill, should it go forward, takes away a bill that has been, or a law that has been in place for greater than 50 years now. Um, the other is that currently Medicare federal rules define me as a physician. 
and you look under the list of those who can call themselves a physician or are thought upon by Medicare as a physician, optometry is one of them. So the way in which this bill is written is in conflict with the federal rules governing Medicare. For those reasons, I encourage you to join me in opposition to Senate Bill 899. The proposed bill, as I've already stated, is redundant, and it attempts to further restrict non-MD providers from caring for our patients. With a looming provider shortage on the horizon, we should be doing everything we can to embrace all non-MD providers training, encouraging them to practice to full extent of their scope, not trying to hamstring them with redundant legislation. I wanna thank you very much for your time and I'd be happy to answer any questions that any of you might have. Thank you very much, Dr. Lynch, for your testimony and the clarity of your position. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you for being here with us. And we are going to go on to- Thank you. Number 66, Elizabeth Hicks. Hicks, well, please proceed. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chair. Hello, and uh, Chair and members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Elizabeth Hicks. I'm the U.S. Affairs Analyst at the Consumer Choice Center, which is a global think tank advocating on behalf of consumers. And I want to thank this committee for their time. Simply put, Bill 6488 will do more harm than good if passed. Enacting a flavor ban on vaping products will push adult consumers to switch back to smoking combustible tobacco. Sadly, 4,900 citizens of Connecticut lose their lives to smoking-related illnesses every year. Considering that studies have shown vaping to be 95% less harmful than smoking, ensuring that adult consumers have access to the vaping products they prefer will ultimately lead to fewer cigarette smoking-related deaths within Connecticut. As Senator Anwar and Senator Gordon know through their work outside of this legislative body as medical doctors, smoking-related illnesses are very serious and can lead to cancer. After being around secondhand smoke for most of my life due to family members smoking cigarettes, this past year I unfortunately received my very own cancer diagnosis, undergoing 12 rounds of chemotherapy, 20 sessions of radiation, nine cycles of immunotherapy, and multiple surgeries. And I can assure you that I would not wish this on anyone. Considering that this committee is focused on protecting public health, embracing vaping as a harm reduction tool here in Connecticut will help ensure that your citizens are much less likely to end up in a situation similar to mine. It's estimated that about 6% of Connecticut's adult population uses vaping products, accounting for over 200,000 citizens throughout your districts who have switched to a less risky alternative to combustible tobacco. Banning flavor vaping products will encourage these former smokers to switch back to smoking cigarettes, which are already costing Connecticut's taxpayers over $520 million annually just through Medicaid expenses alone. If a flavor ban is enacted in Connecticut, then consumers will likely look towards the illicit market in order to get access to their preferred flavored vaping products, where product regulations and standards are not enforced. Pushing consumers to the illicit market through a flavor ban will also be to the detriment of vape shops throughout the state, as many of their products will no longer be available. It's also worth noting that unlike vape shops, the illicit market does not abide by age restrictions, therefore making it much easier for youth to acquire these products illegally. I very much appreciate that this bill is well-intentioned, but it's important that we look at the evidence showing just how misguided flavor bans are. This committee wishes to protect public health within Connecticut, then I strongly encourage you to reject this bill. Thank you again so much for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Hicks, and I'm sorry to hear about all that you have been through. I have one question for you, and I do see that we have a question from Representative Wielander. You said you are with the U.S. Choice Center, is that right? The Consumer Choice Center. Consumer yes. Choice Center, forgive me. And where are you located? Can you tell us a little bit about that organization? Yes, so our organization is located in Washington, D.C. I'm personally located in Lansing, Michigan. Um, as I stated in the beginning, we are a global think tank focusing on consumer issues and representing consumers throughout the globe. I personally focus on issues that pertain to the United States. Thank you. And Representative Wielander. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I apologize, I'm in my car listening right now. Um, first, I wanted to just also extend my, uh, you know, I'm happy that you were doing better, that you are healthy um, or healthier now and on the road to recovery. I'm sorry you've had these, these um, health 
troubles. Um, but I wanted to address a couple of points that you made in your testimony and just say clearly, I feel it's quite irresponsible to try and present vaping as a harmless activity. We all have seen the studies. We all know that um, tobacco use and um, combustible smoking is incredibly dangerous um, and unhealthy for those who participate, but also those who are around, as you unfortunately have found through secondhand exposure. But I do not think that we can as a public health committee or just responsible adults present this as vaping being a, a healthy alternative um, in any way. So before we move forward in having this discussion, um, I think we need to be really honest and, 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 um, and real about these discussions. So thank you so much for your time, Madam Chair. Am I allowed to respond? Thank you, Representative Wielander, and yes, you may, Ms. Hicks. Thank you. And thank you for your, your both of you for your kind words and for the question. Um, I agree with you that, you know, vaping is not a healthy option, but it, what we're saying is it is a harm reduction tool. It is significantly less risky than smoking combustible tobacco. Um, we There's been a meta-analysis done by Public Health England that has shown that vaping is 95% less harmful. There's still that 5% risk, but in comparison to smoking combustible cigarettes, it is a much better alternative. And again, as you guys are trying to protect public health here, there are many people within your state who are addicted to nicotine and addicted to cigarettes in order to give them, you know, using this nice innovation tool to be able to get them off of, again, this very harmful thing that is combustible cigarettes and providing them with something that is less risky, I think is definitely a step in the right direction and would be a win overall for public health. I appreciate those Thank comments. Um, oh, Madam Chair, I'm sorry, may I? Yep, follow no, up? you may. You still oh. have the floor, Representative. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate the, those comments, but I do think that if we are going to be talking about smoking cessation tools, then we should be looking at proven um, methods that that actually do help people stop this, this harmful habit. And uh, rather than trying to portray a practice that still involves an, an inhalation of chemicals and um, often addictive substances. So um, if we are going to have this type of conversation, I think, again, we need to be clear about it. And that this is, vaping is a newer practice. Um, it is shown to be incredibly addictive, especially in young people, and has shown to have a very, indeed, harmful part, um, or harmful impact, excuse me, on um, their health. And just the way that you know combustible smoking was dismissed as a healthy alternative for different things um, back in the day. I think that as time moves forward and we see more uh, science rather than just one um, study, we will see that that vaping is a harmful action. Um, so I just want to make those comments and um, and make my my point uh, heard. And I appreciate the time, um, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Wielander. Representative Denning. Thank you, Chair uh, McCarthy Vady. Um, Elizabeth Hicks, I have, uh, thank you for your testimony. You said, and just clarify for me, that if we do away with these flavored products, that it's people will go back to smoking. Do you have any statistics or where did you get the science on that? And if so, what aren't people just going for flavor and not the tar and nicotine that comes? Uh, I just don't, I just have never read anything in uh, any research journal that proves that. And I'm just looking for any data that you might have. Yes, I thank you so much for that question. First of all, in my written testimony, you will find a lot more links to data and studies. I know there's been a lot um, that has been articulated throughout this hearing. It's been a long day, so I don't want to bore you guys with uh, more data points and more studies. Um, but yes, there are studies that do show that where the flavors have been banned, smoking increases, smoking cigarettes increases. And I think this point was made earlier, but I think it's worth reiterating. Those that are looking to stop smoking cigarettes, I mean, that should We made it all the way till 548 without having any connectivity issues. I think Ms. Hicks has- To be very much encouraged. Oh, uh, I'm smoking combustible cigarettes. 
Thank you very much. I will check out uh, your written report. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Representative Denning. All right, seeing no further comments or questions, thank you, Ms. Hicks, for your testimony before us today and have a wonderful evening. And we are going thank to you. go to number 68, Bright Johnson. Mr. Johnson, thanks for your patience. Please proceed. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Bright Johnson and I'm the Connecticut Government Relations Director for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network and a resident of Connecticut. Regrettably, we cannot support the current version of HB 6488 on the grounds that this bill doesn't address all flavored tobacco products. It doesn't go far enough. Flavors are a marketing weapon used by tobacco manufacturers to target youth and young people to a lifetime of addiction. Flavors are used to improve the ease of use of a tobacco product by masking harsh effects, facilitating nicotine uptake, and increasing a product's overall appeal. The most popular flavor, menthol, acts to mask the harsh, harsh taste of tobacco with a minty flavor and by reducing irritation at the back of the throat with a cooling sensation. Decades before cigarette companies started adding fruit and candy flavorings to cigarettes, they were manipulating levels of menthol to addict new young smokers and then specifically targeting and marketing menthol products to communities of color. A shocking and telling proof of their success is that only 5% of African Americans who smoked used menthol before they became targets of big tobacco in the 1950s. Today, that number is 85%. Any company would kill to achieve that market share. In this case, that isn't rhetoric. The tobacco industry did kill to achieve that and they continue to kill to maintain it. And finally, more than half of all youth who smoke cigarettes in the US use menthol flavored cigarettes. Tobacco use is a tragedy for the people of Connecticut and we should be doing everything we can to help people quit and prevent people from ever starting to use these products. This concept before you today is not an end all solution. It is a component of a much larger response that is long overdue. We also need to double, triple our efforts at tobacco control. We need to stop making addiction easier and we need to, and we need to stop making products people should quit using taste better. We can mitigate unintended consequences by helping prevent people from starting to use these products by eliminating their appeal, of which the flavors, including menthol, are a leading driver. We can also ensure help will be available for those wanting to quit, of which 70% of tobacco users indicated a desire to do so. The CDC recommends we spend 32 million annually on proven tobacco control programs that follow CDC best practices. Last year, the General Assembly restored 12 million for tobacco control, the first new appropriation of funds for tobacco control in almost seven years. That was a huge step last year, unanimously supported by this committee. We need more of that. We need to meet the CDC level of funding. We need to ensure communities of color that have been ravaged by tobacco use have access to programs and services to help people quit and to be able to counteract the $60 million in marketing big tobacco spends annually in Connecticut, largely directed at them. We recognize and appreciate that we're only a month into a six month session and that this bill is a work in progress with a lot of further discussion to be had. Thank you for consideration of our comments. Mr. Johnson, thank you. And you know, I have always enjoyed working with you on this issue. 70% of tobacco users desire to quit. That's and about and about 45% of them try every year, but only 5% of them are successful for any length for any length of time. Quitting tobacco is immensely difficult. And I think one of the issues is if we're going to put people in a position to where they're going to want to quit. We need to provide them with the programs and services to help them achieve that. Well, thank you for your passion. I appreciate it. And I appreciate the complexity of this discussion today, but know that we all share the same goals, which is to make sure our residents are as healthy as they can be. Are there any questions or comments? Seeing none, Mr. Johnson, I know we will be speaking together again about this issue and look forward to it. Thanks very much for your time here with us today. Next on the list, we have number 69, Michael Schoenfeld. Hello, uh, thank you everyone. Welcome. I'm sorry I'm bothering for dinner, but we're here. Um, my name is Michael Schoenfeld and I'm one of the owners of Manchester Tobacco and Candy Company. I wanna thank the Public Health Committee for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I am in opposition with Bill 6488. Let me start with something we can all agree upon. Adult tobacco and vape products should only be sold to adults, not children in any capacity. 
I do agree with some parts of the bill that the committee is trying to accomplish, but I'm concerned with some parts that the bill is making a generalization of full flavor ban on all categories which seem to target adults, not just children. Throughout the years, the focus has always been and should be on youth access, especially regarding unique flavors like cotton candy, grape soda. This bill successfully addresses that issue, but goes far further by encompassing all adult products, including all flavored cigars, tobacco, snus, adult flavor vapes, and even possible future alternative products. To make an analogy, if you have a lawn with weeds in it, you target the weeds by applying a specific pesticide. You do not apply the pesticide to the entire lawn because in the end, all you're left is with dirt. Another area of concern is implementing this bill. There is no mention of enforcement or realistic controls. I'm a visible legitimate wholesaler who has 48 employees, pays and collects property taxes, excise taxes, sales taxes, completes monthly sales tax reports and follow all statutory legal requirements. Manchester Tobacco, regardless of any outcome for any bill, will adhere to all laws. However, I truly do not think everyone will. Eliminating products with a high demand and are available outside the state will produce a huge underground market. The winners become those who do not follow the rules and have nothing to lose. Honest Connecticut companies and retailers like myself would unfortunately pay the price. These flavored products will get into the state and now be sold in an untaxed, unregulated market. In essence, the desired goal of protecting Connecticut's youth will now have the opposite effect by making access easier. As a society protect people, we have questionable products like alcohol, gambling, and most recently marijuana, which we have taken out of the shadows and into the light. Why are we going in reverse with tobacco and vape? So what do we do to solve this problem? I believe the federal government is doing this job as we speak through the PMTAs. This is a detailed regulatory process that has scientists and specialized federal employees review individual vapor, smokeless, tobacco, pipe tobacco, and roll your own products to determine if they can be legally sold in the U.S. So far, over 7 million products have been denied and taken off the market, and only 23 have passed. This process does take time, and huge inroads are taking place. It is my belief that the state of Connecticut should follow the PMTAs on all products. That will make enforcement easier and create a national level playing field for all wholesalers, retailers, and consumers. Most importantly, it will control youth access to solve the public health crisis. And finally, I also wish to continue to advocate for spending more tax dollars on youth education and retail technology. Creating a universal carding system and hiring more Connecticut agents to enforce the rules will increase the success of stopping child access. We want to protect our youth, and I'm kindly asking for all sides to work together for a compromise solution. Please feel free to ask me on your questions, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for packing a lot into your testimony. I know I tried to go through as much as I and, could. <laughs> no, you got a lot in, and I appreciate your comments about uh, spending more on enforcement and protection. Are there any questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you so much for being here with mm -hmm. us tonight, Mr. Schoenfeld. Have a great rest of your evening. You're welcome. Number 70, Patrick Fratelloni. Please tell me if I got your name right and unmute if you can unmute yourself and... We'll give you a second. You're here. There yep. you are. Welcome, please. Fratelloni is correct. Um, I am in opposition to Bill 899. I would have liked to thank you all for being here. It's been quite informative. Uh, my name is Patrick Fratellone. I'm a licensed medical doctor in the state of New York and Connecticut. I finished my internal medicine in 1991, and I finished my cardiology fellowship in 1994 at Lenox Hill Hospital. I also finished a fellowship of integrative medicine in 2005 under the direction of Andrew Wild at the University of Arizona. I'm a registered herbalist with the American Herbal Guild since 2005. I'm a professor at the Pacific College of Oriental Medicine. But most importantly, I was a professor at the College of Naturopathic Medicine at the University of Bridgeport from 2015 till its closing in 2022, where I taught cardiology, emergency medicine, dermatology, oncology, and ran, and ran clinical medicine shifts. I employ naturopathic physicians in my New York office. And five years ago, I set up a Connecticut Integrative Medical Center in Fairfield with four other naturopathic physicians. We have a chiropractor, an acupuncturist, and a psychologist on staff. 
Um, I know firsthand of their four years of medical education. And I have to say, I think it's superior to when I went to medical school in the 1980s. Um, I wanna thank Dr. Brian Lynch for his precise clarity. I do, I do not want you to restrict non-MD providers. And for clarification, it's never been mis misrepresented in my office, including our website. Our website states Connecticut Integrative Medical Center located in Fairfield, Connecticut, offers integrative care from a diverse team of practitioners with combined care of a medical doctor, licensed naturopathic physicians, nutritionists, and acupuncturists we will help you achieve your health goals. Thank you all for your time and hearing my testimony, and I will take any questions at this point. Well, thank you, and uh, feeling the Fairfield love right here. Any comments or questions? There are two of us here today from Fairfield, so thanks for being here with us and for your patience, and we appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Moving on to number 71, Guy Bentley. Mr. Bentley, please proceed. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on HB 6488. My name is Guy Bentley, and I'm the Director of Consumer Freedom at the Reason Foundation, and we're a nonprofit public policy think tank. The intention behind the bill to limit youth tobacco use is certainly to be applauded. However, the sweeping nature of the legislation does pose several problems for the promotion of public health. As has been previously said, the FDA recognizes that there is a continuum of risk when it comes to tobacco products. I would also like to clarify what the FDA regulation actually is. When the FDA authorizes a new product for sale, such as an e-cigarette or a nicotine pouch, it has to be evaluated as to whether it is, quote, appropriate for the protection of public health, end quote, meaning that the product has to provide a net public health benefit. The legislation as currently written would ban the sale of several products that have already been deemed to be net beneficial to public health. I want to give you a very specific example. Take the case of Swedish Match. Their oral nicotine snooze products flavored in wintergreen and mint are authorized as modified risk tobacco products by the FDA. What that means is that it allows the company to inform adult smokers about the benefits of switching from cigarettes to these reduced risk products. According to the FDA, quote, the claim that using general snus instead of cigarettes puts you at lower risk of mouth cancer, heart disease, lung cancer, stroke, emphysema, and chronic bronchitis is scientifically accurate, end quote. So to be clear, if Connecticut chooses to ban these products, it will ban products that the FDA has found to reduce the risk of tobacco-related diseases like lung cancer and emphysema. But as, of course, it's not the only products that would be affected. The FDA is currently reviewing e-cigarette product applications in flavors other than tobacco and menthol. A preemptive ban would remove access to these safer alternatives for Connecticut smokers that would be available to other smokers in other states. We have unfortunately seen the unintended consequences of similar prohibitions. In 2018, San Francisco banned the sale of all flavored tobacco products. A study examining the effect of the ban found that San Francisco area youth had double the odds of smoking after the ban compared to jurisdictions without a tobacco flavor ban. I'd also like to refer back to a, a comment that was made earlier in testimony, uh, claiming that the flavors in e-cigarettes are in, our, in and of themselves particularly harmful. And there was a mention of something called popcorn lung. Um, this is quite a popular urban legend that never quite goes away, particularly on the internet. But in response to that, I'd just like to quote Health Canada, which is the Canadian government's public health arm. Quote, did you know that vaping is not known to cause popcorn lung? End quote. I'm happy to answer any questions on regulatory models for harm reduction across the world or within the United States. Uh, and particularly if people are confused as to what snus actually is, I'm happy to clarify that. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bentley. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony and your patience today. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. And we are going on to number 72, Mr. Jared Pistoia. Yes, Dr. Doc, Dr. Jared Pistoia. Please proceed. Thank you for the opportunity to submit my perspectives. I'm a licensed naturopathic doctor and author practicing in Connecticut. I comment in regards to Senate Bill 899. I thank Dr. Brody for providing some of the practical facts about the practice of naturopathic medicine. 
I would like to introduce more of a philosophical perspective into the discussion. So I'll begin by asking the committee rhetorically if they believe the bill, if passed, would lend more clarity around the practice of medicine for the average person. I do realize that's been a topic that's been discussed already. One way to, to determine that would be to ask if the bill might ultimately create a more unified understanding of what medicine is, given the level of confusion previously identified in the hearing. And in this case, I argue that clarification is facilitated by unification, or as we might say, integration. And integration may begin by unifying the collective understanding of what it means to be a physician. Philosophically, all physicians are aligned by the same goal, the only goal, to relieve suffering, and are aligned in the sense that they all completed medical school, trained in the art and science of diagnosis and treatment at the doctoral level. How they approach treatment is up to them and is not a qualifying factor for the use of the title physician as it currently stands. So I ask, how does it help allay confusion if we only label an MD or DO as a physician when an ND is doing inherently similar work, receives characteristically similar training, and ultimately shares the same philosophy? It would only seem to further confuse people if we exclude an accredited branch of medicine from using the title physician. Again, I remind you that both the work we do and the training we receive is inherently similar. Since we appear to be exploring what the word physician truly means from more of a semantic perspective, I take this time to raise your attention to its publicly available definition as provided by Merriam-Webster, which may help guide our understanding. And so it reads, a person trained in the art of healing, specifically one who's earned a medical degree, is clinically experienced and licensed to practice medicine. That's what it reads directly. Therefore, to be consistent with what is publicly accessible and an accepted definition of the word physician, and also based on the training that entities receive, the degree that's granted to them, and the issuance of a medical license from the state of Connecticut, and the activities they perform, for example, history, physical exam, diagnosis, and treatment, naturopathic doctors seem to qualify for the use of this title as the public understands it to mean. I close by reminding you the preference for integrative medicine that the overwhelming majority of people I interact with hold, especially right now, and that unified language generates clarity in that regard. I therefore oppose Senate Bill 899 for these reasons. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pistoia. We You're welcome. And Representative Foster. Thank you so much for um, for your testimony today. I really appreciate um, your perspective. I I think I've been curious to ask this to a bunch of the different uh, providers who have testified similarly to you today, but I'm curious, what would differentiate you from a medical doctor that might be important for a consumer who's choosing the type of healthcare provider to visit to know is different from you and them? So in this case, it really depends, right? It depends on what they're seeking in terms of treatment. So I think it boils down to treatment. Um, I think someone's going to an allopathic doctor might expect some sort of drug-based option, whereas we offer many more options than that, but we don't have prescribing rights. So that's a pretty much the main difference right now between us is that we don't have prescribing rights. Um. So, and being cognizant in full disclosure, I'm a registered dietitian by training. I also have a doctorate. Um, I think oftentimes people are confused about where scope of one provider starts and ends, and they might start receiving a type of care from a type of provider and then choose, as, as is common in practice, for example, for someone to start seeing primary care who manage endocrinological care or might see an endo and that might become their primary care provider and no longer refer back to the other specialist. Does that happen sometimes with folks who start seeing a naturopathic provider and then use them as their PCP? It's more often the case that we tend to attract people who are sort of lost. And so in some instances, it could be that people come to us and have no understanding of what we do. Uh, but it's more often the case that people come to us with an understanding of what we do. And if they express any sort of misunderstanding, then it's, for me personally, immediately corrected because I want to make sure that people understand what their expectations should be from me. And so I'm not going to convince someone that I can do something that I can't. 
And if something is outside of my own knowledge base, then I'm it's my duty to refer them. So I hope that answers your question. It does. And you said something that's interesting so that you attract folks that are sort of lost in the provider type. And in, as I hear that, I think of two different types of patient types that I think this linguistic clarification is important for. So it's one, the people who might feel like they're not getting the type of care that they want to receive um, from their healthcare provider. And so choose to go to a different type of provider for an alternative care, perhaps something that would be considered complementary alternative medicine fitting along with a traditional um, path, but also per perhaps someone who believes that um, this type of care is a substitute for um, care. And yes, it sounds like you're saying it behooves, um, it's up to the provider to offer clarification in that situation. But I think we heard Dr. Anwar earlier testify of an example of a physician, a naturopathic physician who offered a cure for polio from a supplement form. Um, and so I'm, I'm sort of, I, um, I hear your testimony and it actually raised another level of concern for me because I do think that people often um, have very strong senses of hope for what naturopathic um, opportunities can provide. And I believe that those that's so true. There's a tremendous amount of naturopathic medicine and the type of nutritional interventions that you have that can offer significant and meaningful health changes, but there's all often limits. And so I believe the complementary space is really important. And I think that that is my understanding of the goal of legislation like this is to put guardrails so people understand what, what functions in the traditional primary care um, space um, and would understand where that care would start and end. And what I'm hearing consistently from folks testifying similarly to you is that in no way can your field provide alternatives to primary care, for example. Um, you don't have prescribing abilities. Um, and so you really don't want to be an alternative or can't be an alternative holistically to what is a physician. So I, I guess I'm, I have pause when I'm hearing this concern for this language change, but you're also saying we acknowledge that we can't do what they do. Um, and so I do think, I think people have a real, I mean, I've heard multiple people testify using the term nutritionist today, um, which is a non-regulated term, no licensures, no credentialing, no education requirements, not a licensed profession in the state of Connecticut or in the country. And so I think that what those terms are and mean and how healthcare providers like yourself use them are really important because our consumers rely on us to sort of as policymakers to make sure that those terms mean something um, that they can understand and that they can balance with. So I'm curious if you have a perspective on that and I thank you for your response. And doctor, I'm just going to ask you to be brief in your response. Sure. Well, there was a lot there. Um, I think, you know, just what I want to recognize is that it's also part of our responsibility as people to understand what our needs are and where we can get those needs fulfilled. You know, using the word physician denotes a certain set of um, education and things that can be provided, right? So not every doctor that you go to is going to prescribe you drugs, even if they have prescribing authority or not but they are going to do a history, a physical exam, maybe order labs and do some kind of diagnosis and treatment. And so I'd like to add that, for example, and, and this is the last thing I'll say, an allopathic doctor cannot prescribe any drugs and can be acting as a naturopathic doctor in, in the sense that they're prescribing natural therapeutics, but they can still use the title physician. So that doesn't really make any sense if you think of it that way. Thank you. Thank you, doctor, for your testimony and for answering our questions here today. Moving on to someone who I've known for a long time, but I'll just share a little anecdote. When I was the P&D chair, it took me a few times before I had it right when I was pronouncing my friend Donna Hamsey Karocha's last name. So Brian, I think I'm going to mispronounce your name and then you're going to hopefully correct me. Cornier, did I get it right? Close. Oh, see, I knew I'm going to have to practice a few times. I'll just apologize, but we are very grateful for your patience and for you being with us in person tonight. So well, well, please proceed. Well, well thank you, um, Madam 
Chairwoman um, and distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Brian Knoyer, and I am Director of Government Relations at the Connecticut Hospital Association. We have submitted testimony on House Bill 6488, and I will try to uh, condense that testimony in my remarks this evening. On a daily basis, caregivers in Connecticut hospitals see firsthand the impact of tobacco-related disease and illness, and because of this, CHA supports strong common sense tobacco control measures, whether through workplace policies, municipal ordinances, or state and federal laws. CHA supports the flavoring ban contained in House Bill 6488 and asks that the committee amend the bill. Specifically, we ask that menthol flavoring be added to the list of flavors, uh, flavored products prohibited for sale in the state. We know the best way to reduce health associated harm caused by smoking is to abstain from smoking altogether or at a minimum, delay the start of smoking. We also know that added flavoring to tobacco, vapor and nicotine products entice more users and makes an otherwise objectionable taste more palatable and enjoyable. This is why we believe banning flavor, flavoring in all tobacco products will complement the recent tobacco control initiatives passed by the General Assembly, um, such as the passage of T21 and the reestablishment and funding of the state's tobacco trust fund. We understand that there will be uh, continued conversations on this bill, uh, and we look forward to working with you to ensure the passage of this bill. Thank you again for your time this evening, and I'm happy to try to answer any questions you may have. I appreciate that. Mr. Knoyer. see, I'm, I'm practicing. You can just say Brian. <laughs> well, I'm going to practice till I get it just right. Um, I actually do have one question for you. You've heard a lot of testimony today because you've been sitting here, perhaps longer than some of us, actually. Um, and there's been a lot of conversation. How, what's your reaction to some of the back and forth as we listen to things? You know, sometimes more than one thing can be true at the same time. And we have to weigh those things. Um, but I just would be interested to hear your response to the testimony as it has unfolded today. Okay. Um, thank you for the question. I will let everyone's testimony stand on its own. Um, and I will not address specifics, but I will say, um, you know, the caregivers in Connecticut hospitals see the end result of using addictive and dangerous products. Um, we believe uh, that this is not, this bill in and itself is not the be all end all, but one tool in the toolbox to help people live healthy and productive lives. We understand that the, you know, we're faced with flavored vapes and flavored tobaccos today. Tomorrow, there'll be other products that are highly addictive and harmful to people's health. Um, we again feel that this is a tool when coupled with you know, the work that hospitals and other community providers are doing in the, uh, relative to smoking cessation will go a long way in helping people to live healthier uh, lives. Thank you very much for that very wise and judicious answer. I, I appreciate that, but I, I also appreciate what you added. Seeing no other, oh, to my esteemed co-chair, Senator Um, I don't have a question. I just have a comment. Thank you for your patience and listening through all of the, the testimony today. And, and uh, you were physically here, listen to each everyone, and uh, you're very, very focused, and it's quite uh, good to see you. And then thank you for your insight on this. Thank you, Mr. Cornell. Th thank you, Senator, and we'll remain uh, available to the committee as this process unfolds. Thank you so much. Thank and you. You can count on us being in touch with you. Great. Thank you. We will go next to Dr. Carl Moeller, who is with us via Zoom. Dr. Thank Moeller, you. here you are. Please proceed. Thank you so much for having me. Good evening, uh, distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. So I'm Dr. Carl Muller. I'm an otolaryngologist practicing in the greatest, greater Hartford area. 
I'm also currently president of the Connecticut Ear, Nose, and Throat Society. I'm speaking on behalf of over 800 physicians from the medical specialties of dermatology, ophthalmology, otolaryngology, and urology. We are in strong support of Senate Bill 899 and applaud the bill's attempt at providing better transparency in the public's awareness of the degrees and training of physicians in contrast to our colleagues in other healthcare disciplines. Healthcare today is advanced and complex and relies on a vast array of healthcare personnel that vary considerably with regard to training they receive. All of these personnel are important parts of the healthcare team and their roles are respected and relied upon by all of us. However, as healthcare occupations has, have proliferated, the boundaries between roles have become blurred, leaving patients in doubt and sometimes even misled. The profusion of professional titles can be confusing to patients. For instance, many do not know the difference between an ophthalmologist, an optometrist, and an optician, for instance, but they do care about the level of training and expertise possessed by the person treating their eyes. The more similar sounding titles and designations become, the more confusion they sow. The word physician to most people means a doctor who has gone to medical school, graduating with either an MD or DO degree. Indeed, a quick Google search most often returns that definition. It is also the definition used by the CDC and OSHA and is what 88% of Americans believe. Protecting that meaning in statute protects patients and does no harm to other medical personnel who are entitled to the degrees and titles they have rightfully earned by graduating from their own schools and who for the most part are entitled to use the word doctor to describe themselves based on the level of their educational degree. Senate Bill 899 seeks to address this issue by requiring healthcare professionals to refrain from using the title physician unless they have received the education and training unique to those who possess either a medical or doctor of osteopathy degree. While several other states have enacted this protection, it is also true that some other jurisdictions may have their own rules on this topic. However, Connecticut residents desire transparency in their health care and they deserve it. It is up to Connecticut to determine what physicians mean means within its borders. And that responsibility lies with the legislature and not other any subsidiary body. The public trusts physician to mean someone with an MD or DO degree. Our societies collectively ask you all to support the will of the public and pass Senate Bill 899. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Senator Amor. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mulder, for your patience and your testimony. Uh, uh, Dr. Mulder, with, with your background, would you be able to just share with us and, and the public uh, as well why timeliness is critical, for example, from otolaryngology perspective, nasal drainage with CSF not, not identified can lead to death? Or, uh, for example, with the um, uh, optimal, ophthalmologic issues, if, if there's a retinal tear and it's not identified in a timely fashion, what may happen? Uh, because knowing who to go to would be a matter of life and death or loss of vision or loss of uh, functionality, permanent damage. So can you give us some examples, if you could? Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate the question, Dr. Amor, and I appreciate you uh, bringing this bill forward. Um, so a, a good example that has happened to me several times, I've been in practice about 10 years, is uh, there, there's an entity called idiopathic sudden sensory neural hearing loss. And basically what that is, is someone often experiences a cold or an upper respiratory infection, loses their hearing in one ear, and most patients would assume that's from fluid in the ear. They often end up seeing a non-otolaryngologist or a non-physician and are told they have fluid in their ear or it's going to go away in a few days, take some Flonase. And they often end up seeing us six, eight weeks later, three months later, we get an audiogram and they're deaf in that ear. Um, this is a condition that if treated within three weeks, the sooner the better, but ideally within three weeks, if you treat it with steroids, oftentimes the hearing will come back and you can save the ear. But I have set, had several examples of it happening where I see the patient weeks to months after the incident, and by that time it's too late. So that's a great question. Again, thank you. So I'm just gonna have a quick follow-up. And I think besides the, the title itself or the label and, and so on, it, it's also identifying the, the importance of a timeliness access to the individual who has the most training and experience to be able to manage something and then reduce long-term morbidity and mortality depending on the issue. Absolutely. I would agree. I, I think, as I said in my testimony, the, the, 
the word physician does mean something to the public. Uh, and I think when people go to see someone who's calling themselves a physician, most people's assumption is that they're seeing either a medical doctor or an osteopath that has undergone four years of medical school and extensive residency postgraduate training. And, and to your point, uh, those are the individuals who are most qualified to diagnose and treat complex and potentially life-threatening situations. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Representative Foster. Thank you very much. I appreciate your testimony today and you taking the time to talk here. I have um, two questions. The first one is, are you aware of any time a patient has come to you to receive care after believing they were receiving care that was an equivalent alternative to the care that you could provide? I, I would say that that happens frequently, most commonly with, um, and this is not in any way to disparage nurse practitioners or physician's assistants. We have three physician's assistants and one nurse practitioner in our practice, and they're wonderful and they provide excellent care. But I've noticed particularly more in recent years that uh, patients don't necessarily know that a nurse practitioner or a PA is not a physician, and they'll often refer to that person as Dr. Miller or Dr. X or Dr. Y, not knowing that that person is not actually a physician. And I, I, I'm not suggesting that APRNs or PAs are trying to use the designation of physician, but that's the example that comes to mind. So yes, I, we do see that fairly frequently, where there is a, a little bit of a misunderstanding in what provider is providing care to, to the patient. And that's with providers with clearly distinct titles. Um, I'm correct. curious, um, I heard your specialty is ENT, is that correct? Correct. Um, my, my question, my next question is, I hear a lot um, as a registered dietitian, there's often overlap in my field and some of those providing complementary alternative medicine. And I'm curious if you've ever seen experiences with people being I'm going to use this word, um, not in the medicinal sense, but prescribed like pulsatella, for example, as a treatment, and then later seeing consequences when it would have been more appropriate to be on an antibiotic or have a more specific treatment sooner. So, so essentially you're asking whether a complementary treatment has delayed diagnosis and led to a potential complication down the road. Is that correct? Correct. And knowing that pulsatella is a commonly um, prescribed ear infection treatment. Yeah. Through um, physicians. Yeah, we, we do see that periodically. To be perfectly honest, I, I can't think of an, a time offhand where I've seen that, that particular um, therapy, but we often do see patients who have been recommended a product or a a supplement or a medication that is, you know, off label and certainly not helping the situation and potentially harming the situation, most likely just through delay of care. Um, not to mention the the cost of the patient's pocketbooks. A lot of these substances are are very expensive and have fairly limited clinical utility. After a different public hearing before this committee last year, um, I was exposed to a great number of uh, different complementary alternative medicine treatments as alternative to standard care and um, went into a little bit of an internet rabbit hole and, and found many <coughs> examples of delayed treatment that were related to, um, for example, treatment of a tick-borne illness that should have been treated by antibiotics. Absolutely. Over, um, and, and those could be severely consequential. So I'm grateful for your example and Pulsatella was the thing that came to mind that I thought was relevant to your field, but I appreciate your testimony and the clarity that it offered. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Senator Summers. Yes, good evening. And thank you, uh, doctor, for being with us today. I remember when I went to work in pharma, one of the first questions was how do you spell otorhinolaryngologist? <laughs> but it's you're, a tough you're one. not an otorhino, you're just an it doesn't say you're not an Odo, you know, you're just an Odo laryngologist. So um, I have a question for you. I hear what you're saying about uh, 
the importance of physician. And right now in our statute, physician is, um, you know, equivalent to doctor, so to speak. What would you say to, I have two questions. What would you say to those physicians right now, currently, um, naturopathic, chiropractic, podiatrists that would no longer now be able to use the word physician if this bill were to go through as as stated here, even though that they have been able to, under statute, call themselves a doctor of naturopathic medicine or a doctor of uh, podiatric medicine or a podiatric physician. Uh, that's my first question. And then the second question, you know, I, I'm concerned about um, implying that going to an alternative medicine um, outside the standard uh, medical school is going to delay or cause harm because in many cases, um, many of those folks are seeing people that can't be seen by other primary care physicians. There's just not enough of them. And there is no saying that if you do go to your primary care physician, I've had this happen to me and my family that you go back and you go back and you go back and the treatments don't work. And that eventually they send you to an otorhinolaryngologist. So you have that with the standard uh, medical doctor also. So I'm just wanted to weigh in on those two thoughts today. If you could please respond, that would be terrific. Sure, thank you for the questions, Senator Summers. I appreciate it. Uh, so to your first point, uh, I don't think we're taking issue with using the term doctor. So if a podiatrist wants to refer themselves as Dr. X or a naturopath wants to refer them as Dr. X, uh, they've earned that title and they have the right to do so. Um, I, and I do recognize that currently naturopaths and chiropractors are allowed to refer themselves as physicians. Um, and yes, that's going to be difficult for them if, if this bill goes through. But I think there has been such a proliferation of of disciplines in recent years that the waters have become very muddied. And I, I do feel that most people believe when they go see a physician that they are seeing a medically trained doctor. And I think that's an important distinction to protect the public health. Um, in terms of your second question, um, I'm not at all questioning the validity of or the role of a naturopath or a chiropractor or any other non-medical doctor. Um, I think they do have their role. And there are certainly times when I recommend someone see a naturopath because sometimes there are things that allopathic physicians, frankly, aren't very good at treating. Um, we're good at performing surgeries. We're good at prescribing medications. We're we're not so great often at dealing with chronic pain or, or other issues like that. So I, I welcome and applaud complementary and alternative options. Um, but again, I think the, the title physician should rest with medically trained doctors. If I can just follow up quickly, how would you feel if, um, you know, I, I have, I'm actually, my spouse is a physician also, and he's an MD also. Um, yep. but the problem seems to be, um, in the hospital setting or in the independent APRN practice where somebody's referred to as, you know, Dr. So-and-so or Dr. So-and-so where the, the patient believes or is, um, you know, led to believe, you know, between the, the outfit and the, the setting that that is actually a, an MD, but I'm not mm -hmm. hearing that ever or I have not heard that at all as an issue with the naturopathic doctors, podiatrists, chiropractors, they seem to be very clear in, I am a doctor of podiatric medicine. I'm a doctor of chiropractic medicine. So I have reservations in pulling back something um, for doctors slash physicians that have been able to use that title for over 30 years on our statute, how would you feel about grandfathering them in? So those are clinicians that have been uh, faithfully practicing here in the state of Connecticut, but that we would look to make sure, um, you know, a nurse, let's say with a PhD or a PA with a PhD cannot refer to themselves as Dr. 
X, Y, and Z. So there's a distinction there. So we are not actually taking away something from a uh, specialty that has worked fine um, in the state of Connecticut for years and years. It's very hard to go in and take that back uh, from them. But going forward, you could look where somebody with just a PhD um, cannot be able to imply or to advertise themselves as necessarily a doctor. They would have to say, I'm a nurse with a PhD. Uh, that's certainly something you could consider. Um, I think if that were to be done, certainly using the whatever the modifier is, such as naturopathic physician or podiatric physician, would be vital. And I believe they do that now. Um, when I have uh, spoken to them, or even if you look at their advertising, it always says, I'm a doctor of naturopathic medicine. I'm a naturopathic physician. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of the clarity where you or an otorhinolaryngologist can say, I'm a physician <laughs> and I am uh, a doctor without having that sort of, um, you know, that declarative in front of it. So sure. I wanted to run that by you uh, because I think for some of us, it's going to be a hard ask to take that away from, from clinicians that have been practicing faithfully. And I know that many of the uh, primary care doctors that I know personally, they refer chronic pain many times to naturopaths and they have a, a, a good working relationship. I know there are different pathways, but they can complement each other. And I don't you know, I think some of us struggle with taking away a title of someone or some specialty that has worked fine and we don't seem to have the issue with here in the state of Connecticut versus obviously in the hospital, it's a different thing. I mean, that happens to all our family members. My mom will say, oh, I saw Dr. So-and-so. I'm like, that's actually an APRN. Um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I, I see a distinction. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I, no, I think you're bringing up a valid point. And again, I'm not disparaging the care that naturopaths provide at all. And I, I do think that they have, do have a role and they can be very useful. And like I said, I have recommended people see them in the past. Um, I, I think the, the key point is to delineate the difference between a physician and well, a, a medical doctor or a doctor of osteopathy and someone who has not had similar training because at the end of the day, I, you know, I put in four years of medical school and I worked 80 hours a week for, for five years. And with that training, I developed a, a huge knowledge base that the public trusts when they go to see a physician, that that knowledge base is being drawn upon. So, you know, I, I think our feeling as the specialty societies is that the term physician means something to most people. And I do recognize what you're saying that the term physician has been used by these other disciplines for a long time. And that is a hard thing to ask to take it away, but it, it does provide clarity for the public trust. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Senator Summers. Thank you, Senator Summers. Um, back to Senator Amor, my our good I'll let you Before that, Senator Representative Denning has his hand yeah. up before that. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to go to Representative Denning, and then we'll go back to Senator Amor. Thank you, Chair Kristen McCarthy Uh, Dr. Mueller, thank you for coming. I have been a nurse anesthetist for 39 years. I've retired. I'm at home today because I have a sinus infection and you don't <laughs> want to see me. Um, however, you're welcome to come see me. If you I've, uh, yeah, I've already gotten some help, but um, I keep my screen off most of the day. Uh, my question to you is, I'm, what I'm hearing from the medical community is that they are concerned that the public is, is being confused between physician and doctor. What if we change the bill to say that physicians, medical doctors, DOs, must go by the name physician? and let everybody who's earned their doctorate degree go by the name of doctor. And that way the distinguishment would affect, um, primarily, uh, we would have some people who would lose their title, but they would still be able to go by doctor and you would keep your title that, that I, what I'm hearing most of the doctors wanna be known as, as physician. So, so you're suggesting I would go by physician Moeller instead of by Dr. Moeller? 
Correct. Uh, that is certainly something you could consider. Um, I'm not sure if it rolls off the tongue quite so well, but but I, I do hear I do hear your point, um, and I think you're right. I mean, I, what we're touching on, and you know, you said you're a, a nurse anesthetist. I work with nurse anesthetists all the time in the operating room. And I have the utmost respect, and there are many nurse anesthetists that I would allow to put my children to sleep or myself to sleep. Um, we so never say put to sleep. We that's a bad <laughs> word. We, so we're gonna wake up. We say anesthetize. Anesthetize. But there you go. But you know, I, I have the utmost respect for for your discipline. Um, and, and but I, I think at the end of the day, the issue and the practice of anesthesia is a totally different subject because it's not really forward facing. Because most anesthesiologists and nurses aren't gonna have a sign along the side of the road, you know. So I, I think. The issue in my mind comes with what is the public, what is the public scene? Um, I, I'm not sure it would, it would be realistic for every doctor to change their name to Physician Moeller or Physician X, um, but your point's taken. As, just as a follow-up, um, do you introduce yourself as Dr. Moeller, a physician? No. Okay, thank you. No, I don't. Uh, and to, to, to that point, I think it's implied, you know, that, that if they're seeing an ear, nose, and throat doctor, and I refer to myself as Dr. Moeller, then I'm either a doctor of medicine or a DO. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you, Representative Denning. Representative Kennedy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Dr. Muller. I have a question through you, Madam Chair. Um, we have heard from an earlier speaker that referenced uh, Chapter 13 of our current statutes, and he spoke about Medicare and that the rules currently are defined as to what a physician is. Can, can you address that? And my second question is that this bill, according to the previous speaker, conflicts with federal law. Through you, Madam Speaker. The floor is yours, Madam. Doctor, please proceed. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm sorry. I'm not familiar with that statute, so I, I can't speak intelligently about that. I'd be happy to review it and and get a response back to you via email. Uh, thank you, Doctor. I appreciate that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Elmore. I, I just wanted to make a comment, and then perhaps uh, Dr. Mulder, you can um, uh, reflect on it. So if there's a concern that the title um, removal for somebody who may have had the title for five years or 10 years versus 25, 30 years versus 350 years. So if somebody takes somebody's title away without the same level of training that has been there for 350 plus years, does that sound fair? Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's a very valid point. And I think it, it, you know, it brings me back to my main point, the term physician in the vast majority of uh, citizen of Connecticut's eyes and probably across the country, when you say physician, you're talking about uh, someone who's trained with a medical education. Um, so if that term has been taken on in recent years by a naturopath, for instance, um, I don't know that necessarily means that it can't, that can't be modified. Thank you very much, Dr. Moeller, for being here with us and helping us here. And oh, Representative Zupkis, actually, not, I hope you're still there. There you go. Representative Zupkis, please proceed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Moeller, for coming. Uh, would you be opposed to? I mean, so what I've been hearing all afternoon, night, morning is that, um, you know, naturopathic doctors or podiatrists should say, hello, I'm Dr. Zupkis, a podiatrist, or I'm Dr. Zupkis, a naturopathic doctor. Why wouldn't you say I'm Dr. Moeller, uh, a physician? So would you have a problem with that? Uh, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have any problem doing that. I never, it's not a practice I've ever done, mm -hmm. um, but no, I wouldn't. Which is the a, same for them, right? They've never done it either. Right, right. Yeah. No, I, I wouldn't have a problem doing that. Okay, great. Thank you. 
Sure. Thank you, Representative Zupkus. Thank you so much, Dr. Mueller. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thanks, Paul, for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Next, we have Ellen Lewis. Welcome, please proceed. Hello, thank you members of the committee. I'm Dr. Ellen Lewis. I'm a naturopathic physician and I'm a longtime resident of Fairfield, Connecticut. I have a private practice and integrative clinic, a Shava Clinic in Westport, Connecticut, which has been there for about 11 years. My background is I have an undergraduate degree from Boston University where I attended Sargent School of Health Sciences. After that, I went on to National University of Natural Medicine out in Portland, Oregon, where I attended, attended a very rigorous four-year naturopathic medical um, curriculum. Following my um, doctorate degree, I then went on to a naturopathic residency um, before relocating back to Connecticut to start my practice. I've also served for the last, um, from basically from 2012 until last year at the University of Bridgeport as adjunct clinical and academic faculty. Um, in addition, you know, I think there's been a lot of wonderful testimony here today, but I'm, I'm here to express strong opposition to bill number 899. Mm -hmm. um, I think where there's a lot of ambiguity is actually in the terms that are being used, both in how we define a physician and also in how we define medical trained among many other terms that are, have been used today. My training in my naturopathic medical school, as has been in part of testimony before, included two years of rigorous basic sciences, followed by two years of clinical sciences where I had training in all a host of conventional medical therapies, as well as all the naturopathic modalities. And I bring that into my everyday practice. And it's something that all of us physicians do. It's called a PARQ. So when a patient comes into my office um, for their initial visit, they complete a typical initial intake form. Um, then when I meet with them for their initial appointment, I spend the first half of the appointment really um, looking to understand the complaint in its full, um, full um, depth. I then move on to do any uh, physical exams and that's a very standard part of my practice. So I think one thing that was mentioned before was about um, physicians ability to evaluate and diagnose and I use um, an ophthalmoscope, I use a stethoscope, I use all of these tubes, I use a blood pressure cuff, a pulse oximeter, I use all my physical exam skills to be able to palpate and, and examine my patients. And then the ultimate goal is to form my diagnosis and then to come up with a plan for treatment. And that plan for treatment includes some type of PARQ. It's the expectation with whatever condition that they've come in, and this is true of all physicians, that I present the um, options available for treatment. And that is not just pharmaceuticals. So while I've heard mentioned before that primary care is synonymous um, with a pharmaceutical intervention, and while that sometimes is the best option for a patient and it's not something that I deliver in my office, it's something I collaborate with tons of different provider types on, on a regular basis. Um, but it's not always the only option. In some cases it is, but it's not always the only option. You know, there's many conditions and a patient part of being a part of this country is our freedom to choose and freedom to choose um, what treatment types that we like um, or we feel are going to be the best, best suited. So when I'm presenting something to a patient, not only am I including conventional pharmaceutical options and referrals, but I'm also providing some natural alternatives if that's a possibility for the patient. And part of my training has trained me to be able to utilize those, those um, skills and tools. I order all the same Dr. labs Lewis, and diagnostics. Your mm -hmm. time has concluded. Okay. I, I'm happy to open the floor for any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Senator Anwar. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Dr. Lewis, I'm looking at your website and uh, you are claiming that you can fix seizure disorder, Parkinson's disease through naturopathic medicines, and you can actually take care of Crohn's disease and lupus. Do you know that if 
early intervention from some of the treatments that are uh, obviously I'm just limiting myself because I don't want to go through the entire list, but yeah, there are standardized treatments that are there and delay in treatment can be pretty severe and significant in, in at least the three examples, but I can. Absolutely. Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, I just had a patient recently, we did serum blood markers. She's had unrelenting digestive symptoms with her primary care physician. And she came into my office. She's been dealing with these symptoms forever. She came back, her celiac panel was positive. What did I do? I referred her to a gastroenterologist. She's in the practice, a great colleague of mine that handles all my patients. She's scheduled for an endoscopy. So do I... Do I work with these patients? Absolutely. Am I going to guide them in the therapeutics that are available? Absolutely. But I do not deny the patient's care in the same way a primary care physician is not going to give somebody an endoscopy, are they? So, so by, by that extension, do you think every doctor, primary care should put on their advertisement and their websites that they are, are going to manage neuro uh, brain cancers and other things because they will refer to somebody? I mean, I, I'm just trying to make sure no, I, I, I absolutely I absolutely hear what you're saying but these are all conditions that um, have integrative options available for for them um, I don't see this as I, I think that it's being presented as an either or but there's never been any ambiguity and I'm talking with my patients they very much know I'm a naturopathic doctor and that's the the scope of it and I do not I do not practice outside of that scope, but if somebody comes into my office because they are on levodopa for their Parkinson's or whatever it may be, there are things that I can do to support their health, their mobility, their nutritional factors, helping them with a whole host of things. So do I work with patients with Parkinson's? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, again, so do primary this, care physicians. This is probably an area where we will, I will respectfully agree to disagree with you because I think what happens is when somebody has a difficult diagnosis, they are anxious, they're worried, and, and uh, sometimes they go into a direction where some of their treatments can be delayed, especially if uh, they do a website online search and they find this cure or somebody who can fix that stuff. And it's going to take them away from the standardized proven treatments. <laughs> I, I, I see think that I'm just gonna... I don't see that. I see okay. two scenarios. Senator, may I ask, just please let the senator conclude and then I will. Sorry, give I'm in the bathroom. So it's a little bit of an echo. <laughs> I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. Senator. And, and so I, I think that's part of the challenge that we have is that uh, individuals who are going through some difficulties and, and they could look at Parkinson's and, and other diseases, cancers, you name it. And, and then they say, oh, there is a natural cure or treatment somebody has. And, and um, I, I, I'm, I'm just uh, concerned about how it is being marketed, how is it, it is being used. And, and that is one of the concerns that we have. That's why people need to be somewhat upfront. And I, I would say that, yes, you claim to be up, upfront too, but, but when you list diseases and, and about 50 diseases, that you are supposed to, or you think you're going to be able to take care of that sort of will confuse a patient who's struggling with a new diagnosis. That's just, uh, I'm not asking you the question. I'm just making a statement to how I see it. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Amar. Ms. Lewis, we have a couple more questions for you. So I'm going to go next to Senator Marks and then to be followed by Representative Berger Gervalo. Um, thank you so much uh, through you, Madam Chair. Um, so through this, all of these testimonies this, this afternoon and this evening, I'm a little confused. Are we, do we not want you, the naturopaths and podiatrists to call themselves physicians, but we're okay calling them Dr. Lewis or Dr. Marks or Dr. McCarty. And then we're not happy with the nurse practitioners and PAs who are now being called Dr. Marks and Dr. McCarty, even, I'm, I'm just looking at you, Representative McCarty, that's why I'm saying your name. And, 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 and so I, I don't even know now at the end of this entire evening and everybody talking what we're even worried about and talking about. Um, you know, it's not like it was back in the 70s and 80s when all the men on the floor of the hospital or the, all the men 
where the doctors are 99% of them were and all the women were nurses and that's very different now. Um, I think it might even just be easier to start saying nurse practitioner marks or um, you know, PA uh, Lewis, because when I call, I'll tell my patient I'm a nurse and I'll say, oh, you have an appointment with your new um, PCP this, you know, tomorrow and it's, um, it's uh, Mickey Mouse, but it's not a doctor. It's actually a physician's assistant. So I should, I, but I call it Dr. Mouse and I should be calling it physician's assistant mouse. Do you know what I'm saying? I, I really, and now we're questioning what your, how you, Dr. Lewis, are, are, are doing your practice, which I don't think that's any of our, um, that's not what we're here for. You are, patients see you. I have seen so many patients that have just been so tired of going doctors after doctors after doctors and getting nowhere and going to a naturopath who sits down and spends an hour or an hour and a half with them and sees what they eat for breakfast, lunch, dinner, their sleep patterns, how much water they drink, go do different blood work. And it, you know, is it for me? It probably isn't. But is it for other people? It, I'm not going to do yoga either. I probably should, but I'm not going to. And so, like, why are we here today? To get rid of just the word physician or to change everybody's doctor, nurse practitioner, naturopath, which I think that probably is the answer. And it's just that we have to, it's a, it's just healthcare isn't evolving. So Senator I guess Martin. I'm just, I'm not asking you a question. I do want to say that I do respect what you do, um, mm -hmm. Dr. Lewis. And, and um, I don't think we are here to question what you do or what your results are of the care that you give. I'm just kind of questioning the whole mm -hmm. What, what we want the outcome of this public hearing to be. I, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Marks. And you answered my question. I was going to ask if you had a question, but it, more of a comment, which is fine. And I'm going to go next. I think I was going next to Representative Berger Javalo to be followed by Representative Kennedy and then Representative Zupkis. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Doctor, for your testimony. I really just have a clarifying question. When I look at the list that we have before us um, of testimony, you are listed as an MD. Now, is that, um, when I look at your website, you are naturopathic physician and medical director of your clinic. Is that what you meant to represent or was that strictly a typo when you meant to put an ND? So I didn't put that in there. So that would probably be the only moment of ambiguity or error, I should say, that's ever been made. Um, I'm not sure how that is in there. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Representative. And uh, those are our, our documents internally. And so uh, who knows? So thank you for clarifying that. Representative Kennedy to be followed by Representative Zupkus. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I know it's been a long day, so I'll be brief. Um, but um, our good chairman, um, Senator Anwar, asked some very interesting questions. And I'm going to look at it from the other side, Dr. L um, Dr. Lewis, as a naturopathic. A lot of times people will be going through maybe it's stomach issues or something for maybe a year or two, but then they'll decide nothing is getting, they're not getting the answers or they're not finding out what the real root of their issue is or their problem with maybe a digestive issue. And they go to a naturopath. I, I don't think that that's prolonging. I hope not um, getting the proper treatment, but seeing a naturopath, like it's like looking at it in another lens and that for maybe different answers, would that be correct in assuming that assumption, please? Yeah. For your Absolutely. Manager? Absolutely. It's complimentary. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Representative Zupkus. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I just, I guess I have a comment. Um, I, I really appreciate Senator Marks's remarks um, because I'm sitting here doing the same thing. And, you know, I, at this time, am going to see a lot of doctors and some of them have been good. And honestly, some of them have done nothing and given me wrong diagnosis. Some I've been to naturopathic doctors. I love them. I go to both and take what I want. And naturopathic doctors have been able to really make some significant difference in my life uh, that regular doctors have not. And so, again, I really appreciate what Senator Mark said. And I find it interesting that we have not had one person come and testify that they have been hurt, mis in mis uh, informed. No patient has come before us and said that they have been misled. So I just find that really interesting. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Zupkus. And Dr. Lewis, thank you very much for being here with us. Um, thank you. Via the Zoom, and I appreciate that. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you, members of the committee. And with that, we are going to go to number 77, Emily Stanton. Emily, let's see, I'm looking for you on the screen. There you are. If you can unmute there, please proceed. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mrs. Chair and members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Emily Stanton. I'm speaking on a raised bill 898. I know this bill was written differently than intended. However, I would like to point out why the language used when writing this bill is detrimental to a patient's treatment and having accurate protections in place is crucial to someone's recovery. One word could determine life-changing decisions. I'm a registered behavioral therapist for children on the autism spectrum disorder, mental health advocate, and a NAMI affiliate, part of America's largest grassroots mental health organization, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. I was diagnosed at 16 with bipolar disorder, but currently undergoing an evaluation for ADHD because I was misdiagnosed for 10 years. When I was 18, I ran away from home because I wanted to end my life. I was suffering from suicidal ideations and self-harm. I had no goals or ambitions and I couldn't see a future for myself and I wanted to give up. I returned home because I was listed on a silver alert where police were less than helpful. I attempted to drop out of high school but was soon placed in the Institute of Living for two weeks. I had endured treatments that were aversive and unnecessary when more holistic approaches would have been successful. My parents were my biggest advocates to help me navigate my first experience being institutionalized, and they ensured to communicate with my doctors and have them thoroughly explain medications and their side effects, understanding the routines in place for living within a psych ward, but most importantly made frequent phone calls and attended all visiting hours. During these times, my parents' assertiveness to learn about mental illness was was able to have, I was able to have informed consent and make the right decisions for my treatment. The skills I must have to be assertive with my clinicians are lifelong and strategies I still use as an adult. Today, I seek therapy every week and have a team of providers who reassess medications and challenges in my everyday life. I have found a niche for my career that not only aligns with personal goals, but influences the mental health of our future generations as I am a clinician providing impactful services for our children. Connecticut needs to add more protections for patients against forced treatments, especially electroconvulsive therapy, and should never take away an individual's right to obtain a less invasive treatment. The idea that there are very few protections against forced ECT for people who are unable to give consent is terrifying to myself and anyone else who suffers from severe depression. More resources and attention need to be brought to mental health care, such as early intervention for early childhood, connection to mental health resources for, young and, for youth and young adults, more support and funding for psychiatric beds, increased support for staff for case management, and an increased awareness to mental health in older adults. So much more can be put in place to ensure that the right services can reach people earlier to prevent circumstances from even escalating to a point of ECD, ECT being the only form of treatment that could be effective. I ask that you can support me in protecting patients' rights to due process before being forced to receive electroconvulsive therapy. Thank you for giving me the time and the opportunity to testify here today. 
Ms. Staten, thank you for your very inspiring testimony, for your wonderful list of suggestions, and for your patience in staying here with us throughout the day. And it's been a long day. I very much appreciate it. Are there thank you. questions or comments from the committee? Representative Berger Gervalo. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just have one comment um, as a former behavior therapist, one to another. I appreciate your perspective on this, but I also want to thank you um, deeply for your very heartfelt and personal um, testimony. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Seeing no one else here, please enjoy the rest of your evening and we are going to go on. Let's see. We are going to go, I believe, to Jill Edwards. Oh, forgive me, Jill. I apologize if you can hang on. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Number 80, David Daniels. Mr. Daniels, thank you for being on top of things, even if I wasn't. So welcome and please proceed. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. Well, good evening. I started, uh, when I started writing this thing, I started good morning, then I went to good evening. Good afternoon now, man. Good evening. Good evening to everybody. Um, I'm here to talk about HB 6488 in regards to that. My name is David Daniels III. I'm a retired Bridgeport, Connecticut police lieutenant, serving in my city for 25 plus years in different divisions from patrol to most notably our, our community services division where I created community-based programs still in use today for our community and its children. I taught the DARE program, the GRADE programs, and as a patrolman early in my career while I was on a job, I was a five-term president of Bridgeport Guardians, an advocacy group, black and brown officers, one-term vice president of the National Black Police Association's Northeast Region, and then the first national chairman of the National Association of Black Law Enforcement as well. I ran for mayor of Bridgeport in 2015. Here in Connecticut, a menthol ban was considered last year, first in my city, then on a statewide level. I worked against it, and I'm opposed to it locally, regionally, and nationally as well. First up, I'm not a smoker. I do not advocate such things, and I am totally opposed to children and young adults partaking in such things as well. I'm opposed to these laws because I don't believe they work. Historically, prohibition showed us that. But I also believe that people are the people that are in favor of this for health reasons aren't considering that this would usher usher in a, a black market for such contraband would be unregulated and surely unhealthy and possibly violent. I also believe that the unintended consequences to the black and brown communities will be predictable and disastrous. The community already suffers from a negative relationship with law enforcement. Just last week, a young black man named Tyree Nichols in Memphis, Tennessee lost his life in a brutal encounter with the police for a minor traffic stop. As a matter of fact, his funeral is today. Anyways, this measure I believe Excuse me, have a cold. This will make things worse over time and diminish that relationship even further. If people truly want to help smokers, this energy should be utilized in cessation programs and education, not criminalization. Anybody has any questions? Answer. Mr. Daniels, thank you very much for your testimony. Are there well, comments or questions? Seeing none, I want to thank you for spending time with us and for your patience today. We appreciate your testimony and your work in the community. Thank I wish you. you a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you, too. Thank you. Next, we have Jill Edwards. Miss Edwards. Welcome. Please Hi. proceed. Hi, I'm Jill Edwards. I'm here to testify against SB 898. 
As an American citizen living with the long-term effects of repeated mild traumatic brain injury, electrical injury, and psychological trauma from ECT, I'm offended, angered, and heartbroken that this bill is even being considered. It's unconscionable that in this century, we continue to be subjugated by medical providers and our own government. This fight should have ended decades ago. Yet here we are, our bodies and rights being broken and violated by the very people and institutions sworn to protect us. At this moment, I'm ashamed to be an American. As we speak of court proceedings for mental health care, my logic and conscience beg the question, why should any person have to defend themselves against a doctor? Why should any patient have to beg and plead with a court to not allow a doctor to violate their rights and bodily integrity, to not traumatize and injure them, to not erase aspects of their life and humanity? Our nation is blind to the genocide of its own people. ECT is a form of genocide defined as an act that destroys a group in whole or in part through killing torture by causing serious physical or mental harm. It includes creating conditions of life that threaten survival. ECT kills. One in 93 people die within 30 days. One in 39 have a major cardiac event. ECT patients have a 5.7 times increased risk of suicide. 7.1% of babies die from ECT administered during pregnancy. Money used, lose years or decades of memories, education, skills, and become completely disabled. Relationships, livelihoods, and careers destroyed. Imagine no longer being able to recognize your loved ones or losing all memories of your childhood, your marriage, and your children's childhood. ECT destroys lives and legacies and causes intergenerational trauma in families. Like CTE and NFL players, the consequences of repeated brain and electrical injury from ECT extend far beyond memory and cognitive issues. They manifest as a variety of painful and debilitating symptoms and health problems. And the more injuries one has, the greater the risks of impairments, health issues, and death. This bill would increase the number of brain and electrical injuries each patient receives and increase the risk to their health and their life and their well-being. Many patients experience ECT as torture. The UN states that forcing ECT on non-consenting pac patients constitute torture. Let me make this clear. Torture is not conducive to mental health. A doctor's opinion about the therapeutic value of treatment is irrelevant when a patient experiences it as torture. Torture is never in a patient's best interest. This bill would extend the length of time that patients and their families are tortured and traumatized. I implore you to tune out the voices of the people and organizations who profit from ECT and the subjugation of vulnerable Americans. Listen to the people. Patients live with the aftermath of ECT, not doctors. As such, ECT recipients are the true stakeholders in this bill. For 84 years, ECT victims have been silenced, ignored, and dismissed. I'm concerned about the state of a civilization that prevails in harming, oppressing, and silencing its people. If our shattered lives, injured bodies, and broken spirits are not enough evidence for you to vote against this bill, the very soul of this nation is dead. In the words of C.S. Lewis, of all tyrannies, a tyranny sincerely expressed exercise for the good of its victims may be the most oppressive. Those who torment us for our own good will torment us without end, for they do so with the approval of their own conscience. To be cured against one's will and cured of states which we may not regard as a disease is to be put on the level of those who have not yet reached the age of reason. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm sorry that we're not here in person so that I, together, so that I can just see you and offer you my thanks and compassion for what you've been through. And I want to thank you. And we're fortunate that we live in a place where you are not silenced. And I'm glad that we were able to hear your words today. I know we have a question from Representative Zupkis. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Mrs. Edwards, thank you for coming today. And I know it's very difficult, but um, I I personally greatly appreciate you sharing. And I just want to ask, you see this bill as getting something, this ETC, uh, forced upon you that you don't give consent to or you don't want? It's, I mean, the whole treatment should be abolished. But the fact that this is going to extend the period of time when you know, okay, now it's this many more days that I'm going to be locked in this hospital while I'm being terrorized and traumatized and injured. And they're dragging me to the table, screaming and begging and pleading. So knowing that you have that many more days, and then when you get out, the aftermath of having even more brain injuries 
and the trauma of not being able to find doctors who will listen to you and help you. And the medical community continues to not deny our injuries. And I, it took me 21 years to get the appropriate diagnosis. 21 years I've suffered and no one would help me. And I've had to advocate for myself and I had to research to figure out what I was suffering with. Okay, to have a neurologist who studies the nervous system and seizures to look at me and say, no, ECT couldn't cause your problems because it's therapeutic. Do you understand what they're doing during this procedure? We may be asleep now, but they are coursing electricity through our body. There's no, nothing healing about it. And we well, live with it. Th we live with it. Thank you. Our families and suffer. Can, our families I can, suffer. I can only imagine how hard it is. And I, I really... Um, hate to press this, but I just would like to know that. Um, so when you get uh, the first treatment, or do you agree to that? Or because I, I really don't know anything about this. So I apologize okay. if I'm making. But so when you get your treatment for the first few days, whatever that number is, mm -hmm. do you agree to that? Whether you understand it or not, do you have to give consent? I guess well, is my question. It's it it varies by state, but yeah, I I can in Connecticut. Similar. Okay, yeah, I'm in Indiana. I mean, there's similarities and differences. I'm in Indiana. I originally consented. Shortly after I began, I realized this is not what I need, and the doctors continued to pressure me and co coerce me, and they threatened to get a court order, even though I was not acutely suicidal. I had gone in there consenting. So threats and coercion are standard in psychiatric treatment. Okay. Chronic empowerment of people taking away our rights and choices and doing horrible things to our body against our will and saying it's in our best interest. Well, thank you, because I'm certainly not for something that somebody doesn't consent to. So I guess those will that would be a question. And I don't know if the chairs um, or somebody could answer in the state of Connecticut. Do you have to get consent to get your first set of treatments and consent to get your second set of treatments? Or is it forced upon you or doctors just say you have to have it and you have to have it. So Mrs. Edwards, thank you. I, I sincerely appreciate it. Um, and I would really like to have those answers for Connecticut um, just because we're here talking about a Connecticut law, but I'm sorry you had to go through all of that. And thank I just you. want to note that, that psychiatrists can override psychiatric advance directives. Unlike any other medical providers, they can override a psychiatric advance directive in which somebody okay. specifically says they don't want ECT. It's Thank another you. discriminatory act against people with psychiatric diagnoses. Thank you. Representative Zupkis, and we do have someone testifying later who you will have the opportunity to ask that question of as well. And we can certainly get you the answers from our um, wonderful nonpartisan team. Who I should take this opportunity to thank them as well. Ms. Very Ed much appreciated, Madam Chair. Ms. Edwards, I, I, my hope for you for the rest of this evening is that you have some wonderful support people either with you in your life or available to you because this is a hard thing to do and I thank you for doing it. Wishing you a peaceful evening. Thank you. With that, I might need some help, Madam Clerk, or my wonderful co-chair to make sure I'm in the right place with who is next. I believe that we have Kathy Flaherty, is that correct? Madam Clerk, no. Oh yes, we actually have, give me one second. Ms. Flaherty, um, you have been so patient. Yes, we are looking for one attendee, um, I believe Mr. Khan. So in the meantime, Mr. Khan, we are going to have Ms. Flaherty come forward to testify. And Mr. Khan, if you're available, please accept the invitation and we will have you testify after Ms. Flaherty. Ms. Flaherty, it is wonderful to see you. Welcome and please proceed. Thank you so much, Rep. McCarthy Vehi, Senator Anwar, Senator Summers, Representative Claire Destitria, all the members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Kathy Flaherty. I am the Executive Director of Connecticut Legal Rights Project. For those of you who don't know me yet, <laughs> Hi, um, and uh, you'll probably see me a lot. Um, CLRP represents people who are eligible for mental health services from the State Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. Um, I submitted my written testimony. It is finally available online. 
so you can link to it and and read it now or later um but i think one of the things i can add for all of you today is i think i'm the only person who's sitting in this room who's had electroshock you've had people testifying remotely who've had it but to my knowledge <laughs> i'm the only person here in this room who has actually had it and what i will tell you despite what you've heard um, from some of the people, including a judge who observed it, is just because it seems like it's peaceful doesn't mean it's not violent. The whole purpose of ECT is to send an electric current through someone's brain to induce a seizure. The only reason our bones don't break, our jaws don't get crushed, is because they give us muscle relaxers and they put, put us under anesthesia. And the problem, and in, in, I'm sure you'll ask me questions, so I'm just going to say a bunch of things that might sound a little disjointed. Um, but this whole bill is about changing the involuntary ECT procedures in this state. What you all need to know is that if you're dealing with a patient who is capable of giving informed consent, that consent has to be reobtained every 30 days. The, a lot of our systems depend on checks and balances. We should have the same checks and balances for all people. I don't know why it seems to be okay that we're willing to say that for some people, we only need to do that check and balance every three months. If ECT is working as well as the proponents say it does, People's capacity to consent to it can change within that 90 days. And if they're capable of giving informed consent and they say no, that court order, if you have passed this bill that you want to change it to and give them the 90 days, that person can spend two months getting shock against their will. There are people in this state who have received hundreds of involuntary shock treatments. At a certain point, when do you say continuing to throw an electric current through your brain maybe is not the most beneficial, less intrusive treatment? Um, I want to add a couple things because I was corresponding with Sarah. She needs you to understand the long-term consequences. The FDA requires doctors to warn patients that long-term safety and effectiveness of ECT has not been demonstrated. Um, the evidence, she is the evidence of what happens when a patient goes home. Um, and they have no idea still after decades, how much microstructural damage is caused because like all forms of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, it's only diagnosed when you're dead and they have an autopsy. Um, this bill, obviously CLRP cannot support it. CLRP will not support extending the time period. Um, Excuse me, Ms. Flaherty, your time is all completed. Thank you. I have several suggested changes for you in terms of what the law should be, and I am happy to answer any questions. I also have with me um, Tom Barrett, who is CLRP's Council Emeritus, who can really talk to you about the testimony of the bill. I mean, the, the legislative history of the bill, because um, what, it used to be that there were no time limits on involuntary ECT until the law was changed to put in that 45 day time period. And all the stakeholders agreed to that. And Tom can testify to that if you are willing to have him come up. Thank you, Ms. Flaherty. Uh, Senator Amar. Um, thank you, uh, Kathy. Is it okay if I call you Kathy? Absolutely, yes. fine. We call you Kathy all I, the time. I insist on you calling me Attorney Flaherty. In fact, I would look for my uncle if you did. <laughs> so um, uh, first, uh, if you want to just finish your testimony, because we cut you short, then I have some specific questions. If you can keep that to a couple of minutes so that I don't lose my time. I would just, the, the only thing I'd like to add is there are some people for whom ECT works. Just like when it comes to psychiatric medication, there are some people for whom ECT works. I had a course, and honestly, it was either four treatments or six treatments. I don't know because I don't remember. Um, they gave it to me when they brought me to the Institute of Living after I unbuckled my seatbelt while I was driving my car and drove into a light pole. Light poles are hollow. 
They're only concrete at the bottom, but like it wasn't a telephone pole. I knocked the light pole down and I had to pay the state of Connecticut something like $1,100. That was fun. But they're like, we can't wait for the next medication we want to try to maybe work because the stuff I was taking clearly wasn't working. So they're like, we want to try ECT. And at that point, I didn't care whether I lived or died. So I was like, fine, do it. So did I consent to that first treatment? Yes. Um, in retrospect, I probably wouldn't have consented. Um, they probably would have won if there was a hearing in probate court. I mean, that's what you guys really need to know is that nine times out of 10, the facilities win. So it's not like the, you know, the judges have to show and the facility has to show that a legal standard is met. It can't just be, you know, a doctor's opinion. And I think that was why I was so horrified when I saw the first draft of the bill. And I was delighted to learn that that wasn't actually the committee's intent. Thank you so much. Um, so, Kathy, um, uh, we've talked about this two, three years ago. We brought it because of a a child who's being impacted negatively from this bill. And I, I respect where you come from. I respect that you've been uh, a very important force to make sure that there's a protection for the people in our state. But this bill is hurting somebody and you've had the chance to interact with the mom, but you've not necessarily had the chance to interact with a child and seen what has happened. And um, and then I'm I'm just, and then you're you have so much empathy, but but I feel sometimes I wish maybe perhaps we can have you meet the child and see how it does to I, what it does to him. No, I'm not saying he shouldn't have ECT. Like if he if the court finds that he meets the legal standard, because it sounds like he because of his other illness and he's really not the person they're usually using ECT on. Let's be frank about that. The people who are getting ECT are people with psychiatric diagnoses, not people usually with Down syndrome. Like, so th there's something, there's something there. But I imagine that because of his other disability, it sounds to me as if he doesn't have the legal capacity to give informed consent himself. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out because I don't know, but the facility that wants to perform the ECT has to go to probate court and demonstrate to the satisfaction of the judge that they meet the requirements of the standard, which is that, hold on, <laughs> I want to look it up because I want to do it accurate, um, that after the hearing, such court finds that the patient is incapable of informed consent and there is no other less intrusive beneficial treatment, okay? If they are able to satisfy the judge of that, they will get an order that will be good for 45 days. They will be able to do a course of treatment. I wish Tom could, could come up in a chair because um, I'd like him to talk about this, but when they first put in a limit of a 30 days, okay, uh, or, or we're gonna put a limit, the voluntary consent has to be given every 30 days. For the involuntary, there were people who pushed that that should be 30 days too, because why would we have it be any different? But then the psychiatrist came in and they said, we usually do treatments over the course of four weeks. So if we have any delay in starting, we wouldn't be able to do the full course of treatment. And that's why all the stakeholders agreed that 45 days was enough. Now, why does it have to go to not... Just I'm just to trying to figure out I, how I, is he being hurt. If I may just uh, request yeah. you, because there's a limited time and I want to yeah, make sure. A limited time. We've been waiting all day. <laughs> no, no. Uh, for, for me, because I want my colleagues to have that opportunity. I don't want to take it away from them. Um, I, 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 What would you say to the mom who actually just explained what of a difficulty it is for them to be able to do it every uh, 45 days? where they're losing and then getting all of that information, waiting for the treatment to be delayed and then, and then the child getting worse. So how would we reflect to that? I mean, okay, I, I uh, just said they're too bad. Is no, that, that's I, not going to be a good enough answer. What I would say is I would put it on the facility if they know they are going to have to do it again in 45 days, don't wait till day 44 to bring the new petition. You do it at day 30, which gives plenty of time for the probate court to hold the next hearing. Do I hear the frustration with having to repeatedly go back to court? 
Yes, I do. But I also think that you need to know is that when we, if you look at the statute, the current statutes that we have regarding involuntary um, medication and involuntary ECT, when it's involuntary medication, the probate court order can actually be good for 120 days, but that's because the court doesn't actually make the order that they can just give the medication. The court appoints a conservator who is a substitute decision maker with specific authority to consent to psychiatric medication. And the facility is supposed to go through the full informed consent process with that conservator. Sometimes the conservator consents, to be honest, it's probably 95% of the time and they're a rubber stamp. But every, every once in a while, you get a conservator who does their job properly. And when they listen to the conserved person, they listen to the facility, they ask questions about the risks and benefits of treatment and no treatment. Sometimes they say no. But you don't do that in forced DCT cases. If the court finds those things, the court just issues the order, nobody's given informed consent, and the electroshock is just done. I just want to add, uh, when this law was passed, there wasn't a segment of a specific group of uh, Down syndrome children who have a, <laughs> an illness that can get better with this, which has been shown, it has been published. And now that segment of the children in our state are suffering. And, and I will stop here. I, I'm sure there are my colleagues who may have questions. And I, I don't like children who have developmental disorders to be suffering because somebody else had a bad experience. And, and we want to make sure there's a protection in place for everybody. But sometimes that protection is actually causing these children to suffer. So again, uh, that's a uh, uh, a different I, conversation, but I'll, I'll give an opportunity to my colleagues if they have a question or comment. Thank you, Senator Amwar. Next, uh, Representative Carpino to be followed by Representative Zupkis and Senator Marks. Thank you, ma'am. I, I am neither a doctor nor a physician, so it would be inappropriate for me to judge whether or not shock treatment were appropriate for an individual patient. I trust that their medical providers and, and their team are the best ones to make that decision. But I am a member of this committee who has grave concerns with shock therapy. And you were, previous testimony was very clear. We're talking about electrical impulses to the brain of someone who does not consent, particularly in light of the marginalized groups of individuals who have been subjected to this in the past. And, and my goal here at this late hour is to not, um, to not give a history lesson. I understand the concerns. I've been here all day. I've heard the testimony. My question to you is, is very specific. Is there any positive that would result from this change other than it being more convenient for some families to receive the treatment they're choosing? It's hard for me to find it. I, I'll be straight up. I mean, I agree with Senator Anwar. I don't want any child to needlessly suffer or be caused pain, but protections were put in the law, not just because a few people had bad experiences, but because a lot of people had bad experiences. And shock without adequate safeguards violates the right to be secure in one's person. It is a massive intrusion on liberty. Um, and it intrudes on your bodily integrity in a really pretty profound way. Um, and it, it, you know, intrudes on your mental integrity. I mean, if you just think about your capacity and your brain and who, how that helps make you who you are as a person, it is designed to change that. I would say, and I, 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 if the, if this committee was concerned about a particular group of people who in the committee's opinion, were so benefited by this treatment that perhaps that particular group of people should have a different law applied to them. I, 
I would perhaps explore that, but I also think it's a terrible idea to make different laws based on different people's diagnoses. Um, we don't do that. And we have, or we shouldn't do that. And, and I appreciate that. And I wanna be very clear, if this particular treatment works for some individuals, I, I believe that they should have ac adequate access to that. But my concerns are qualified physicians and the head of a hospital making these decisions for some individuals. And I appreciate you always giving a voice to some who might not be able to find their way um, to the General Assembly to share their, their views and their experiences. And, and I thank you because I have serious concerns about this. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Carpino. I'm going to go next to our ranking member, Senator Summers. Good evening. How are you? I'm doing okay. Good. I know it's been a long day for it you. It has. Um, I, you know, I have grave concerns about extending the time limit um, in which someone would have the ability to con either continue ECT under a, you know, civil involuntary commitment order uh, or um, extending it for, for 90 days. That, that is, I have real concerns about that, but what you heard tonight was there is a very small segment of the population that are children that have down syndrome that need this uh, or appear to need this treatment, uh, for their well being. And I didn't hear that they couldn't get the treatment. What I heard was it's inconvenient and I, I, I take that lightly as a mother, I know that things are not necessarily convenient and, and it's an added step that you have to take to go to probate every 45 days to renew uh, the order to be able to get this type of treatment. Is there anything, but I didn't hear the children are not able to get the treatment. Um, and I, I think we have to be cautious and as difficult as this may sound, I don't think we can legislate for for a really small population versus the greater good in some, in some respect. And I can see based on the history that we have here with Whiting Forensic and the civil commitments that it would make it a lot easier for that institution to be able to go to probate and get a 90 day order for which we will have people in our custody under our care, possibly continuing with ECT without their consent. I have a real issue with that. So is there anything that you can see that could be done because you have a lot of experience in the probate court, maybe this really belongs to judiciary, that could be an expedited process for those children that are under the care of a physician that need this specialized treatment every 45 days where there could almost be a, um, a system in which they don't ever have to worry that they're not going to get it. I like your idea of just going earlier, but we all know that the, the probate courts are really busy. Could you think of a way that we could streamline their ability to get the probate judge to order um, the, the next 45 days? I would have to think about that. I don't, after a very long day of sitting here, um, I, there's no way I can answer that question on You're the really spot. You're really creative, so I'm sure you'll come up with a way. I can try. Not right now, but right. if you could get back to us. No, I mean, I think one of the things that I just would like to point out is, you know, there are times where facilities bring petitions and have brought simultaneous position, petitions to probate court for forced medication and forced electroshock. Remember, for forced electroshock, it's supposed to be no other less intrusive beneficial treatment. And so Judge Marino talked about how the fact that sometimes he denies them because they haven't tried the other things first. We dealt with a case at a different facility that wasn't his court where the court actually granted both orders. And that actually makes no sense. It should never have happened. And guess what? We appealed that and we won on appeal because it didn't meet the legal standard. But by that time, the shock had already been done. And then how do you take that back? You can't. You know, probate court judges have to do a lot of work and they have to make a lot of difficult decisions about a lot of difficult things. But sometimes they make mistakes and because of the way our law is, where we don't have an automatic stay pending appeal, which is something we should have, um, 
you know, people are subjected to these involuntary treatments that they do not want, that they have not consented to, um, and they're imposed against their will. So it's just, it is, it, you know, the hard thing, you know, listening to some of the testimony here today where some people have said, it feels like torture because it really, you know, we don't intentionally put electricity through people. <laughs> like it's usually we refer to that as electrical injury. Um, so people have framed this as a, some kind of medical treatment that does things, but they don't know how or why it works. They don't know how or why it goes bad. Um, and it has a lot of adverse effects. I'm delighted for this young man that it's worked for him. And it sounds like you've met him. I would welcome the opportunity to listen to him. But like Senator Summers said, I haven't heard that they, he hasn't been able to access it at all, that there have sometimes been these delays. And maybe there is a way to come up with a framework to ensure that for someone who needs maintenance, but I don't know what it, I don't know what that is. So I'll have to think about that. I thank you for that. And I think it's it, the point that you bring out especially in light of uh, the history that we have, is the checks and balances are really important. I would like to find a way uh, that we could help those who need um, a maintenance dosage, I'll call it, or a weekly dosage of ECT uh, without um, maybe the additional burden of the 45 days. But but I, I really feel strongly that we cannot extend it just based on that small population when there are so many others that could have unintended consequences because of that extension. And um, if you can help be creative, I'd love to work on that with you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Thanks. just to point out, if he were able to consent, they would have to get that consent every 30 days, so. Thank you, thank you, Senator Summers. Uh, Representative Zupkis to be followed by Senator Marks, Representative Berger Gervalo and Representative Kitt. Representative Zupkis. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Ms. Flaherty, for coming. I'm not going to reiterate because I strongly agree with Representative Carpino and Senator Summers. Um, I, uh, you know, none, I don't believe there's one person sitting here, listening here, wherever they are, would ever want a child to not get services that are needed for that child to make them better. Um, I just, the whole consent piece, um, I don't know anything about this child. I don't know if they have parents or not, but to me, why would a parent not give parental consent uh, to have involuntary or forced treatment? This or anything is unacceptable to me. And uh, I want to thank you for coming, coming for uh, bringing these things forward. And I appreciate what you had to say. And I do hope to hear from you and your suggestions. Um, I'm, I don't even know uh, why someone would have to go to probate court. Um, and maybe that's just my ignorance to this type of treatment. But um, to me, it should be consent and parental consent uh, and never forced on anyone. I don't care if it's a doctor or whom, uh, but I agree with you. And I thank you for uh, coming here and testifying and sharing. Thank you, Representative Zupkis. And I, I do want to address the question you asked earlier of somebody who doesn't live in Connecticut. Um, so didn't know what our laws here are in Connecticut. Um, electroshock is something that can be done with the informed written consent of a patient. Um, so that is one way it gets done. But if the person is not capable, it, and this is the language that's directly from the current law, if it's determined by the head of the hospital and two qualified physicians that the patient has become incapable of giving informed consent, shock therapy may be administered upon order of the probate court if after hearing, such court finds that the patient is incapable of informed consent and there is no other less intrusive beneficial treatment. An order of the probate court authorizing the administration of shock therapy pursuant to the subsection shall be effective for not more than 45 days. Um, that is current law, but prior to 2003, there was no time limit on those probate court orders. Um, they would be issued and people would be involuntarily shocked for any length of time because there was no requirement that there be a time limit. There was a decision made after conversation with all the stakeholders to put that time at 45 days. And so it's just, 
not clear to me why 20 years later, all of a sudden that compromise is no longer acceptable to people. Thank you. Thank you for enlightening me. And I appreciate your uh, your understanding and, and your uh, knowledge of all of this. Thank you. You're welcome. Just uh, so Thank everyone you. knows, I just want to say there is a, attached to my testimony, uh, an article that was written by Gina Texera, who's an attorney at CLRP, who brought that appeal that I was telling you about before, um, where she explored Connecticut law and treatment without consent cases. So it is worth um, it might be worth reading, especially anybody who's a lawyer. So, Thank you, Representative Zupkis. We have Senator Marks to be followed by Representative Berger Gervalo, Representative Kitt, and Representative Parker. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, um, I, I have had patients who have had electric shock therapy, and they said it, oh. that it's completely changed their lives, and it was the best therapy that they had. It's what... Um, turns their mental illness around. Um, but my, my question is, and so maybe this is for judiciary, like Senator Summers said, I don't understand why a mother, and that mother that testified tonight was one of the um, most moving testimonies that I heard tonight, why the mother, she must be the conservator power of attorney of her child, why that is not in, informed consent why she can't consent to have this treatment for her child, why the hospital administrators have to say that he can't have, he can't consent. Because I'm sure she could, if he needed to have his tonsils out, she could consent to having his tonsils out. Why can't she consent to this therapy? Thank you for the question. What can I indulge the committee to see if if Tom could come up and maybe supplement my answer, um, in the hope of giving you a more complete answer this evening? Um, would you be willing to allow that? So, Kathy, usually at the end of every hearing, I invite anyone who's in the room who hasn't signed up to testify. Since we're so close, we have a few people who signed up and are still waiting. Um, and I, you know, we're adjusting okay. still okay. to the rules, it's, actually, with the hybrid. So I don't fine. even know okay, if we need to. I'm so. write a note to add to this if I get something wrong. What's interesting is, is that just by virtue of being a conservator, conservators are not allowed to consent to certain kinds of treatment. You, a conservator that you have for other medical treatment does not is not allowed to consent to psychiatric medication unless there's a petition brought in probate court that awards them the specific authority to consent to psychiatric medication because there is a recognition that psychiatric medication and psychiatric treatment is significantly more intrusive than other medical treatment. That's the law in Connecticut. It's been the law for as long as I've known what the law in Connecticut is. Um, Tom may be able to supplement that answer. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Marks, and thank you for your answer. Clarity. <laughs> Next, we have Representative Berger Javallo to be followed by Representative Kitt. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm actually going to do a thing that we don't usually do, and I'm going to say I'm going to be brief, and I'm going to be brief because uh, Senator Summers actually articulated most of what I wanted to say. Um, I will just add to that. I, I think that really what we've come down to here is we're looking at two, two particular goals. Um, we want to fast track informed consent for those who need it. We want to be able to keep the checks and balances. I know that you're exhausted and can't necessarily answer questions about what that looks like. Um, and when I was feeling a little bit more awake, I was saying to myself, well, what if we add another um, qualified physician? Um, I, I know that there are ideas that are here on, on this side of the room that um, we would love to be able to run by you, but I would just like to reiterate that we would seriously value whatever contribution you may have at a later um, somewhat rested point in time. I appreciate the opportunity to give you input when I have had more food, more drink, <laughs> and some sleep. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Adam you, Chair. Rep. Berger Javallo. And I think we we all appreciate the opportunity when we've had the same. I, I agree. Um, next, we have Representative Kitt of Fairfield and Trumbull representative, and then to be followed by Representative Parker. 
Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, actually, I will also be brief because my question had to do with conservators. And Ms. Flaherty, you answered my question there as to why we don't allow conservators to do this. Um, and you mentioned that you had suggestions for improving this bill, and I look forward to reading that in your written testimony. And um, is one of those recommendations perhaps um, developing a psychiatric conservator program? Through no. You, Madam Chairwoman. <laughs> <laughs> well, the short answer to that, frankly, is no, because I think arguably we have a lot of conservators already. Um, in the state of Connecticut who are appointed to do some of these things. And the frustration that we see, and this is where I have to give my usual disclaimer. CLRP represents people who are eligible for mental health services from the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. They serve 100,000 unique people each year. We represent like a thousand. So like a tiny percent. So like people who are getting what they need from the system are not calling a law office to get help. But the people who call us who are not happy have conservators who maybe rubber stamp what the doc, because the, the probate court has issued standards for conservators. And I actually linked to them in my, my testimony. There are things conservators are supposed to do, like talk to the conserved person, review the person's medical records, talk to the facility. But we have seen cases where the facility gets the order from probate court faxes something to the conservator, says sign this, and the conservator faxes something back with the signature authorizing the medication. That's not compliance with the statute, and it's virtually impossible to challenge any of that. So no, <laughs> I do not think establishing a psychiatric conservatorship program is uh, the way forward. Um, we have other ideas, but not that. Well, I look forward to reading those, and uh, I want to thank you for sharing your story and for the work you do. And for giving a voice to the people who don't really have a voice and aren't able to come here. Thanks. So I look forward to hearing from more from you as we move through this bill. You will, I promise. Thank you very much, Representative Kitt. <clears throat> I think batting cleanup is Representative Parker. Perhaps actually we may come back to Senator Omar. Thanks for being with us all day. Not a physician, not a doctor, not a lawyer. So bear with me. Um, I'm wondering if there is a difference between someone who is not giving consent, chooses to not give consent, but still has the procedure done anyway, and someone who is deemed unable to give consent because of whatever reason and still has the procedure done anyways. Maybe I'll stop there with my first part of the question. Is that a distinction? I think that that is an interesting question. And what I will tell you from like my personal experience, both as a patient um, in psychiatry for the better part of 20 years um, and being a lawyer, as well is questions don't come up about your capacity to give consent as long as you are agreeing with the recommendations of your psychiatrist. It's only when you start to challenge the psychiatrist that questions start getting raised about your capacity to give informed consent. I see a skeptical look on your face, but that is the reality of psychiatry, which is probably different than the practice of medicine in a lot of other fields. But that is the reality of our experiences. It is an experience I have had, and it is an experience that many of the people you heard from today have had, um, and the experience you'll hear from a lot of other people over the course of the session when we're talking about bills related to mental health. I appreciate you sharing that. And maybe this will be food for thought as we continue working on this. It seems like then there is a distinction between these potentially two different groups of people. I appreciate how you're saying about when that comes up or not, but would it be possible to have a policy that applies to people who are not able to give? Because it seems like what we're really trying to avoid is someone who would want to not give consent, being having this force upon them. That feels different to me than someone who is deemed not able to give consent. And at one point, yeah. it's a decision to do this procedure by well-informed, reasonable folks. And then presumably that is unlikely to change over the course of 45 to 60 to 90 days. I can see where in the first case, someone might want to withdraw their consent. And if it was forced upon them, that could be problematic. So is there a way to potentially treat these two different groups differently? So in the case of a young person who's deemed unable to give consent, the difference between 45 and 60 and 90 is maybe not that big a deal versus someone who might say, no, I've had enough. 
I don't want to give any more. Maybe this is a situation you would have found yourself in. And therefore, we do want to ensure that after 45, between 45 and 90, we have that sort of release valve. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And what I would say is, and again, I don't have the, I don't like talking about statutes when I don't have the book in front of me because I want to make sure I'm getting it right. But that we do something somewhat similar when we're talking about involuntary psychiatric medication. There is, a, we actually do have different legal standards that have to be met if the person is capable of giving informed consent but says no a person's incapable of informed consent, and then a person who is capable of giving consent and consent. So I think there could, that might be a way forward, but I think we'd really need to do some crafting. And I have no doubt that judiciary would have to be involved in this. Um, so, but I, I, that may be the way. Thank you for helping me start to understand that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Parker. Representative Rader to be followed by Senator Amar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for sitting here all day and um, listening to all the other testimony before your opportunity to do so. Um, and this has been so enlightening for me um, as a new legislator, so thank you for that too. Um, I'm also, uh, I've been working with a constituent who is also um, involved with NAMI and she was really informative. I sat through um, uh, a group uh, presentation and the term came up called, and I'm going to probably say this wrong, okay. anosognosia. Yeah. And that is the, um, it's quote unquote, lack of insight is a symptom of severe mental illness experienced by some that impairs a person's ability to understand and perceive his or her illness. Um, it is for this, it is the single largest reason why people with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder refuse medication or do not seek treatment without awareness of their illness, refusing treatment appears rational, no matter how clear the need for treatment might be to others. And so this term kept coming up in my head again when we've been talking today um, about consent and to what Representative um, Parker just re referenced. And I'm curious to know from your experience, how often do you see the patients that you interact with that likely should be or have been diagnosed with this anosognosia and really they don't identify their illness, so therefore their consent might not actually be a genuine consent. Okay, I am not a doctor. Right. In and my realize, opinion, thank you. anosognosia does not exist. It, it is a real thing when it comes to stroke victims, but when it comes to mental illness, it basically is a framework that people who want to increase opportunities for, for psychiatric treatment use as a justification of forcing people to have treatment that they do not consent to. It, 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 and I'm happy to talk with you more offline at any time about that, but there are people, um, there are a number of people who agree with me that that term is not a legitimate term when it comes to psychiatric issues. It is a very real condition when it comes to people who've suffered strokes. I appreciate that and I wouldn't appreciate your input, but um, I do think it's important to identify that it is a, a, a true diagnosis um, in the medical field. But I, again, I'm not a doctor, you're not a doctor, but I thank you for offering your opinion. I do appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Representative Rader. Senator Amar. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. I just wanted to make a few comments and observations. I, I just wanna first mention what a special committee we have in public health. We've been here for nine hours and, and we are making sure that we are there protecting people who cannot give consent, but at the same time having a conversation for the ones who need the treatment and they cannot give consent, can we find a way for them? And, and which is one of the largest committee, the people who are physically here and on Zoom for nine hours listening to this, and also for the people who are here who are new to this committee, we have advocates who sit through the entire hearing just to be able to make sure that they stand up for what they believe in. So I, I just want us to recognize this moment and importance of this committee. And, and, and arguably there's no other committee that does this kind of activity and this kind of emotion. So something to be proud of and to be thankful for. The second thing is that our experiences define how we see the world. And, and I'm sorry about the experiences that you've had, but thank you. Those experiences are helping a lot of people. 
So that's something that I wanted to recognize and then appreciate in your case as well. And then I also am hopeful that we will find a solution, but then I lost a little bit of hope when you said that when Kathy Flaherty is going to get some rest because you never get any rest. <laughs> so <laughs> then we'll have to figure out when you're going to get the rest. Um, I, I think um, just a thought process for us to look at is in 2003, when we made this law, it was the right time for that. And there's a group of children who were born after that law has been made. And this treatment was not an option because the diagnosis and the treatment and identification was not there. And majority of the children were born after the law was made. And we will have to think about that laws evolve and improve according to ground realities. And is this a fault of the child? They were born in Connecticut because if they were in any other state for those specific group, they may have had the treatment without having to go through some of the hurdles, but mm -hmm. I'm not asking for a solution. I'm just having you think about the fact that sometimes where you are born and what kind of laws you have would determine your impact on your families and, and so on. But these children were born after that law was made and this treatment, which has been recognized is, uh, is a treatment for them. And, and um, unfortunately, they will have to go through the hurdles and, and unless they move to some other state, because right now, Perhaps we will not find an answer, but let's see if we can. And if they're not, then we'll just say that too bad. But I, I just wanted to thank everyone for the indulgence. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. And I would just like to echo my thanks to you, Ms. Flaherty, for staying here with us and also to the fellow members of the committee. But thank you so much. And I look forward to further conversation with you on this and so many other issues. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I really appreciate the questions because I was sitting there wondering, are they going to ask me questions tonight or are they not? <laughs> so I appreciate it. Well, thank you. We have some other very patient and persistent people here with us. We have Mr. Shaw, who I think is here in the Zoom room. Oh, Mr. Sh oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Shahid Khan. I was not reading correctly. And number 82, if you, I'm gonna give you a, a moment, but I do know that number 91, who is our very last person signed up, hold on, give me one second. Mr. Javid, or excuse me, Dr. Javid Sukara. Welcome, please proceed. Good evening, everybody. Uh, hello to all of you, to the esteemed chairs and members and representatives. My name is Javid Sakara. I am the chair of psychiatry at the Institute of Living, the chief of psychiatry at Hartford Hospital. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in the matter of uh, SB 898. I'm happy to be here in Connecticut. I moved here in 2021. After uh, working in Canada, I've been a practicing psychiatrist for over a decade uh, as a child psychiatrist in many jurisdictions. Now, I'm a psychiatrist that's always going to call out some of the course of underpinnings of, of my profession. I'm explicitly committed to partnering with people with lived and living experience to build a more humane and dignified system of care. I know the intent of this legislation relates to the, the time period of the probate court order, but I think it's important to raise that the language contained within the current legislation is exceptionally stigmatizing outdated, and that we really need to look at the current statute and uh, make necessary changes with engagement with stakeholders. It's important to remember that ECT is an evidence-based, uh, in its current form, is a well-established, evidence-based, life-saving medical treatment, and it should be governed and regulated similar to other medical treatments. If we stigmatize psychiatric treatments as non-medical, this is harmful because it perpetuates harmful stigma that leads to fear against help seeking and discourages people from getting the help that they need. ECT in reality in present day is used very rarely and it's used in exceptional circumstances when risks and benefits are balanced. And like any medical treatment, uh, there are potential side effects that we need to communicate. Like other treatments, informed consent is the, the heart of this process. It's an essential ingredient in providing humane care but I'm here to share that there are some very real, rare, 
in life-threatening circumstances where patients who would benefit from ECT are unable to consent to medical decisions, often because they're essentially catatonic and unable to eat or drink and therefore at risk of dehydration, malnutrition, and in some cases, death. Their families want them to get better and they want them to have access to what would be the gold standard treatment in their, in their circumstance. Now just think for a second, if there's an adult patient who experiences a physical illness that makes them too sedated to consent, they need a feeding tube to ensure that they get nutrition. Their family wants them to get the feeding tube. In our current system, and according to our current statute, even though that feeding tube is invasive, involves cuts and incisions, um, the probate court wouldn't be part of that conversation. And we're not here to talk about that because we're here to talk about ECT. Now, ECT, not shock therapy, which is not a term that I would advise anybody using, um, is used in the cases like the circumstance of someone who's catatonic. They can't eat and drink. Their family wants them to get access to help. And there's several arbitrary and administrative hurdles that come in play um, when we have to get involved with the judges and the processes that currently exist. These often lead to harmful administrative hassles that interfere with medical treatments that should be between families and treating uh, physicians and, and facilities. So I speak out in support of being able to offer ECT without delay or complication for patients who would benefit from this treatment. And I appreciate very much the stories and the lived experiences of those for whom they may have had harmful experiences. I don't think anybody um, in my facility is here to intentionally harm folks. I do think we need to address issues around involuntary hospitalization and coercion, but we're talking today about a specific bureaucratic hurdle in a specific circumstance. So thank you. Well, Dr. Sakara, we're so glad that you stayed with us. I think that it's important that we hear your voice this evening. And I so appreciate the language you used, the way that you framed the conversation and your persistence as with Ms. Flaherty for being here with us today. I know that my esteemed co-chair will have some questions for you, Senator Almore. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sukera. Thank you for your patience and and, and uh, perseverance for being with us uh, this morning, day, and, and night as well. Um, I, I can you explain to us about some of the areas where uh, within psychiatric conditions where this would be uh, a considered uh, life-saving treatment? Could you list some of the things? I know catatonia is something that you have mentioned and and. I've seen that work in individuals as well, and I've heard of individuals who got better with that. But can you explain some of the other potential? Yeah, so I would say I was speaking in specific, specifically about catatonia in this circumstance and the, the circumstances we encounter when people are dehydrated, malnourished, and we watch them being harmed because of delays in treatment. Um, I would argue that there are cases where treatment refractory mood disorders People uh, experience what they, as patients, describe as life-saving uh, benefits from ECT. But that wasn't the context in which I was speaking, uh, because in those circumstances, people are often giving informed consent. Uh, and we really do not, uh, and I do not want people to be having any forced ECT treatments unless they're truly in a circumstance where we know that the benefits outweigh the risk. Um one more thing was that some you've talked about the veteran studies, and I, I did not want to belabor conversation at that time. With the veteran studies that were done on ECT, it was based on a refractory suicidal situation where every treatment had failed. And we are looking at other possible treatments in our state uh, because of the difficulty, but these refractory suicidal ideation, suicidal intent that has been seen in veterans, the ECT did not was not effective uh, either. And, and that's why the suicide rates were higher. But somebody suggested ECT was causing the suicidality to happen in those. Can you clean that up for us a little bit from better understanding, please? Yeah, so I, I don't have the study or the science in front of me. So I, I don't want to speak to it um, because I, I don't have uh, that uh, sophisticated of a knowledge of that specific study. I think that it's important to remember that there are standards by which any medical treatment are governed and regulated. Um, there needs to be those standards because uh, we who work in the system, we're patients too. 
we want the safest treatments and the, the regulatory side of this is important. Um, the evidence that exists currently is pretty clear uh, without too much ambiguity that ECT um, is effective in specific circumstances of treatment refractory mood disorders or catatonia. Um, other circumstances like psychotic depression it can also be quite effective for. I personally would say that if I find myself catatonic in the future, my family knows that I would be consenting to ECT because I know and have witnessed its potential to treat people. Um, I do also know that there have been people who have been harmed by the medical system. I think there are people who have been harmed by psychiatry, but I, I believe that psychiatry gets singled out as though we are intrinsically more harmful than other parts of the medical establishment. And I'm concerned that that perpetuates a harmful stigma against folks that are trying our best to serve a population that's suffering. So folks uh, or people who have been harmed, who have suffered uh, because they've experienced trauma from the medical system, I think that's something we need to contend with and address and, and, and be better at. But I'm just talking specifically about that small minority of cases where we know it works, it can work, and the alternatives are worse. And, and my last question is, um, how has anesthesia services changed since 2003 to now? For ECT? So in general, uh, anesthesia services have not changed drastically from 2003 until now. Uh, a lot of the history of ECT as a treatment uh, historically um, has and, and was much more harmful. And there were many treatments in psychiatry that were quite harmful. Uh, and I'll be the first to say, we need to reckon with that history at the Institute of Living and address that. Uh, in its current state, again, uh, folks can come and watch and witness a seizures induced. There are multiple safeguards in terms of the anesthesia, the muscle relaxation, uh, to ensure that, that nothing violent happens. Um, and I would actually make the case that ECT is much less violent, for example, than a cesarean section or other forms of invasive surgery where people are cut open, um, which to me are quite significantly more invasive than, than, than ECT. Thank you, Senator. Senator Summers to be followed by Representative Denning. Yes, good evening, doctor. And thank you for staying with us to this late hour. I would just like to um, thank you for being here and to let you know that I know somebody uh, so that's very close to me who in 2021 um, ended up in a catatonic state and had to go to the Institute of Living and went through the shock therapy. Um, I know you're not supposed to call it that, sorry, ECT and had four rounds of a seizure and is doing wonderfully to this day. It was life-saving for this person. And that person was exactly how you described, dehydrated, losing weight, um, unable to speak. And I think that there is a place for ECT under certain circumstances. But what we're discussing here today is a bill for people that are not able to give consent. They have to go to a probate judge and the probate judge will look at the care plan and grant access to ECT for up to 45 days. There is a push to extend that now to 90 days. And we are dealing with two populations. One is a very, they're both very vulnerable, but one population is perhaps institutionalized under a civil commitment um, that would be going in front of a prob probate judge to have ECT performed on them without consent. And some of us are concerned about extending that to 90 days, not knowing how many treatments that would entail. And the fact that in many cases, sometimes a person may have four treatments and start to be their selves again. Um, some, a doctor described it to me as restarting a computer. Um, so there's that population. And then there's a population that you've heard tonight of um, young, I'm not sure if they're adults or children um, that require ECT a couple times a week. And it is, cumbersome for the families to go back to probate every 45 days to get a probate judge to sign off on the care plan. Is there anything that you could see that we could do to help the uh, children population that requires ECT as I'm going to call it a maintenance therapy versus those who are 
civilly committed and um, are undergoing ECT, obviously without consent. That's what we're talking about today in this bill. Thank you. Yeah, so I'd be happy to continue to work with the committee and stakeholders like my colleague, Ms. Flaherty, because I think their voices matter as well, to really ensure that there are appropriate safeguards and protections in the statutes. But I just want to share with everybody very, very candidly, I've worked in many different uh, jurisdictions. I haven't encountered yet um, in Connecticut where we've designated probate judges to have medical experience and training to make determinations and decisions that are typically made in other places by people who have medical experience and training. We consistently run up against arbitrary hassles uh, within the probate process. And I think that the probate process uh, is not achieving its intended results. So I'm all about reform. I'm all about trying to make uh, existing statutes work in ways that minimize as much harm as possible. I think that there are nuances here that need to be addressed. So the, the issue isn't so much about someone who's committed, who's an adult, and someone who's a child. I think the issue really has to be medically, legally, and ethically, someone who's able to reasonably provide informed consent, and someone who, for reasons um, that are determined and established um, and, and safeguarded around, cannot provide that informed consent. I also think that the caregivers of all people, whether they're people hospitalized as adults or people who are children, really do matter and their wishes really matter. Uh, the, the circumstances I'm speaking of, even with adults, are circumstances where caregivers really want their loved ones to be able to access the treatment, but their loved ones experience harm because of arbitrary delays related to judicial probate court processes that aren't aligned or attuned to the realities of medical practice. Thank you. And, and I can see where you're coming from. Our, our concern, or many of our concerns, is the checks and balances uh, of the caregiver, perhaps, the medical world, and the person who can't consent their rights. So I, I appreciate where you're coming from, and I look forward to trying to work with you to find a solution for this complicated, nuanced issue. Thank you very much, Senator Summers. Representative Denning to be followed by Representative Parker. Representative Denning, you are you need to unmute. I'm sorry, my sinus infection is affecting me. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, doctor, um, I'm going to follow up on what Senator Summers said. Was if we have a patient, and and I'm I'm familiar with evidence-based practice. So, so work with me on this. Um, you have a patient who is catatonia and you decide that you're going to give them electric shock therapy and you give them electric shock therapy. And let's say it takes 30 days and they respond um, and they say, I don't ever want to have this again. This was awful. I, I don't remember anything. I'm not going to do it. And they say, and then the 45 days comes again. This is what we're talking about. This, this 45, whether it be 60, at some point, and we're talking about this with, with another topic that's on the agenda as far as end of life issues, at what point does the patient have full control over saying, I don't want this anymore? And if, they, and if they're not responding by 45 days, should we allow the practitioners to continue to do another 30 days, 45 days, 90 days. I mean, th there's got to be evidence-based practice that says, if you're not responding by this amount of time, there's no reason to progress. And that's what I'm looking for so that I can make a, a determination is to say, if they're not responding by this, we shouldn't be doing it anymore. And 45 days seems arbitrary, but so does 90. So do you have any information at all about what that evidence-based practice would be? So what I would say is that like you, I would want to follow what that evidence-based practice is. What I'm contending with though, is that when someone's in a medical circumstance, we want to be able to ensure that they are getting the treatment that they need. If they can consent to that treatment, then their rights should be centered and addressed. I'm not really here to talk about 
people who can consent, because I think their rights absolutely need to be respected and addressed. What I'm here to make the case around is, if we were talking about a course of chemotherapy, we wouldn't be uh, talking about minutia of 45 or 90 days. We would be saying that we should follow whatever the evidence base is for that medical treatment to ensure that the treatment is effective. And so I'm arguing that that's the kind of thing we need to do by bringing in arbitrary numbers such as 45 or even 90 days, to be honest, what you're creating is arbitrary administrative hassles that should be not getting in the way uh, when patients and families want to be able to get treatment that works. And if someone's treatments get delayed or there's a hiccup, which means treatments have to be stopped, that's a form of harm that I just don't want any of, of these patients to have to go through. I, I appreciate your answer, but you've not answered my question. Are you aware of any evidence-based practice that somebody who's in catatonia should be responding by or not be responding by to know whether they you should stop or continue practice? So I can't speak to, to be able to quote anything specific that I can give you a time limit about when I should know when someone will respond or won't respond in a state. I would say I, I really would have to make an individualized determination uh, weighing all of the evidence available in that particular clinical circumstance. Uh, so I can't speak to a specific global uh, response time, unfortunately, this evening. And just real quickly, so you're, you're telling me that there is no evidence-based practice? Well, there is evidence-based practice that knows and suggests that people tend to improve after about six treatments. So that's an existing practice. Um, what I cannot tell you is that there's a specific time limit to when we know whether or not someone should continue or stop receiving ECT. Uh, because Thank I have to look at time. the circumstances, the diagnosis, um, and other particulars in that case. But Thank I am very much. making yes. the case it shouldn't be a judge that's deciding that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Denning. Representative Parker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Doctor. Um, I'm wondering if you have any uh, data or can give us a, a quantitative sense when you reference that there is harm being done to folks because of the administrative barriers. I hear that you said potentially a delay of care happening. I really appreciate you sharing that perspective. Do you have, and I know you don't have this at your fingertips, so also you maybe just you'll email us later, but how can we get a sense of the extent and nature of that problem as you see it? Um, and I know this is sort of a step removed from what we were even talking about here in the bill in the first place, so I don't want to belabor this too much, but you've said something that I think a lot of us heard and it registered. So what is the nature of that challenge and the extent of it and the priority? Yeah, so I, I don't have the stats in front of me, and I, I, I am waning uh, in these evening hours as I have yet to eat dinner. But I can tell you that um, ECT in these circumstances involuntarily is used extremely rarely. It's extremely rare. I don't want to give you numbers because I don't have them in front of me and I don't want to quote them. Uh, but in extremely rare circumstances, uh, are people experiencing this treatment in this context? And even within that category, there are uh, relatively rare circumstances where we encounter people who have the kind of catatonia where they are harmed by the delays in the treatment. So uh, in terms of a quantification of that, the number is quite small. But the case I would make is an N of one is enough of us to is enough of a compelling case for us to highlight that if we know there's a way to address the potential harm while ensuring that potential safeguards are in place, uh, we always have to in medicine uh, balance those risks versus benefits. And in terms of just to give you a window into that, what specifically happens if is, is if someone's not eating or drinking, we watch them enter into a state of dehydration and malnutrition. We watch them kind of wither and not eat. Um, and that's that's where having to go through these processes and be at the whims of, of certain legal aspects of things that are really, again, arbitrary and outdated, uh, create a lot of moral distress for those who work in the system and for the families 
who watch their loved ones suffer uh, and and don't get access to a treatment that they need. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I, I um, if if you'd be able to share some more information in the future about some of those specifics uh, and the numbers around them, if that can be shared, I don't even know. I think that would be very helpful. You know, we've been talking about your institution a lot tonight, and then to have you here with us is like a great opportunity. So we appreciate you sharing with us and helping us get this right. Always Thanks. happy to get more information back to you. Thank you very much, Representative Parker. Dr. Zucara, I think that I think that's it and exhaust the questioning now that you are exhausted, but we are extremely grateful for you hanging in here with us tonight and hope you have a nice dinner. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you all for your service. Thank you. We are we have concluded our sign up. I will offer if there's anyone else in the room who wishes to come forward to testify, please do. I believe you will be our very last of the evening. Welcome. And since we don't have your sign up, if you could just say your name for us and, and your organization or your affiliation, that would be wonderful. And please remember to press the microphone. Thank you. Yes. Um, my name is Thomas Barrent. Uh, I've submitted written testimony. Um, I am counsel emeritus at the Connecticut Legal Rights Project uh, for many years. Uh, early in, earlier in that program's history, I was uh, CLRP's legal director. Um, and I, I was the legal director at the time in, I believe it was 2002, um, when Judge, uh, probate judge jo Joseph Marino um, approached me um, out of concern that uh, there were patients at Connecticut Valley Hospital who were getting involuntary ECT for years um, without going to court. So that was the situation where historically there was just, there was the statutory provision, um, same as we had now, but it was open-ended without any time limit. And uh, really there was nobody on the horizon uh, that didn't recognize that the lack of any time limit uh, was problematic and, and needed to be addressed. Um, so it, it started out uh, pretty much as a joint project where I was working with Judge Marino. Um, we worked with uh, the Office of the Probate Court Administrator. Uh, there were other probate judges uh, in the loop as well uh, and involved in the drafting. Um, we worked with the with Demas. the The bill with the forty five day time limit was part of uh, Demas's legislative package um, in two thousand three. Um, so they supported it. Uh, the Connecticut Psychiatric Society supported it. Institute of Living. Um, originally, uh, the assumption was uh, from Judge Marino and us that we would track the 30-day provision that was already in the statute for consent, consens consensual ECT. Uh, but it was, as, as Attorney Flaherty uh, said earlier, it was because concerns that after the court hearing, the facilities might, wanna, might need to do medical testing before they could commence the first treatment or there might be the need to postpone one or two treatments, uh, that there was this extra cushion. So uh, the compromise was to, uh, to expand it to 45 days. And that's sort of the history of the legislation. Um, the, uh, that whole section of, of, uh, of the Patient's Bill of Rights, General Statutes, uh, Section 17A, 543, deals with uh, informed consent. And basically uh, the preamble is no patient shall get any treatment except uh, without their informed consent, except as provided here under. And um, it addressed uh, psychiatric medication um, that was uh, public in Public Act 93, 369. Um, I'm very familiar with that because it was brand new when I first 
moved to to Connecticut, and it was a that was a really big change in the way um, medication over objection was handled, and um, that part of the Patients Bill of Rights also addressed where it said shock the the, the derivation of shock treatment and the, that reference is because there were a variety of forms of shock treatment. There was Indoclon, insulin shock. There were a variety of chemical uh, means to induce um, uh, grand mal convulsions, to induce seizures in the same manner that, or a similar manner uh, to what ECT does. Um, most Excuse of those- Excuse me, Dr. Baird, your uh, time is completed. Uh, at any rate, just historically, most of those other treatments have fallen by the wayside over the year. The statue also addressed um, psychosurgery, lobotomy. Um, and so some of the language may seem archaic, but it does address um, you know, treatments that were in use at the time. Um, there are still newer forms of psychosurgery. There's, um, there are other convulsive therapies. So, you know, I'd be happy to work. And we actually collaborated with Demas. There are some drafts that have been circulated about updating some of the language, which might add protections for some of these newer modalities. There's brain stimulation, vagal nerve stimulation, uh, and there's aversive therapies, um, which don't have the benefit of statutory protections. So I, I'm going to stop you there because we have a question from Senator Summers. Sure, of course. So thank you for being with us and our, our last testifier tonight. Um, you seem to be very well versed with the probate court system. And tonight we heard a lot about the, the holdups in the probate court system. Um, and I, I haven't heard or I did not hear, and, and maybe I missed it, anybody testifying that they have, they have not been able to get the treatment. What we heard tonight or what I heard tonight from the clinicians and from uh, the parents of those who have to have, I'll call it maintenance ECT, is that it is cumbersome to have to go back every 45 days to, or to get the paperwork to be able to uh, perform ECT on someone involuntarily without their consent. Right. Um, is there anything that you are aware of in our probate court system? One of the things that we've all been thinking about is if it's 45 days, do you have to put in your paperwork in day 15 so that you have enough time. You can't, do you, can you submit it on day 42 so that by day 45 you have it? Is there this huge backlog that can't be handled in the probate court? And is there a way that you could see that someone who requires maintenance ECT that cannot give consent, in this case, a child, yeah. they could be have a expedited process to process the paperwork so we don't have to be concerned that they're going to miss a treatment. I have not heard that somebody has missed a treatment. I've heard that it is. It's cumbersome. Cumbersome. Um, you but have to keep... also have that for protection of those who are not in that situation. So R could you right. speak to that? Right. Uh, so, you know, the probate courts, there's more of them. They're closer to home than other courts. They have the, you know, pride themselves on the reputation that they are the most user-friendly courts. Uh, in the state. Um, so while there's still the need for the procedural protections uh, for a procedure that's, you know, so invasive, um, and, and the reason why this ECT and psychiatric medication are treated differently than, say, tonsillectomy, or, uh, you know, as Dr. Sequeira referenced, um, yeah, cesarean section, is because they're psychotropic, they're mind altering. And in the case of ECT, there's also some tissue damage that's involved, which you know ultimately for some people can be regarded as, as therapeutic and even life-saving, but it, it's still, uh, it's a more intrusive, more invasive type of, of treatment. At any rate, there's, counsel involved, there's the probate judge and, and probate court clerk involved. And, you know, maybe for 
uh, the woman, the mother that testified earlier, uh, what she might consider doing is seeing if she could arrange a meeting maybe after the next time she has to be in court to, you know, get another 45 day authorization uh, to meet with the judge, with the hospital um, personnel present, with the doctor present, the lawyer present, the judge present, and just to, you know, sit around the table and brainstorm a way that they can try and streamline this without taking away any of the legal procedural protections. Uh, and that may be a tickler system for the facility to make sure that things are being faxed over to the court in a timely fashion. The court knows to expect them and to, to schedule a hearing without, you know, you know, in, in a way that will be timely so that treatments would not there wouldn't be the need to interrupt or delay, defer any treatments. Um, that might be a way to do it. And the probate court, uh, perhaps as distinguished from our superior courts, you know, is more amenable to, um, to that type of more personal approach. Um, I, I thank you for that. that. That's where some of us are thinking that this may need to go. I. Also, from the conversation, it's clear to me that this bill belongs in judiciary. It, it doesn't belong in public health because there's a lot of legal nuances to it that would have to be addressed. Well, um, that's it's also it's like yeah. there's Supreme Court case law that recognizes that the psychiatric drugs are of a different order than other medications and require enhanced uh, procedural safeguards and protections. And, you know, that's in state case law as well. And, and therefore, that's why, you know, our patient's Bill of Rights treats these, these um, treatments differently uh, than other things. Well, uh, I thank you for your testimony tonight. I know that many of us will be reaching out to you and Kathy to try to come to an um, amicable solution, but I do think this needs to go to judiciary. So thank you for your... Well, I'm very grateful for the committees um, spending all this time um, and being so thorough today. Well, thank you. And thank you, Senator Summers. Senator Anwar. Um, I just want to make a comment. I'm not convinced that this is a policy about the frequency. It's not a, a probate decision. It's a policy decision. So I'm not convinced that it's going to go to judiciary. So I just wanted to make that comment because it's a public health decision, how frequently it's going to go to uh, probate. And that's based on the individual's rights and protections and not necessarily the probate decision on the probate procedure. So I just wanted to separate the two and then make sure that we don't end up sending the bill to different committees when it can be addressed here because a policy arena rather than a judiciary arena. Thank you. Thank you. And from a procedural standpoint, Bill's here with us at this point. And I have to say, I am so grateful to every single member for so many of you being here in person. I'm also very grateful to so many of you who were with us on Zoom for so long today. And always, always a very special thanks to every person who came to testify before us, who shared their experience and wisdom with us. And most of all, to our team who is behind the scenes. I think in this new hybrid world, I don't think people have full appreciation for the lengths that our staff team goes through to be able to make this possible, to allow us to have that online access and be in person. And I just wanna say, thank you. And with that, we will conclude our first public hearing. Have a great night, everyone. Travel safely.